So I went and I woke him up. He was out of a dead sleep. I wake him up to go and commit credit card fraud with me. We drive from uh, Coral Springs to West Palm Beach, Florida. We go to Walmart. We walk in. We go all the way to the back. We get the laptop. We get up to the counter. Everything's fine. We give the guy the card. He swipes the card. He looks at it. He goes. He picks up the phone. He says, we got a code red back in electronics. Success comes not when we want it, you know, when it's, right. you know, when it's earned. So, right. That's a good way to look at it. But yeah. yeah, for people who haven't seen your content before, you know, you were one of the biggest card sellers, fraudulent card sellers in America at one time. I you, was. You've yeah. had a hell of a life though. I, yeah. I think the way that you tell your story and, and are able to kind of take it from the beginning, which I want you to do today sure. is pretty powerful because, you know. I obviously talk with a lot of different types of people in here. I'm curious about everyone's walk of life, how mm -hmm. they ended up where they are. But I do love hearing about people who had wildly different environments and experiences than I was used to and how some ways where that could have gone wrong and what made it go wrong. Sure. And someone like you was nice enough to be extremely open about that. So for the people that haven't heard you... Mm -hmm. Where did you grow up, and, and where did everything start for you? Sure. Uh, I was actually born in Mount Clemens, Michigan. Uh, it's just a small uh, manufacturing city outside of uh, about 30 minutes north of Detroit. And uh, I was born there, lived there to about 1992. Uh, and then my mother moved uh, myself and my little brother down to Homestead, Florida. Now, mind you, I don't have any family in Florida. We had no ties in Florida. My mother, for whatever reason... Whether I don't remember it was a job opportunity or maybe she just wanted to uh, maybe just change our environment, uh, whatever she was going through at that time, moved us to South Florida and pretty much grew up in South Florida my whole entire life. I was um, going to say, you look like Florida, man. Like yeah. when I picture Florida, I'm like, John Boziak. That's yeah. him. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Florida cracker, bro. I'm a Florida cracker through and through. I just, I spent pretty much my whole entire life there. Now, my entire, my, almost my entire family lives in Michigan. My dad, my grandparents, all my cousins, mm. my brothers, my little brother, my older brother, everybody's in Michigan. So just you and your mom went down there? Just me and my mom mm. and my little brother went to Florida. And that was in like 1992. Um, relatively uneventful from 1992 to about 1996. I was a youth. I, you know, I had right. a, a relatively normal childhood. I remember... You know, I just remember playing a lot, riding bikes in the neighborhood, you know, uh, early 90s shit that all the kids did back then. You know, there was um, there was no video games. I think there was like regular Nintendo and, yeah, it was you, know, early stuff, you know, man. so it, it wasn't like, you know, what, what it is today. And then in 1996, um, my mother moved back to Michigan and I stayed in Florida. I just made the decision um, as a 13 year old I kid. I say you're young. Yeah, and I just didn't want to go back to Michigan. Like, I didn't like it. And it, it was right around that time that I kind of started getting into shit. Wait, how does that... Hold on. How does that happen? Yeah. You were 13 years old. Yeah. You just said to your mom, I'm staying in Florida. Well, I was incarcerated at the time. I was, okay, you skipped that part. So what yeah. happened there? So I was in a, I was in a boy's home uh, at the time. And I was How'd doing, you get there? Like 10 months, just, you know, truancy from school, shoplifting, uh, vandalism, breaking and entering... You know, you name it, I had a whole laundry list of shit I kept getting in trouble for, kept getting in trouble for, kept getting... Because I had you know, virtually no supervision growing up. What was your mom doing? Was she working all the time? Yeah, you know, um, and, you know, she didn't go to college or anything like that, so she unfortunately had to work pretty hard. She, you know, she worked uh, um, logistics. She was in logistics, mm. you know, so shipping and receiving, you know, all those all those kinds of things. And when did you start getting in trouble? Like nine, ten? Oh, I started running away from home when I was like eight years old. You know, packing my Scooby Doo, my, my or my Ninja Turtle backpack, and why'd you want to run away? I, I was just angry as a kid. I don't know why uh, things angered me when I was younger, and I just I didn't know how to deal with my anger. Um, growing up, I didn't have any I didn't have any outlets. You know, nobody ever nobody really took me as a child and did anything with me. You mm. know, they didn't put me into sports. They didn't teach me how to draw. They didn't put an instrument instrument in my hand. None of those things. And you didn't see your dad much. No, my dad wasn't in my life at he's all. he's in Michigan. Yeah, he wasn't in my life. Um, you know, so it was just me and my mom, and my mom was working 50, 60 hours a week. So when, would you run away when she was home or like when she wasn't home? Um, <clears throat> well, it's, I, man, these, these memories are foggy, but it was um, it was like a Saturday morning. We'd get into an argument about fucking cartoons or going, doing, you know, whatever. And then I would go to my room. I'd pack my shit. And I crawl out my window and I dip 
And I'd be gone all day long. And what would she do about it? Oh, she'd call the cops. They'd be out looking for me. She'd be driving around looking for me, you know? And wow. that, it just, that's when it started. The rebelliousness just... And my mother told me from a, from a very, very young age, she says, you've always been independent. Mm. She's like, you've always just gotten up in the morning and made your own breakfast and, you know, put your cartoons on. And I've always, I guess I always, you know, got up and clothed myself. And she never had to really do too much with me. You know, she never really had to keep an eye on me too much, she said. Was your brother... Was he getting involved in some of the same stuff, or what was the story with him? My brother is complete opposite of me. Mm. Um, we we eventually started doing carding together, but that wasn't until you know later on in life. My little brother, complete opposite. You know, quiet. Um, Not I'm, running away from home. No, 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 nothing like that. He was uh, real quiet, just real super nerdy. Um, you know, always always had something that he was involved in that held his attention. And he would just get involved with like whatever he was working on, like whatever toy or project or whatever he had going on, he would just envelope himself in that and nothing else would, you know, really transpire outside of that in life. Whereas me, I'm just the complete and total opposite. You know, I'm more outgoing. Um, it's hard for anything really to hold my attention for, you know, extended periods yeah. of time, you know, so I'll, I'll get out in something will pique my interest. I'll get involved in it. I'll become obsessed with it, and then I'll just get bored with it and move on to something different, you know? Do you think some of it – I mean, it sounds like your dad was in your life for the first seven years, right, before yeah, you moved well, down he's, there? he's always been in my life, just not in my day-to-day. -day. Right. You know what so I mean? So do you think yeah. some of that is because then your mom's down there, she's a single mother, she's working all the time, you don't get attention, and you kind of – obviously, you were naturally independent, like she yeah. told you later, but yeah. – you may have you may have been acting out because you didn't you and didn't have those eyes sure on and i'm sure a lot of it was that yeah i'm sure a lot of it was i just wasn't getting attention um you know it's it's in retrospect it's really hard to look back and, and pin down you know the, the 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 cause behind a lot of my behavior um mm. I, I just attributed a lot of it to the kind of chaos the chaos that i was living in which really wasn't chaos as as far as like, there wasn't like, you know, drug use or like abuse or any, I didn't grow up with any of those things. I mean, mm -hmm. if anything, it was just probably, you know, neglect a little bit uh, on my mom's part, but it was like, She's I was working. Yeah. I had no yeah. supervision, man. I had no supervision. So the people who were supervising me, um, you know, weren't really supervising me. They were keeping an eye on me. But yeah, I like remember who's watching you when she's at work? The neighbors. Uh, mm -hmm. We had live-in babysitters periodically. She, like she would put ads in the paper and somebody would move in and they'd be like a nanny and mm -hmm. they would take care of us. But then, you know, it was like, this is the 90s, man. Like we, like in the morning I would get up, get on my bike and I'd be gone until the streetlights came on, mm. you know? And nobody would, nobody would tell me anything different and at some point pretty early you started doing things like skipping school sure yeah, yeah. shop i guess like basic shoplifting oh, at 7-eleven oh, yeah. kind all of the, deal all of the, the the negative influences that you could imagine i had in my life at that time because you know we didn't grow up the neighborhood we grew up in was it wasn't like you know it wasn't even like a middle class affluent neighborhood it was kind of like lower middle class lower middle working class neighborhood where you know a lot of my friends parents were alcoholics um you know what in, did you in say and out of jail again? Uh, I homestead Florida, right? And then that was like 1992. But then like Hurricane Andrew came, uh, and I was in Hurricane Andrew. I remember vaguely details. That was before I was alive, but that shit was wild, right? It was the like worst, a lot worst away. natural disaster to hit the United States before Hurricane Katrina. Wow. On like a level of just you know destruction of property, devastation of you know natural resources and everything it completely leveled homestead and that hit the whole east coast of florida right? yeah so what it was it was coming towards homestead florida and then it turned it went back out so all the forecasters was like they were like or it's trending out 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 and then all of a sudden it did a 360 came back and just made a beeline straight for Damn. yep hit, hit homestead and then went up the coast and you know but yeah so it was horrible uh i remember that as a child you know it was i remember the wind and the rain I remember our house getting lifted off the foundation and carried all the way back to the, the the property. Yeah, so it was pretty intense. And then, so after that, we moved from Homestead because there was nothing left of Homestead at that point. There was there was nothing left. Whoa. So we had to move to we moved to Florida City, which is just north of Homestead or just south. I don't remember. Lived in Florida City for a little while. Early memories, you know, as a kid. I don't really have too many. And then um, to Kendall. And once we moved to Kendall, that's when I was like started becoming like into my teen years, you know. So you're like 12, 13, 14. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. this is, how'd you end up in a, in a, what was it, a boys' home, you said? Yeah, I was in Boysville. My mom just, she just couldn't wrangle me in. She couldn't, 
she couldn't get a leash on me. You know, she would she would ground me, and then I would just dip out the window and be gone. You know. Oh, so she put you in there. Uh, well, I I kept getting arrested, and okay. they were telling her like you know she was having meetings with counselors and you know people were that were trying to straighten me out. And they're like, listen, let's stick them in one of these places, give them a fucking reality check, and see if that helps. It did not. Yeah, what was that like? I mean, I don't even know what goes on in those places. Uh, you're in there amongst the worst of the worst. I mean, kids that are in there for carjacking, murder. Um, you know, one kid lit his mom on fire while she was sleeping. Just Jesus you know, those Christ. those kinds of those kinds of kids you're around. And at this point in my time, I'm at a I'm at an, I'm at an age where I'm very impressionable. Of course, because I I haven't had up until this point I haven't had any kind of role models in my life that you know I looked up to or that would teach me anything. So, you know, the, the, the kids that I'm seeing that I'm looking up to are the kids that are carjacking or the kids that are arm robbering or the gang bangers, yeah. the kids that are selling drugs, because, you know, there's a hierarchy. And, and just in that social environment I was in, those are the kids that I looked up to because those are the kids that everybody's like, oh, yeah, he's, you know, does this and he does that. And it's cool. How much is it parallel to prison? I mean, it's kids, so it's not the same. Oh, no. <clears throat> there's no parallel. There's none. No, not until you start getting up into like, uh, like the, I was in a place called um, like a GBRC center, uh, Genesee Valley Regional Center. Um, that place is like prison, but it's all, it's youth. It's 18 and under, but it's ran like a, like a prison, like a mm. maximum security prison. You've got cells and mm. the whole nine. So it wasn't like that at the boys' home. No, boys' home is more like a... Um, more of like a group home setting, you know, you've got a roommate, you've got, you know, you have group meeting every day, but then there's like a TV room, there's no locked cells or nothing like that. It's usually old converted convents mm. from like, you know, it's usually next to a church and like, you know how the nuns used to live in the convent and need to, yeah, yeah, to, yeah. not so much anymore, you know what I mean? So then they converted all these old convents into like boys homes and shit. So that's like the, the setting. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a huge believer in environment and how it molds you and and you know people yeah. make their decisions there is the final like check it off yourself and that that's just a reality of being mm -hmm. a human being but you know environments can put you in a position where you only know what your reality is so i'm just trying to picture myself well, as you're, you're conditioned first of all and then you know you your 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 mind you live in a certain paradigm Mm. And once you once you've been living in that certain paradigm and you're conditioned to the to that environment, it's it, man, it's extremely hard to see the writing on the wall or even to step away from that in third person and kind of you know what I mean. But also like the age you're getting in there too, like third. I'm I'm thinking about myself at 13. Like the hormones are starting to come in. Yeah, you don't know anything, but you actually think you know something you at this you know point. Everything. Yeah, right? yeah, and can't nobody tell you shit. You yeah. know, and it's like. So, you know, my view of, of the world and the way things operate was drastically skewed from a very young age, you know, and that, and that shaped my decision making over the next two decades. Yeah. And, and I think there's something to be said for that, though, because these places and I could say that I do say the same thing with even prison and stuff. It's mm -hmm. like they call prison Department of Corrections. There's no correcting going on. No, there's no. You know, there's there's not when when you go into something like that you're scarlet lettered as it's just how society treats it sure. and it's how we make it follow people around even after they've paid their debt to society they never really stop which i think is a little crazy for yeah. most things but like you also you're put in a kill or be killed environment they make it a hellhole on purpose so yep. while it's not like that as you point out in the boys home mm -hmm. there's still the hierarchy that you point out there's still the guy to your left is a is a carjacker or something like that like actually yeah. doing crazy shit and as you also yeah. said it's like you're looking up to some of these people because that's what you're fucking and that's what your male hormones are telling yep. you to do at the time yeah and you know these in these environments are you know there's a lot of fighting going on you know there's mm. a lot of kids that were uh, sexually abused as children so now they're teenagers so now they're preying on younger kids oh, sexually yikes. like you've got all kinds of weird fucked up shit that happens in these places fortunately enough i i never I never got the brunt of that. Like I was never, I never got abused by like the staff, but this, that was, you know, certainly going on. Um, oh, like the staff sexually abusing oh, people? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, dude. Oh, it's, oh, God. it's wild in there. Wild, you know, and, and uh, fortunately I just was lucky enough never to have to experience any of that. Like none of the sexual abuse, none of the physical abuse, <clears throat> you know, I, um, I got into it with other kids, um, cause we're kids, we're going to have the arguments, you know, so yeah. I, I did fight other kids a lot. But not too much because I'm, I've always been a lot smaller. 
you know, than everybody else my whole life. So I, I wasn't one of those kids who was like quick to violence. Right. You know what I mean? Like I was always like smart enough to kind of just be quiet and mind my own business. And even when you do that, people still fuck with you. You know of course, what I mean? Yeah. Of course, especially in an environment like that. Yeah, it was but, rough. But while you're in there, you said your mom went back to Michigan. Yeah, she took off, went back to Michigan. and um, Did you, did, I mean, did she tell you there, while you there were was in there? Con- yeah, she was like, you know, there was conversation. She's like, you know, we're doing this and then this is what we're doing. And when I got out, I just didn't want to go to Michigan. And I so, went, yeah, I went and lived with the neighbors. Like the neighbors, so the, so the people we lived next to in uh, Kendall... Their kids, like they're, 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 they used to watch me and my little brother, and they had uh, two kids around our age. So I just became really comfortable with them and their children and their family to the point to where when my mom took off, when I got out of the out of the out of the place I was in, I had to go live with them for a little while until my mom was supposed to come back down to Florida to get me, but mm. she never she never did. And that was I was just so she didn't show up. No, yeah, she just stayed in Michigan, and I stayed in Florida, and that was it. Wow, yeah, that's got to be. I mean, I know you were used to your mom not being around that much because she was yeah. working as a kid, yeah. but still, I don't... Did you feel at the time like that was traumatic or um, do you feel that way now or did you I never feel, feel that, that way, way now, but at the time I was like, dude, this is the coolest thing that like, ever fucking happened to me because mm. now I really got nobody to tell me anything because the, my neighbors were Cuban and they didn't speak English. They were older Cuban couple who spoke no English and they were, you know... So it was like I could and get you were over staying with them. Yeah, I could get over on them. They didn't even speak English. You know what I mean? So it was like, what are they going to So after a while, it was like, um, it got to the point to where they just kicked me out and I couldn't go back there. And then I'm just, now I'm just out doing, now I'm 14, 15 and I've got the. You're homeless. I got the reign of the world. I can go, go and come and come and go as I please, do whatever I want. That's how you're looking at it, but you're fucking homeless. Yeah. They kick you out of the house. You're 14, 15. I'm thinking about myself at 14. Yeah, it was rough. Like, yeah. it, like I could have never. In a million years, done that, but you get out and you're like, "Oh, this is okay." Like, wh- where do you where do you sleep at night? What are you doing? You know, you got friends friends sneak you in. You got people that sneak you in, fucking to their house and let you crash. And then you know, everybody I know, their parents get up early and go to work in the morning, and they were gone till you know at night. So I would just hang out at people's houses all day. You know, and that continued all throughout high school, and then um, you know, you just like I said, you just you just survive. You just go day to day, and like I was never really used to thinking any kind of in advance ever like that's a more recent Mm. more recent like i'm almost 40 now and that's just now i'm starting to incorporate the you know the thinking ahead and looking into the future and planning months and years and but that was never even a part of my reality back then. you were living moment to moment oh yeah hand to mouth moment to moment what am i going to eat you know at five o'clock am i i'm hungry right now what am i going to eat those kinds of things you know that's wild how you just jumped right into that yeah didn't worry but like I'm even trying to think about that, like sneaking to sleep at your friend's house, being out before the parents can see in the morning. Oh yeah, that was you do, and it's like that's how I grew up. It's like you're doing this every day, <laughs> every single day. Yeah, and you know, school. So I went to school because um, school was like a big place for me to network. So you're still going to school, it's still going to school, because that's where all the kids were. That's where everybody was. That's where like all of my, networking was everything at this point in time in my life because I had to be, I had to meet people, I had to have places to go. I, you know, so I had to be a people person. I had to, I had to be, I had to be the funny guy because I had to make friends. Where was your address? Like, what, what, what did the did the school know anything about this? No, as far as they concerned, I was still living with my parents. Um, <laughs> you know, because you know they don't know. I, I, I'm doing what i'm doing yes yeah you know and i i got i wasn't the type of person to go to like the counseling i didn't talk to the counselors and shit you didn't strike me as that kind of no i wasn't that kind of guy (laughs) i was always you know i need someone to talk to kind of i was like fuck you know i'm I'm good i'm good so you still were like you as a a, a emancipated i guess 14 15 year old unofficially emancipated unofficially emancipated with no official home you were still making the decision to go to school well, yeah, because like I said, that's where all the girls yeah. were. That's where everybody was, where I could network and find people's houses to sleep over or, you know, little hustles to do. Oh, and so that's how you would do it. Yeah, it was school. Yeah. At school, you'd be like, can I come over and sleep tonight? Yeah, I'd fucking just be hanging out. I'd be like, listen, hey, can I come crash at your house tonight? And everybody kind of knew my situation. Like all the, everybody in like, everybody kind of knew like I was just out there. Did yeah. you have any contact with your mom? 
Hey guys, hope you're enjoying the show. I got three quick things to ask in. If you don't mind, it's a huge help to grow in the show. Number one, if you haven't already commented down below, please be sure to do that. Number two, if you haven't already shared this episode with your friends, either personally or on social media, please be sure to do that as well. It's the best thing we can get. And number three, if you are on Apple or Spotify right now, please leave a five-star review on either one of those platforms. That is an enormous help over there, and I appreciate all of you who have been doing each of those things. Thanks, and back to the show. At this point? Yeah, I would call her once a week, twice a week. What did yeah. she think you were doing, living with the neighbors? Yeah. And they didn't speak English, so they weren't calling her They didn't speak her. English, yeah. 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 So she had no idea you were just couch surfing? No, not for not for about a year. Then after, when I, I think once I hit like 15, then I think she kind of knew, she kind of found out. Because I would go back and forth from Michigan. Because things would get so rough for me on the street down in Florida. Like, I would just run out of places to stay and shit. And, like, especially in, like, my earlier teenage years, I would have to take off and go to Michigan. And how'd you, how would you get to Michigan? Greyhound bus. By myself when I was 15, 16. I would and gray, how would, I would you get money? I would Greyhound bus it. Uh, steal. Pretty most mostly yeah. just stealing. Yeah. Because, you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't have a lawnmower. I didn't, I couldn't cut grass. Um... Nobody's going to give you a job at that age because you can't work. Yep. You know, so what, there's only one way for me to get anything I need, and that's through theft. So that's basically what I did. It was petty theft, pretty much. You know, I would steal jewelry or I'm very much a um, an opportunist. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just, I'll be somewhere and I'll see an opportunity and, I, and I'm just like, bomb. And then something will happen and I'll make a couple dollars here or there. Because so. you associate it with, with survival. Yeah. You know, what, one of the things Matt's, talk with me about i think he did talk i keep forgetting if he talked about this on camera i think he did a little <clears throat> bit but we talked about it a lot off camera but mm -hmm. he's into the threshold of crime a lot like mm -hmm. he thinks about that and it's a very important concept i think for people to have their own understanding of of what they're capable of and the way yeah. he talks about it is you know he's like every single person that's ever lived on this earth has a threshold at which if it's crossed they will do something illegal. Mm. He said, what I recognize in myself is my threshold is much lower than the average person, which is great that he has that understanding. Right. But like looking at you, this was an example. He didn't use you as an example, but I'm saying like, this is an example he talked about. He's like, if a mother can't feed her kid, she's going to steal. You know, if you're on the street and you have nowhere to sleep, you're going to, you're going to do something. And so with yeah. you, you're in your formative years you don't know fuck all about the world. You don't have any parent. You're, it's traumatic. Your parents are out of your life. Yeah. Your brother's not even there. He's up in Michigan. Yeah. You have no family, no one to turn to. And you are like the stress of like, I get stressed about trying to find guests, right? And like, oh my God, am I only six weeks out or four weeks out, right? You had stress every night of like, I need to find a kid in school who's going to let me, like me yeah. enough to let me sleep at home. Yeah. So of course, to, I guess to get back to Michigan and whatever, like you do something to get there. But like every time you went, you would leave again, even when your mom knew that you were basically homeless. Oh, when I, even when I got to Michigan, I didn't really stay with my mom. I would stay with other relatives, like my I would stay with uncles or cousins. But they wouldn't tell you to stay. Nobody, yeah, nobody. I was just free reign, man. My whole life, just fucking free reign. Nobody ever corralled me or put rules or regulations or restrictions on me. Nothing. Even when I was 15, if I just didn't want to stay in Michigan, I would just get up in the morning, pack my bag, catch the city bus downtown Detroit to the fucking the Greyhound bus station. I'd already have somebody, you know, either purchase my ticket for me or I'd purchase it on the phone and I would just hop on a bus and go wherever I needed to go. No questions asked. No questions asked. And I did that a lot. I, I rode the Greyhound bus a lot when I was a kid in my teenage years. I, you know, all over, uh, all over the South, uh, Georgia. I spent a little time in Georgia with a girl I met and caught the Greyhound bus out there and uh, lived in Georgia for a little while and how'd yeah. you meet her? Um, just I think through mutual friends, just in the neighborhood or something. She was from Georgia, and then I don't even remember how I ended up in in Georgia, but I ended <laughs> up in Georgia for a little while as a teenager. Yeah, it's like you're at the same time unbelievably immature, but mature like crazy in ways that you don't even appreciate or understand. I didn't it's understand. It's bizarre. It. Yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't understand at that time. Like it just it just, everything seemed normal to me at that time. Like all of this seemed normal. Mm. You know what I mean? And yeah. it wasn't until later on in life that I realized that when I look back I'm just like, "Wow, man. Wow." So many times something could have gone like way wrong and you're dead. Or or oh, something, you know oh, what I mean? So many times, yeah. And so many times. And it's not even in some of the predictable ways for your situation either. It's more like you you took it on you you grabbed the bull by the horns and did it and like even if you're mature in the sense that i meant it where like you are 
you're developing independence, insane independence mm-hmm. in, in dangerous ways even at a young age. You're still – I could call that mature, but your your mind is not in a place where you're ready to understand what comes with that. Yeah. And as an example, I'm just saying like this didn't happen, but if you were 16 or 17, this is a prime case where you're going to knock up a girl, mm-hmm. right? And then, I mean, what yeah. the fuck do you do after that? That Luckily, happened when I was 17. You did? Yeah. You had a kid when you were 17? 17, yeah. Yeah, she's 21 now. I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> I knew you had a kid. I didn't know you had, had one five. that early. You have five kids. I have five kids, man. Well, now you're making my point for me. Yeah. Because th- this is it. Like, you're you're surviving, you're going to places, you're sleeping wherever, and, like, you're making all your own decisions when your brain is not in a formulated place to be able to make any kind of decision. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, d- d- understanding the ramifications of the decisions I was making and how it would affect my life in the long term. I had no concept of that at all. You wow. Know. Yeah, you had said something. Wait, you, you did the one with, with Matt, Inside the Darkness, on, on his second channel. That was really, really good. And people should check that out because what Matt does, what does he call it? He calls it Poor Man's Soft White Underbelly or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Poor Man's uh, Soft White Underbelly. <laughs> oh, owns it up. And he'll right tell away. you, he'll tell you, he's just, it's a direct ripoff. It's literally, and he knows Mark too, I guess. Mark, Mark Later, the guy who does yeah. Soft White Underbelly. But, and you do. Cause yeah. You yeah. own that. We're but, all cool with Mark. Mark's cool, man. But, amazing work he does but like that was that was really good when when you were on with him and there was something you said in there about your family that you know listening to you describe it now i'm, I'm still trying to put it all together because it, it's i'm not sure i ever heard someone say it this way but you were like i have a family they're here on earth and you weren't you're not like it, you don't at least outwardly express anger mm-hmm. at it though no, i would fully understand if, if you had that but you're like they're here on earth yeah like but they, like I, yeah, yeah i don't really have like family. they physically exist here on this planet um like i have family they exist but they're just not they're just not a part of my life they never have been and that's the only way it's kind of like that was that was the divide that when when something like that happens it's like cutting a cord it's just amazing to me that you would still go up and visit there and it still wouldn't be pulled i can't wrap my head around yeah (laughs) yeah you know i go and i see my grandparents and they love me to death and you know uh, my cousins i have like 15 or 20 cousins and we're all around the same age uh, age range um you know so it's always a big party every time i go up there and they welcome me and everybody loves me but it's like kind of just like out of sight out of mind with my entire family if I'm not physically present there, then I just don't exist. Do you think it's because I- I'm speculating here? Sure. I don't know because I don't know your family, mm-hmm. and you know I only know you a little bit. But do you think it there's something like they the expectations of you at such a young age were put low because you were getting into trouble that they almost before you were even grown, like they accepted the fact that like, oh, he's going to be here when he wants to and not when he wants to. And like, we can't really do anything about that. And so it's almost like they anchored it in their head that like, this was your normal. Man, it's that I never really thought about it like that before. Um, I just know my family is, they're, they're they're just strange. They're all strange. You know, they're very, very selfish. Um, You know, each individual unit of, household uh is just very selfish with their resources and their time and their energy Mm. you know so it's like none of the family really uh, expends too much time energy or resources into anything that's outside of their household does that make sense to you yes you know what i mean so it's like i have aunts and uncles and, and they have and i have cousins and whatever's going on in their household that's their that's their you know their universe Uh, And I'm over here and I don't exist inside of their household. So they don't Mm. invest any time, energy or resources into me or my life. And that's just how it's always been. That's the way it is with my grandparents. That's the way it is with all my aunts and uncles. That's the way it is with my mom. Uh, That's just the way it is. And I I don't know why they're like that. It's just like, and I see other people's families that'll bend over backwards and spend their last dime to make sure somebody, you know, goes, doesn't go a day without eating or sleeping on the street. And for whatever reason, my family's just not like that. They just yeah, and and I think like I come from a, I have big families on both sides. Yeah, and, and as people, do I. Yeah, and and people are, yeah. You said you have like twenty cousins or something. So yeah, I have a clearly. lot of a lot of cousins. Yeah, but I think when you do, when when you know the reality that you just laid out as the other side of what you didn't experience, mm-hmm. which is what I know, it's hard to fathom that because yeah. I mean I know how I 
feel about my family. Anyone could be like, oh, they're on a hard time. Like, hey, what can I do? You exactly. know what I mean? Exactly. And that's how I'm wired. And by the way, that's how they're wired. Yeah. There's not really – everyone's got their own tics and, you know, different differences to them for sure. It's mm-hmm. it's family. But at the end of the day, like, there's there's something about that. There's, there's a clear kinship. And it's just what makes it more bizarre is the fact that there was still, like – you know, you're connected by a thread at least still. Yeah. And, and it's and, still, and like matter. I said, when I'm present, when I'm physically present, I get that feeling of that overwhelming feeling of acceptance and love and they include me in things. But when I decide that I, you know, when I'm off living my life somewhere else, it's like, I don't exist. Nobody calls to check on me. Nobody invites me over for holidays. Nobody, you know, it's nothing. It's like, well, where the fuck do they call? This isn't during like the, cell, this is the earliest days of the cell phone era. Maybe did you even have one? Oh, back then? And like when you were 15, 16, no, 17? No, dude, cell phones weren't even a thing until yeah, I was, was almost like, a senior this is in high school. It, would, it was like the Gordon Gecko model. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there, there were no, there was no, like, so yeah, communication was a little bit more difficult back then. Like you had to make an effort. You had to actually, fit, like now it's, it's effortless. Send a fucking pigeon, something. Yeah. It's effortless. But you know, back then it's just, yeah. I've never really, actually, I've never really sat and tried to make sense out of any of it. I've just accepted it for what it is. And well, I'm, that's why you're here. <laughs> that's why <laughs> yeah. we're talking about it. It's yeah. so cute. I've, I've never dug into it and tried to analyze any of it. That's why that content with Matt was great because for people who have never seen Soft Wet Underbelly, for example, or Inside the Darkness mm-hmm. that Matt does, it's just you get up there and Matt Matt is totally, like Mark will at least like talk with some of the oh, people. Oh, Matt's not even Matt in the room. Matt just fucking leaves and yeah. he just says, tell your story. And and he wants you to just go. And so people who are good at doing that can, can I mean, it's very compelling. And, and when you were doing that, it did seem to me, and I and I guess I'm wrong about this, it seemed to me like you had at least some... Like you were all, as you were explaining things, you were reflecting on it. I do that a lot. Yeah. But you're saying that you don't actively, like you've never sat down outside of like talking to someone like me or something and, Mm -mm. and been like, huh, I wonder why. No, because to me, it just, it's not going to solve any, it's not going to help me resolve anything. I don't Mm. think, you know, so I just don't, I don't spend any time or energy thinking about things that aren't, you know. That's a key right there, you know? what you just said, because you had to learn in your survival, as we've pointed out, you had to learn how to how to survive tonight, how to how yeah. to get through it. So your the rest of your brain chemistry, your behavioral pattern says, How am I surviving today, to this day, no matter how roof over your head, whatever exactly, it is. Exactly, yeah. And so you're not really the type who ever had the opportunity even to have the luxury say of reflecting yeah i didn't have the lighting ex- like exactly i didn't have the luxury of even so that's just the way my brain is trained uh and you know i'm very good at compartmentalizing yes it's just something clearly. i've become very 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 good at over the years um <clears throat> so it's easy for me to take very you know traumatic experiences uh file them away in a box somewhere and then just move on with the rest of my life right. and not really let those things uh affect me too much now granted i do have a lot of ptsd just from how I grew up, and I'm starting to deal with that and realize that and become more um, when did you realize aware? That? Um, in, in my 20s, when I tried um, in getting into relationships, mm. you know, when I tried to like falling in love and being in uh, other relationship, that's when I I started to realize that um, I don't have the tools necessary um, to 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 deal with to deal with this. Like being in relationships and like, well, you know, dealing with women and like. What do you mean the tools necessary um, specifically? Like, I, so I, I contribute, I attribute, um, I have, what I attribute to a, a lot of me being the way I am is empathy. Like I have a lot of empathy inside of me for other human beings. And I think that was instilled into me at a very young age from my grandmother. Um, mm. And I don't know, you know, and, and, and I curse her every day for it because I wish I didn't have the empathy on the level that I do because I feel like I would have went a lot for, I'd be a, more, a lot more successful in life if I was able just to step on, you know, people's necks and not think twice about it to get to where I need to go. Because I feel like they, anybody who's, you know. Those people die alone and unhappy. Think so. So I, I yeah. wouldn't, I wouldn't, I understand why you think like that. You know what I mean? all the things you've been through yeah. and stuff, and we'll get into all that. Yeah. But I like that you turned out this way. Yeah. And that was a good, that was a good move by grandmother. Um, you know, so I just have empathy, man. And, and, you know, I, um, I think a lot about how my behavior is going to affect, uh, the world around me and like mm. the people that are, you know, around me. And, and so a lot of that has 
shaped my decision making. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you, I mean, again, because you, I hadn't heard you in anything talk about this, but you, you had your first kid at 17. 17 years old. Yeah. So what, what happens there? Like, uh, she was older, you know, she was, uh, 21 or 22 and, you know, a real super religious family. Um, Georgia girl. No, uh, this was in Michigan, actually. This happened in Michigan. That was one of the times I was up there for, mm. you know, a few months or a year or whatever. And, um, you know, I was just hanging with the wrong crowd, you know, hanging with uh, drug dealers and gangbangers and uh, escorts. And I was really big into, like, the whole strip club scene and everything, even from, like, 16. At 16, 17. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was living in, that's the world that I was living in from probably 16, 15 or 16, all the way up until I was... 25 so how did you meet religious 21 year old she was a stripper come on yeah religious super super religious family you know father was a preacher mother was uh worked in the church mm. um daddy issues probably yeah she well, yeah, yeah she had all kinds of shit going on and um you know met her met her through mutual friends uh you know i've always the crowd that i hung around with was always five or six years older than me so at 15 16 mm. the kids i was around were in their 20s because the kids my age all had curfews and, you know, had to go home and do their you homework. You couldn't have and, that. <laughs> no, I can't. I, you know, that's, that doesn't even exist in my paradigm. You know, so I'm, I'm with the older kids that can stay out all night and the ones that are, you know, can provide booze and drugs and, you know. And then the younger ones would sneak in at, at 1 a.m. to sleep. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's wow. until I started finding flop houses just to fucking kind of stay at when right. I, in my teenage years because there was plenty of those, you know. People's parents that were like on drugs, so like all the teenage kids used to just come and go as they pleased and out of their home, and the parents were so fucked up on alcohol and fucking being barely able to pay the fucking rent that they didn't give a shit who was sleeping on the couch. You know what I mean? Like those kind yeah. of situations. You but know, you also told me this was, I think, right before we were on camera. But you were saying you didn't touch drugs till you were in your twenties. Yeah. So even when you were young and you I was, were with all I these people, I was exposed to to crack. I was exposed to heroin. I was exposed to all that. And shit. And you didn't touch it. Didn't touch any of it. Yeah. You just drank a little bit with so them. Marijuana was my thing. Yeah, it's always been my thing. Even to this day, you know, marijuana has always been my thing. And uh, I drank a little bit here and there. Uh, and the drinking didn't even become really a problem until I was in my 20s, till after I was 21. And I could, you know, have free access to it. Uh, and then it became a problem periodically throughout my life. But, yeah, I never got into the hard drugs, man. But the stripper was up in Michigan, so it was during one of your times visiting home. Like, yeah. when you would visit home, how long? Like, two weeks, three weeks? <sighs> It was all different times. Sometimes it would be for a few months. Sometimes I it think, was the summer or something. Yeah, always during the summertime. It was always during the summer when I went up there. And then usually October, November, December starts rolling in. You and got then, school. Yeah, and then you know things. Well, things will change because you know well you live where the where the seasons change. So you know the person that you meet in the summertime isn't the same person. That's in the wintertime. Like people, hmm. just like the seasons change, I, pe I feel like people that live in the Midwest, they, they have seasons and they change with the seasons. Oh, that's, I've never heard that before. That's no? interesting. Because like, it's like the person you meet in the summertime isn't the same person you're going to, so if I were to go back home and so if I, say I, say I met somebody in July and I hung out with them for two months and mm. I went back to Florida and then I came back up in January or February and I hung out with that same person, that's two completely different fucking people. You know what I mean? Like in the summertime, people are more like, oh, let's go do this. And they wake up in the morning and you go out because the weather's nice. And then in the wintertime, everybody kind of just slows down. People's attitude changes. They kind of get that hibernation thing. They're working on something that, you know what I mean? Like it's two completely different. You know, when you live somewhere where it's 90 degrees yeah. all year round, it's go, 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 go. And people have the different kind of personality. I've thought about this with where people live, yeah. right? So Florida people, oh, there's Sure, oh, it's Florida people. That's, yeah, 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 that's yeah. a certain thing. But Florida people, Jersey people, or Florida people, Michigan people, something like that. I've never thought about it with a person living in one place like Michigan and, oh, Michigan person July, Michigan person January. Two completely but different But as you people. just said that, some shit was clicking. That's wild. Yeah. That, some shit was just clicking in my head. Yeah. That that does make some sense to me. Yeah. So those are two completely different people you're dealing with. So, you know, when, when the wintertime started coming and, like, the house parties stopped and people started coming out and, like, things just got lame and boring, I'm like, I gotta get the fuck out of here. Like, I can't sit in a house for so, the next four or five months and play video games like you motherfuckers do up here. Like, I can't do that. So you might just show up to school in November then down in Florida. You can just show up and they'd be like, oh, hey, welcome back. Well, you know, I'd be like, yeah, I was on vacation or whatever. I was vi <laughs> I was visiting family in Michigan or and listen, I'm I'm and they just say no problem. Yeah. Hop in quest. Well, I would I could write or produce whatever documents I needed to. I've always been able to do that. So how would you do that? Like create fake shit? Oh yeah. Yeah. Doctor's notes. I was, you know, I was the I was the go to guy in my high school for like 
any kind kind of documents you needed for for whatever. I was. I how was would you make to. a doctor's note? Like, how would you make the actual physically? Oh, so I would. Uh, well, I would go to like so whatever hospital you said you went to. I'd go to the website or I'd go to like you know Google Images or whatever, and I'd get the um, when you're like fifteen. The hospital. Yeah, I'd figure I'd get the hospital logo and I'd make like a letterhead, you know, like an official looking document, and I would take the logo and I would duplicate it a bunch of times, drop the opacity on it. And put it as like a watermark on the back, and then I would put all the font in front of that and make it look like an official-looking document. This is the earliest days of the internet, though. You were able yes. to get stuff that was good enough. I mean, I'm thinking you got to be working with well, like ADP so, or something. So I, I hacked into, I was able to gain uh, administrative access to the Fort Lauderdale Public Library System. Oh. Hmm. So once I did that, I had access to all their computer networks, and then I was able to. How old are you? Oh, I was a teenager. 15, 16? Yeah, 15, 16. So then you were able to get access to this stuff. Yeah, I was able to gain administrative access to the Fort Lauderdale Public Library system. So then I was able to um, add and remove programs a as I wanted to to the computers. So I had, you know, the best. And obviously, it's Windows 98. I mean, it was what it was. Yeah, back it's the then. best at the time. At the, yeah. at the time. Yeah. So I had access to it. And I had full reign access to it. So I, I learned how to add and remove programs. And I learned how to use uh, Adobe Photoshop at a very young age. Um, you know, I, I didn't even became, know that shit was around then. I, well, I don't even think it was Adobe Photoshop back then. I think it was it was something else. It was like Coral fucking paint, paint <laughs> Coral Draw, and they had a couple other little, very very rudimentary uh, programs that you could use. But yeah, so you would learn how to make doctor's notes. You would learn how to produce documents that that might be official, like school documents. You'd be able to find out what their letterhead looked like for that, and then mm -hmm. make it sign someone else's name and they believe it every time oh yeah yeah oh every time Holy yeah shit. and then and then as i got a little bit older i started doing like uh car insurance for people who you know couldn't afford car insurance but they needed to get their vehicle registered so i would make a, you know a insurance document so that they could take them to the dmv and get their vehicle registered i you know, right, we're, we're, we're gonna get to that yeah, 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 I, yeah. I, I want to ask all about <laughs> yeah, that yeah, too yeah. i'm just like this was the earliest <laughs> yeah. forms of that where you yeah. were doing it and again what do you what's what is the psychological loop here i'm surviving bitch like that's that's how you're doing. It. It's not like, ooh, let me just go do fraud. It's like, oh shit, all right, it's November. I'm coming back from Michigan. I gotta get into class. All right, yeah, let's figure out this. You know what yeah. I mean? Like that's what people yeah. like me can't process. But I need people like me who are listening to think about that and say, well, what would you do? Right. Yeah, you do the same fucking thing if right. if you could even pull it off. That's impressive that you did. Yeah, nuts. But you had the kid at 17, so that was Michigan girl stripper. Yep. I guess you met her in the summer or something. Yep. And then when did she tell you she was pregnant? Oh, well, we were dating, and then um, you know, as soon as she, as soon as she knew, I knew she was dating a sixteen-year-old. I was seventeen at this time. Well, you I were just, seventeen uh, when the kid was born, or you were seventeen when you knocked her up. How old were you? Sixteen. You're right. I was sixteen. Yeah, I was sixteen. So she was messing with me. I was sixteen. She was like twenty-one or twenty-two. Isn't that a felony? Uh, it, in retrospect, I mean, it never yeah, feels think, that way. I'm uh, hypocritically never feels that way with chick on guy, but yeah, technically, if it was 21 year old dude and a 16 year old oh, girl, yeah. it'd be a different fucking yeah, story. Yeah, and yeah, it, it, it's hypocritical, and there is, um, you know, there is something to that, which you I mean, know, it's probably exciting for you. I mean, shit. Well, yeah, you know, I'm, stuff. and everybody's like, oh my god, you're with someone. I'm like, yeah, I'm fucking. <laughs> they could nobody could believe it. And, like people would talk shit to her. Like fucking, she would catch a lot of shit for it too because I was so young. I'll bet. But I was young. But I was like, I was right there with everybody. Like I was, I was right there with all with, with everybody who was 21, 22, 23. I was fucking right. I was out all night with them. I, I, would, I could hang drinking with them. I could hang smoking with them. Quick question: When you were back, when you were talking about eight or nine, it just made me think of this. Mm -hmm. And you'd take the bike and leave for the day. Were you hanging out with kids five, six years older than you? They were 15, 16. Yeah, I was hanging out with go. the teenagers. Yeah, this is what happened. Okay, that yep. makes the point. So yep. so she tells you she's pregnant, and then what happens? Oh, dude, I'm a kid. I don't fucking know. I mean, obviously, I have no resources to be able to fucking take care of a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah you have no money. At this point, you know. Um, and, and her family was like, get super, out? Oh, yeah, dude. They didn't, they didn't want me to have anything to do with the whole situation. Absolutely not. They fucking... And she was such a fucking nightmare that when she had the baby, her parents just kind of took over with the kid and then she took off and became like a she, she just went down the worst road possible after that uh, we split up and oh, I, yeah she became like a hardcore drug addict and like gained like fucking 200 pounds or something like that like 150 200 pounds and fucking just ballooned out like she was tiny she looked like you know like me like 130 140 something like that and then i fucked heard she her whole life. yeah she fucked up her whole and then she now she's got like health issues and shit but it's like you know so i wasn't have you ever met your daughter no i was there for like the first year they allowed me and then... To, like, see her. Yeah. Like, I would go and see and, like, you know, hang out and as she, when she was a baby and... 
But dude, I was, you know, I was 17, man. I know, but I was, did you feel, fuck. yeah, and, and also I'm thinking about your own life where you've had to be independent. You don't have like no. that. I was homeless. I didn't have a vehicle. I didn't have a job. I did was you fucking... feel a kinship? Because it's your kid? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, you know, you do feel that. And especially because I do have a lot of empathy. And, you know, I, so I felt that immediate connection. But I oh, was 17, man. You know, like, how how much can you understand that, what you're supposed to feel as opposed to what you do feel when it's like the whole thing's fucked, you know? And it's like, I didn't, I didn't know what to do or what to feel or how to act or the decisions to make. I didn't, I didn't know any, I, you know, I had no fucking clue. And you guys weren't really together because you were living down in Florida. I mean, I'm 17, school. she's 22, she's stripping, I'm banging her a little bit here and there, we're hanging out. Oh, she out. was still stripping after she had the kid. Well, yeah, she went right back to it. Oh, she was an absolute fucking nightmare, just an absolute wow. nightmare of a person. Yeah, you know, so, wow. you know, that was the situation it was, and there was nothing I could do about it, you know, and then once the parents took over, they didn't want me to have anything to do with the, you know, obviously, because I didn't even really... Is that one conversation? Is that like them pulling you aside once and saying, leave and never come back? Oh, they didn't even do it face to face. I I showed up at the house and they wouldn't let me in one day. They're like, Kristen's not here. I was like, okay, can I come in and see Serena? They're like, no, you can't. And what am I supposed to do? You're a kid. Get yeah. violent? Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't, I couldn't go get a lawyer. I couldn't, there was no, yeah. I, what, <laughs> yeah. What do I do? I can't, you know, what do I call contact family services? I'm a teenager. They would have locked me, they would have put me in a fucking home. Right. You know right. what I mean? I, they would have been sending me to fucking some kind of fucking place there. You know what I mean? So I was like... And there's also probably a part of you... So, well, don't let me say this if it's not true, mm -hmm. but perhaps subconsciously, that's like... I, I mean, obviously, you got to have disdain for the parents for doing that shit and obvious the, the whole situation. But you're also looking at it like, I, I don't even know how I'm going to survive tonight. I could never take care of a kid oh, myself. No, and so no, no, at no. least like... She's got this home right here. The parents, yeah. you know, they're not missing yeah. any meals. They're yeah. doing okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, there was that relief, I guess, if you could call it a little bit. Um, it's a bizarre relief, but It yeah. is a bizarre relief. I mean, I knew that, they're, you know, and, and her parents were kind of fucked up anyway, but it was like, there's like you said, shelter and, and I don't even food. know where I'm going to live tonight. Right. So, you know, bringing a, a child in, into that at like 17, forget about it. And you're, and, forget about you know, you're a male too. It's yeah. like, it's not as natural. It's already hard to be a... A yeah. single parent, period. But then, like a male single parent, there's just there's a biological thing there. It's not as yeah. women are are more adept at that. Yeah, just, just well, the thing. you know, with the more with the you know the love and the affection and yes. the feelings. Like men, we're just more calculated. You know, uh, uh, you know, I have to make this decision because you know X, Y, and Z has to happen. So emotion can't be any part of this. And you didn't have it either because you had to learn how to. Yeah, you know, I was emo I was emotionally stunted. Um, I didn't really, I didn't learn the proper way to deal with other human beings until oh, probably like the past five or six years. Mm. It's just now I'm starting to understand, you know, how you deal with people, and you know, every person is their own microcosm of fucking, you know, traumatic events, PTSD, and whatever else, you know, they got shit they got going on inside their head that makes them who they are, and that's the the. That's what's presented to the world, and that's what you have to interact with. Mm. And none, none of that. I, I wasn't even thinking that way. You know, of course you weren't. Yeah, you know, I just wasn't. Can't be expected to. I yeah. mean, I. You know, the older I get, the more I realize how fucking dumb I was. And I, I mean, I knew I was. That's the thing. I did have some self awareness, like a little bit, that mm. I was pretty dumb at most ages. But you know, even thinking about myself at like twenty two, I'm like, holy shit, man. Yeah. You know, if I had had to face. I did have to face some serious life decisions at that age, but like if I had to face the most serious ones, you know, family, marriage, kids, shit like that, mm -hmm. dude, I don't even know. Like, thank God. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know how I would have possibly made good decisions. Mm -hmm. Put it that way. Yeah. You know, it's difficult. The decision making is, is definitely difficult for sure. But like you said, you had five total, right? Yeah, just man, and you know, when like at what? Just so I know the timelines when we move forward. At what ages did you have each? Fuck, seventeen, nineteen, twenty-two or twenty-three, and then twenty-seven, twenty-six. You're fucking 
walking condom advertisement. Yeah. <laughs> 26, 25, 26. And then, but see, here's the thing with all my kids, man. Like, so I know for sure my daughter's mine. Um, well, at least, and, and this, and fuck, I don't even know. Who the knows? The first one. Who the fuck okay. knows? You know what I mean? I don't know. You know what I mean? I think you feel pretty confident. Uh, I do, you know, but I was, I, I don't know. I was, I was naive at 17. You know, I thought she was only messing with me. She could have no, been. That's fair. She could have been fucking five other people at the time. That's I was just, fair. but I was seventeen, looking at it like I was very naive. So I don't know. You know, I had no fucking idea. You know, and then my 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 next child I had, I was um nineteen. You said I was nineteen, and I I dated the girl for like eight months, uh, and she didn't even tell me she had a baby until he was four years old. Yeah, so I was well. It was it was four or five years after we had been separated that she had fucking contacted me and then she me. said by the way i got by pregnant way, and i had a kid yeah and then so i don't even know if that one's mine either because apparently she got with somebody right after me and then had the baby and told him it was his and then oh my God. yeah so he raised the kid for like three years and then one day was like you know what i want a fucking paternity test and found out it wasn't his so the dude had been had been raising the kid found out it wasn't his so now she then she called me and tried to tell me it was mine but who who I don't know I don't know I've never taken yeah, I've never taken one, a that. single paternity test for any of my children I don't know if I buy that one You know so then yeah. that's the second one third one uh, was with my uh was with this 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 woman named this girl named Melissa that I met in in Fort Lauderdale we were together for 2 years Uh he's mine for sure 1000% uh his name's Nicholas he lives in South Carolina uh, I talk to him every day on the phone. Oh, that's great. Yeah, we have a really good relationship uh, with each other. He's probably the only one, only only child out of all my kids that I have like a really good relationship with. We'll unpack with. that later for sure. But yeah, okay. yeah. And, um, you know, so I, I, every day, you know, Instagram and back and I'm, forth. I'm aware of the of the fifth one because we'll, I don't want to give that away. That, yeah. That's an important part of, of your story, like when yeah. that all happened. Yeah. But that's, that is, uh, and then, that's and then, a lot to... And then after, so when I was with her, it was when all the Secret Service shit went down. So she right. left me when, when I got busted. And then I was on the run for like, well, not even on the run. I was just for three years. I didn't know what was going on. I yeah, met well, I met someone else, got married. And then that's when I had uh, Aiden, my, my my most recent son, which he, that was 2012. Oh, so you had one after that. Too. Okay. All yeah. Right. So that was 2012 when he was born. Got it. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll get to those ones for sure. But I yeah. Wanna, so I he's 10. Stay. So he's 10. And then uh, I have a little girl with my wife, um, which she's not mine 100%. But we can, yeah. It's, okay. It's, we'll, we'll, we'll it's get all there. crazy, man. We'll, we'll get, it's, there's, it's nuts. There's and then, okay, and then, so me and my wife were together in, in after I got out of prison in uh, Nebraska. When did you get married to her? Like, before? 2011, before I went to prison. And that was after, obviously, after first I got, girl. Right, yes, right, I got, okay. first right. girl got busted, met this girl, got married, and then I went to prison. All right, let, let's let's come back to her, because sure. I, I want to skip ahead sure. of, like, how everything went down and what you did because yeah. that's that's the core here like and then i had a kid i had a kid in nebraska apparently um i was with the, i was with my wife and then i me and my dude, wife you need a up. fucking rubber listen i know dude i know listen man. i know i know it feels a lot better but that's my advice to you i, I feel comfortable oh, I giving that advice yeah it's a nightmare well okay. i think i'm doing pretty good now like now <laughs> now i know better now no, now I know I don't fuck around pull, anymore. Pull out game strong. Yeah, oh, <laughs> you have no idea. As soon as I get that little tingle. <laughs> oh, man. As soon as I start feeling the tingle, that's how I'm out of there. All right, so you have the kid at 17. So all these kids are questionable, pretty much. All right. Like, it, it, Except you know what a I mean? couple of them. Except for, you know, Aiden. maybe a Aiden, for sure. He's mine, and Nicholas, for sure. Okay. You know, we'll, all the rest are, you know, all right, we'll, up in the air. We'll, we'll talk about them. But the first one, mm -hmm. 17... By same year, it sounds like they said you came over. You're not allowed to be there. Yeah, they they just put an end to it. Okay, so you're coming up on the end of high school or at the end of high school mm -hmm. when that happens, when you're out of yep. that kid's life, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. What'd you do after that? Because now high school's over. You're not going to school every day. You're still technically homeless. Yeah. Like, I, do you have any money in your pocket? Like, no. what's what's oh, happening? Oh no, no, no! I'm living hand to mouth. I've never really, I didn't really have any money um, per se until I started doing fraud. Uh, you know, it's always just been, I'll get a check and then, like, I'm just living, you know, check to check, hand to mouth. Like, I never had any kind of savings right. or any kind of regular income. Right. That's been my whole entire life up until you know quite recently. Um, 
So I, you know, I know I, well, I've always been, like I said, I'm altering documents, um, graphic design, web development. I got into a little bit of web development. Uh, I took a program or a class uh, when I was incarcerated at one point in time when I was a teenager. And that piqued my interest uh, into, uh, it was a program called Dreamweaver. I don't know if you're familiar with that program. It's kind of an older program. No, but when were you, in, you were incarcerated again after 13? Oh, I was incarcerated probably nine or 10 months out of every year from the age of 13 until I was 19 years old. I was in a program. And then I was. So you really weren't going to school much because you were usually in something. Well, yeah, but I had to go to school in there. I had to go to school while I was. Oh, so it's not like. Okay, so you're talking like the boys' home route more where you're still living in society. You're not necessarily. You're not a prisoner, but you're incarcerated in the sense that you have. You do get a roof over your head with yes. that. And you're, and you're in there with a, like 15 or 20 or 30 other kids. That are all, you know, but you do go to school, but you got to come back, you know, and, and believe me, it's not, you're not free. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know I mean, like, they, fucking, they, do a, they do a head count in there. every day. You have to yeah. be back. And if you're not back, it's, you got a warrant for, for your arrest. Right. You know what I mean? Like fucking, or you get escalated to a, a higher security. Like these are all low security places. They were sending me when I was a youth because I wasn't violent. I wasn't a violent teenager. Like a lot of the more violent kids, they would lock up and, you know, put them in the security level was a little bit higher. So it wasn't necessarily every year though but it, you were in and out from 13 to 19 yeah basically. it was it was probably six or eight ten months out of every, almost every year i was in a program and then i'd get i would complete the program i'd get out i would do good for a few months and then i'd violate my probation and because i had really nowhere to stay every time i would get picked up by the cops and i would go into the, the like the juvenile juvenile hall like the maximum security and i'd go and see the judge and they were like okay well where can we send him we, he doesn't have a house to go to so we have to put them into a fucking program. We have to put them into boys' home. We have to put them into. You, Did you know, ever call your mom? Plenty of times, and she told me when. Most, my mother called me on my seventeenth birthday, and she told me that um, I'm no longer her responsibility because the state of Florida recognizes me as an adult at the age of seventeen. So I'm no. I'm now. I'm no longer her responsibility. On my seventeenth birthday, I got that phone call. Not that I didn't already know. You know what I mean? But I guess she just felt like she had to make it official, official, you know, to like, no, so now don't call me for anything else ever. And I haven't spoken to my mother at this point. I haven't spoken to or seen my mother since 2010. That's a lot to deal with, man. Yeah. I mean, you, you take it. So it's fine. Matter of fact, it's fine. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, because listen, I focus on the things in life that make me happy. I don't focus on all of the trauma and all of the past events and like all of the, you know, what could have been relationship with my mother and my family all of that's done it is what it is like i benefit nothing from revisiting or even letting any of that affect me but at some point in the last few years you did recognize your own ptsd and everything I'm starting, so did some of that yes. come up when you well, did that now yeah well yeah cuz you know you're churning uh you know all of that old shit up and and i've been so good at compartmentalizing over the years that you know uh, Opening some of those cabinets does, you know, it, it, some of those feelings are, are obviously are, are automatically going to come up to the, you know, the feeling of rejection, Absolutely. the feeling of isolation, the feeling of Fuck being yeah. alone, uh, neglect, you know, all of those things, all of those feelings. But I, when those feelings pop up, I understand how to deal with them. You process them and then you, you know, figure out what triggered that emotion and then you move on. I can't believe you're alive and, and or that you're not like an almost dead drug addict. Oh, I know. I'm, I'm going to be know, honest. Man. Like, and, and I think that's in spite of some of the big mistakes you made along the way, I think that's actually pretty incredible. Oh, I, I by don't all know, means right now, I'm know. supposed to be a homeless, crazy drug addict or, or doing like a 50 or 60 year prison bid. Yeah. Yeah. Or I'm going to, or I'm supposed to be dead by all intents and purposes. That, those were the three avenues that I'm supposed to be. Uh, I've just, like I said, I've just been extremely fortunate enough to always I hate calling myself intelligent because I really don't feel like I'm that intelligent. I've just, I've always been able to see what other people have not been able to see. If you that, have, if you, that yeah, makes any kind yes. of sense. You ha you definitely, it's very clear talking with you and knowing you a little bit, you have a high degree of day-to-day -day emotional intelligence of understanding other people. You also live in a, like, there was a time in your life where every single thing you had to do was a lie. So yeah. you live in a constant state of, you, you've been in a period of your life now for five, ten years where you're telling the truth on things. 
it's not comfortable for Everything. you. Everything. No, I hate it. It's not. <laughs> and I can tell because I can see, like, yeah. even just, I'll tell you, even just sitting here, I can see where a wall comes up and like, okay, he's not totally telling me the truth there. And then mm-hmm. two minutes later, you kind of do a little bit. Yeah. It's like you want, and that's a very admirable thing. Mm-hmm. But to not, to not have any even understanding of that until you were in your 30s, like really thinking about it is also yeah. now, actually probably a blessing. Because now, you yeah, oh, yeah, trust right? me, it would have fucking buried me. It was yeah. for my own, you know, out of just pure survival that I couldn't, I couldn't deal with those emotions. Right. I couldn't because it would have fucking ruined me. And, you know, and like I said, now I'm starting to unpack everything in retrospect and kind of because now I'm, I'm making decisions in my life that are, that are detrimental to my success mm. and I'm doing it on autopilot. You always had been. And now I'm trying to figure out, you know, why. That what's the mechanism behind the decisions that I'm making without without actually being able to think about what I'm doing before I make the decision that's having this negative effect on my life. So now it's like I have to now I have to start dealing with all of this shit that I've been suppressing for twenty or thirty years because, you know, now I have the next twenty or thirty years to look forward to and, and all of this shit is going to pop up at inconvenient times and ruin opportunities and, you know, things for me. So now I have to start dealing with a lot of this shit. That's a lot, man. Yeah. I mean, it's It's pretty heavy. You know, you think about the, we get some of these experiences through documentaries and movies and books, right? Like people like me that had a, I would say relatively just normal upbringing, Mm. two parents, they didn't even divorce, which is like great in today's times as well. Yeah, it's pretty rare. Yeah, it's, I have a lot of friends whose parents divorced. That's certainly something there. It's, it's, you're on a whole different level, Yeah, you know? And so we hear about something like this and, and again, I'll always say it, but just trying to, I, I, in these conversations do my best. I can't, but I do my best to put as much of myself in, in this case, your shoes as I can, and and it's not. I mean, it, it it it's very hard to be in any way an empathetic person and and judge someone like you mm. for for where you're at. And also, let's be honest here: you, you're not a murderer, you're not a rapist. You, it's I'm not a violent person, right? I'm not nothing, a I'm not a violent person that harms people, right? Like, I can't do that. You There's know? there is a huge difference. Yeah, I may honest. have been a thief at one point in time in my life where I, I stole a lot, but it was you know. It wasn't. Live. A, it was not a malice. Yes, exactly. You know? That and and I I look at with everyone with I don't care who you are, great person, bad person, indifferent. I do look at intent. Mm-hmm. I make a lot of judgments on intent. Yeah, you know, like I'll sit there and, and tell Matt like. He didn't have to do this stuff. His intent was bad, and I make a judgment on what a bad person he was doing it. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I respect where he's at now yeah. and how he looks at things. Yeah. You know, he was not a good person at all. Yeah. You know, and it's not to say, like, oh, you were an amazing person, John, printing credit cards and shit. It's not that, but it's like, what the fuck else did you know? Yeah. What other cho- – like, like we talk about choices in life, and yes, you technically do have one, as I said at the outset of our conversation, but, like, what choice do you really have? Yeah. You know, so you, you finish high school, you don't even have that, a little bit of that structure or the boys home structure, if you want to even call it that in your quotes. And I got my high school diploma. So at least you do have that. You got the GED. I fucking walked. You got, and nobody was there to watch me walk, man. I walked. So you, you literally were at, you went, you showed up to graduation, did the whole thing. Hell yeah. I walked and I got my diploma and I did it on my own with nobody showed there. Nobody was there for support or nothing. I walked, I walked right off the stage, took off my gown, got in my car, fired up a fucking blunt and I went to the beach. (laughs) That was, that was, that was my graduation day. Yeah. That had to feel pretty good though. That was one moment like of all the shit you dealt with that had to feel like. I still fucking did this. Wow, I you know, passed. I, I thought I was going to feel a lot different when I got that diploma. Like, I thought it was going to... Like, because, you know, you build it up all yeah. these years, all these years, your whole entire life. This high school diploma is put on a pedestal. Like, it's something that's like this great achievement that I thought I was going to physically feel something when I got it, but I felt nothing. Like, so I, did. I, I I didn't feel anything when I got it, you know, because school wasn't, wasn't challenging to me. Like, the curriculum just was never challenging. Like, I never, ever sat down and was like oh my God, how am I going to finish this assignment? I need help. Like that was never, ever a part of my reality. Like, so I always, always did very well in school. I kept a, I maintained a GPA of about 3.59 all the way through high school. Not and I would show up, anyway. I would show up stoned everywhere and I was homeless and I show up to school stoned every day. I wouldn't study for any of my tests, you know, and, and, and mathematics was like my worst subject. So that's where I struggled the most was math. Really? For whatever reason, like I, to this day, I don't even know all my times tables. Like I just, for whatever it is inside of my brain, the frustration kicks in and I'm just automatically fucking done with it. I wouldn't have guessed that one. Yeah. But. So more, my strong suit is more reading comprehension and, mm. um, and language and, and, you know, 
uh, punctuation and, you know, uh, just understanding, you know, sentences. And that was always my strong, strong point. Science was another one. Uh, social studies, uh, history. I'm fucking huge history buff. You do love history. I love history. Yeah. Um, I've always just been extremely fascinated by, you know, pre you know, his, events and you are um, a very by, and I'll say it, yeah. like you like, and I've I've listened to you speak before. You are a very intelligent guy. Well, thank and you. And it kind and and you know not to judge a book by its cover or anything, but you don't expect it at first, no, and then you never do. And and you're also you're unbelievably like down to earth and shoot the shit. So it's like you're really not ready for it. And then you, I started listening to you speak and and see you bring in things where you're not yeah. just talking about your story you're bringing in other things and i'm like oh wow like people will never really expect anything whoa. intelligent to come out of my mouth when i start well, speaking it, let alone the vocabulary i have it does know. man yeah. so I, I i see where you're coming from on that i would have thought i don't know maybe it's because i you had to be so analytical i'm falsely attributing that in my head to also like just straight math but that's not necessarily true so yeah math for me was always a struggle man i hated it i fucking hated the i just it was cold and it was like, you know, just memorization and, you know, learning the, 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 uh, you know, the, the algorithms and, uh, the, the formulas. And it's like, dude, I just didn't want to, I like, once I would get, once I get frustrated with something, I was never taught to how to deal with my frustration. So mm. once I become frustrated with something to, I just completely shut down and I just completely close myself off to it. And that conversation we were having earlier, nobody has ever really, no, there's never been anybody there to make me do something I don't want to do. Mm. So I've never been made to overcome, you know, difficult uh, things that challenged me. Like if it challenged me to the point to where I got frustrated with it, I could walk away from it and there was nobody there telling me like, you know what, go ahead, go revisit it, sit down, calm down, take a breath, look at it from this point of view. That, that just wasn't so. But once you, once you established that you found something you were good at, it wasn't necessarily like that, right? No, not at all. I could open right. the frustration because obviously, because I'm interested. In yes, it, you know, and it's holding, it's piquing my interest. It's, I'm like, okay, it's a lot different. But, That's a key. But, but for me, math and school was just fucking forget about it. But you finished the GED, and then you you did go to. I got my high school diploma, but you went to you went you went back to school. Right? Yeah, well, I went to I went to college. Yeah, yeah. So, where'd you go? Yeah, I went to the Art Institute uh, of Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, I got, how the hell, like, I got my associate's how did this degree. Happen? Um, I was homeless the whole time through fucking... Yeah, so I found a program called uh, Covenant House. Now, Covenant House is a nonprofit organization. They're all over the United States. Uh, it's to help youth, um, you know, pretty much 13 to 18 who are homeless, who are in the system, who don't have anywhere to go. They have all of these housing uh, places where you go there, but it's like, dude, there's so many fucking rules. Yeah. Like, and it's so easy to get kicked out and like, they'll kick you out and be like, go fuck yourself. And you could be sleeping under a bridge and they don't give a shit. Cause that happened to me quite a few times. <laughs> oh, they <laughs> but then they take you back. Yeah. Well, then they wake you like 30 days. Then you got to come and you got to have a meeting and you got to be like, okay, well, this is the reason I was kicked out. And this is, I have, you have to put down like four reasons why you won't, you know, do what you did before. And then like, what triggered you to do that? And it's like this whole mind fuck thing to get back into it. So I went into this covenant house and there's a whole program you can go there. So they initially they have like the initial center where you're at, where it's like it's it's like a fucking uh, it's like a homeless shelter pretty much for for youth for teenagers. And uh, they, you go there and they help you out with like clothes if you don't have it and like food. They'll feed you. They'll let you stay there. And you know you have to go to school and stuff like that. Uh, but if you fuck up anywhere along the long line, that you're out of there. Like they don't fuck around. There's zero mm. tolerance at these places. So I was in Covenant House, and just from being incarcerated as a youth my whole life, I knew how to deal with this place. Like, because I had been doing this since I was 13 years old. Like, I know how to do the group meetings. I know how to do the counseling sessions. I know how to wake up and do chores and clean up after myself and not create any waves and, you know, and become a favorite. Mm. Um, so I knew how to play the game, and I knew, you know, the politics that were behind it. So once I got into this program, uh, I just completely made it work to my advantage. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I took advantage of everything that they had to offer. Um, what you know, kinds of things? So bus passes, um, uh, lunch vouchers for like when you're out in the community. Um, they helped me get my birth certificate, which I didn't even have. You know what I mean? Like things, little things like that helped me get my social security card. They helped me get like an ID. They helped me. Um, you sure it wasn't Matt Cox helping you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't, didn't know Matt at this time. I know. Um, you know, so they help you just get your things that you don't really understand. Like, I had no fucking clue about any of that stuff when I was... So they help you, you know, kind of get your life on track. And then they send you to, like... Um, they sent me to classes to teach me how to, like, iron my clothes and, like, 
sew and cook and like so I learned like social skills like I had to go to social skills classes every day where somebody different would come and they teach you a different social skill on how to fucking like take care of yourself or be a better person you know in society that's pretty cool actually. it was cool you yeah. know and I learned a lot of stuff there but it was it was very short lived because I kept getting I was I was at that rebellious teenage years where I wanted to party I wanted to chase girls yeah you're what 18 19 when you're in there uh it was this was yeah this is about right up until I was 18 so I, I was there from I was there probably from I was like right when I came back after I had the kid I got I was in and out I went in there at 17 graduated high school but you can only stay there till you're 18 and then there's another program it says so you do there and you turn 18 they kick you out of there but there's an apartment complex that they own I don't know if they own it or if they work with the people who own it, but they, they transition you from there into the apartment to where you get your own apartment and it's, it's income based. So it's based on, you know, whatever your income is. And uh, they come by and check on you to make sure you're not throwing parties and you can't have any alcohol. They'll come in there when you're not even there. Is it free? It's income based. Yeah, when you say that, you, but you made that sound like it's based on how much you make. They put you in a certain type of place or yep. do they just garnish your wages? Uh, No, you have is that to. the term, garnish yeah. your wages? Yeah, no, you have to pay. You know, they 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 they, they you turn in your paychecks and like, okay, you can you make eight, got it. You got make eight fifty an hour. So this okay. is we're gonna do ten percent, fifteen percent, or whatever. So this is what your rent is. Got it. Okay. And I had no, I had to put no money down or anything. No security deposit. Right. They, they put you in there. They get you in there. You know. So they got me into an apartment, and um, I fucked that up somehow. I don't remember how, but I fucked it up. I, I think I wasn't supposed to have somebody living there with me, and I had like a girl there, or I think they came by and checked it when I was at work, and I had like a, some booze in the fridge or something like that. So I got kicked out, um, and then at, when I, once you get kicked out of there, you're done. Like there's no coming back. Oh, because now you're not in. It's not the covenant. It's the it's not the covenant house anymore. Version. Now you're an adult, yeah. and now you just got kicked out of an apartment, and now there's no program to let you back into. Now you're fucked. So once I got kicked out of there, I was done. I was back living in my car. At this time, I was fortunate enough to have you a had vehicle. a car. I had a car at this time. It was a a, a 1992 Chrysler Sundance with oh, a yeah. with a rust mohawk. You said that after I I missed that when you said after graduation you walked off the stage, took the shit off, and got in your car and ripped a blunt. So like what yeah. what age did you buy a car? Oh, I had cars periodically as a teenager. I don't remember how I would get them, but I would get them. They were like maybe like five six hundred dollar pieces of shit cars. Like did they you ever get a license? No, I didn't have a license until I was like 25 or 26 years old. <laughs> so I used to just be driving, dude. No insurance, no registration. I would go steal a license plate off of somebody else's car, slap it on that one, and just be fucking oh my every day. God. Like, fuck it. What are they, you know what I mean? Like, what, what are you going to do? What yeah. are you going to do? Yeah. You know? And um, so, yeah, that was just, I would just, so I had cars periodically, never registered them, never fucking got them insured, nothing like that. Um, yeah, so I had a car. I had a, I had a 1992 Chrysler Sundance uh, with a rust mohawk. And the fucking headliner would be hanging down, and you'd be on the fucking highway, and the fucking headliner would be going like this. You know what I mean? And you get out of the car, you'd be completely covered in shit from the fucking, you know, it's like one of those situations. And um, so, yeah, I slept in my car a lot. So, but yeah, but when I was in Covenant House, anyway, that's the story I was getting to with Covenant House is Covenant House um, enrolled me, got me into the Art Institute. Uh, because there was a counselor that worked at the Covenant House that was, uh, he was like a part-time graphic designer. Actually, full-time graphic designer. He just did the Covenant House thing as like a, kind of like a bleeding heart um, liberal kind of thing. Like he wanted to help the youth. And he took a shining to me because we were sitting there talking one day and I seen him on the computer. And I recognized the program that he was using. And I kind of looked over. I was like, oh, that's so-and-so program. He's like, yeah, what do you know about it? So I just, you know, then we just got to kicking it and he realized that I was on the level. Like I knew my, I knew my programs. I knew, you know, CSS, I knew HTML at that point. I knew uh, graphic design. Like I just knew a lot of shit. Could you hack at all or? I wasn't, I wasn't a programmer. I wasn't a hacker. Mm. No, I never went that route. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't think that it was no. involved in anything. I just didn't know if you had. No, that. I, no, I never went that route. Um, I just didn't have those kind of influences uh, in my life. Had so you I, had a digital, you had a good digital footprint understanding. I did, is yeah. what you're getting at. I did, yeah. I, I just, I understood computers because I had been on them since I was a little kid. You know, I just, for whatever reason, I had always had access to, even like the earlier Apple computers in like the early 90s, like the first Apple computer. I remember getting on as a kid somewhere. I was at, like, I was, I was, I was I always had access to technology. So when you hacked, when you were a kid and you hacked the, the library systems places is that you pretty much you found a way to steal the usernames yeah i i don't remember how but i i figured out uh an administrative login i think that i think somebody i think honestly how i did it was i sat down at a terminal and uh somebody had left themselves logged in under their administrative password mm. so and i quickly figured that out and i fucking went in and i changed uh the i went in and i fucking created a new login for myself 
and a new administrative password for myself without having to change theirs. So then I just had my own personal administrative access uh, after that point. Got it. So this other guy was watching you. He knew you knew your exactly. shit. Exactly. And he was like, listen, man, um, you know, we have connections here where we can get you. He's like, do you have your high school diploma? I said, yeah, I just graduated, actually. He's like, well, listen, man. He's like, if you're interested, he's like, it's up to you. But we have a program where we can get we can get you guys into like the art. And he started naming off all these schools. I was like, oh, the Art Institute. I've always wanted to go there because I knew right where the, the campus was. It was, you know, in Fort Lauderdale. And I was like, yeah, I've always wanted to go to that school because I wanted to get a degree in graphic design, media arts. I wanted to do web programming. and uh, You didn't do fine arts, did you? No, I didn't get okay, a fine arts degree. Too ironic. Like Matthew Cox. <laughs> no, I was more digital. Everything I did was digital. Yeah, I, Matt, yeah. can, Matt can draw and paint. Yeah. And, it's uh, actually low-key really very good. Very good, yeah. He taught me how to paint. And we, we do a lot of painting. And uh, over the past year or two, I've learned how to paint actually pretty well. Um, just standing next to that guy. You guys need to have like documentary cameras in that in that fucking place. I know. Until you living together. I know it's, wild. it's fucking. It's it is pretty wild. How do you parole officers feel about that? <laughs> well, you don't have one. No, but I'm good. Is. And his don't know. <laughs> well, they do now. Yeah. Well, we'll see. <laughs> no, then. no. He he told me she knows. I talked. Oh, okay. I, I talked to him. Yeah. I, I asked because I I asked him about that when we were in the car last time. Like, aren't you still technically like on parole? He is. Yeah. Or probation or whatever. He's like, yeah, they're cool with it. I'm like. Hey, great. Yeah. <laughs> Love yeah. it. Anyway. Yeah. And, um, you know, so he he was like, listen, they got these programs. Let me see what I can do for you. And they got me in. They talked to whoever at the admin at the college. And I went and I took uh, just an entry exam. And I passed in all the entry exams with flying colors. And uh, I started going to the Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale. So how many years did, did it take to it get a degree? It took me two and a half years to get my associates. And it was a graphic design degree. Yep. Graphic design, media arts. Now, yep. during this time... You were kicked out of that program, so you were homeless, like yeah, you said, the whole time. I was living time. in my car <clears throat> throughout the whole, pretty much the whole thing. For two and a half years, I was pretty much living in my car. Where would you shower? Uh, at the beach. So Go I, in the ocean? No. Or like the actual, like... They got the showers yeah, out there. Yeah, you show yeah. up early in the morning, so it's yeah. not embarrassing, you know what I mean? And fucking, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I figured out that um, I could shower in the ocean, but you had to use uh, dish soap. Regular soap doesn't lather in the ocean. I had to figure that out the hard way. Really? Yeah, like bar soap, like, the, like bar soap and all that other shit. It won't lather in the fucking of the salt because of the heavy saline. Uh, because it's so heavily concentrated huh. in the saline, it doesn't allow. But the dish soap for whatever fucking, it's a different formula that allow you to to get in there and lather. So yeah, I would shower in the ocean, or I would shower at the beach, or even at this point, like I still had people's houses I could go to, just not every day. You know what I mean? Like I didn't want to burn some of those places out, so I would, you know. But like I never looked homeless though. I was always I was always clean. I always had clean clothes on. You keep all your clothes and everything in the car. Obviously. Everything was always in the trunk. Yep. Always had all my stuff in the trunk. How are you paying for gas? Oh, fuck. I don't remember at this point. I think I was still shoplifting or bumming money or sometimes I would just leave my car in the parking garage at the, uh, at the, because I was selling weed to the guy, to the, one of the main, um, security guard that ran the, the whole parking structure. And he let me park my car in there and sleep in my car at night after mm. it was closed. So he let, used to let me go in there at night and sleep in my car in the parking structure after it Just because he was your friend? Well, yeah, I used to sell him weed and stuff like that. And we, <laughs> yeah, so I used to get... That's how you're funny. You're selling yeah. weed. Yeah, I used to yeah. Well, yeah, I, I did sell a little bit of weed. I was smoking a lot of weed, selling a lot of weed. So, I mean, I, listen, I've always had money here and there. I never really... A little bit. A little bit. Not like thousands of dollars, right. but I've always had at least three, $400 in my pocket at all times, you know. That yeah. comes in handy. Yeah, we'll do something like that. Enough to get a tank of gas, enough to get me something to eat and a bag of weed and, you know, no, whatever, I, whatever I, else I needed to do. Hey, look, I I get I actually understand it a little bit. I, I had a friend at that's I'll I'll say I had a friend at mm -hmm. some point in my life. Not fuck it. Well, I have a friend who this was a different time mm -hmm. where he he went through a period where he was he was never homeless. But couch surfing is a bad situation. Yeah, couch right? to couch. And yeah, it, yeah. It was like it was the worst kind of situation if you weren't totally like completely homeless. Mm -hmm. And like you know, he we would walk into a place and he'd walk out with a five finger discount. I wouldn't say a word, and then and then yeah. I remember like wouldn't tell you till you get in the car. And yeah, you start pulling I, I, shit out, and, and you're like, and, and and like you st and I'm like, should I be driving faster now? <laughs> like, yeah. what do we do? But I listen like. Maybe the fifth or sixth time I asked him, I'm like, you know, you just do that every time. And he's like, yeah, I mean, I got to eat. Yeah. He said something He said something like that. And it's not like he was starving or anything, mm -hmm. but he was thinking like, all right, well, I don't know the next time. I don't really have any money, so mm -hmm. I'll do it. So in a way, like he was doing, 
you know, you were finding it through weed and whatever in that time period, but you mentioned other periods where you're finding it through stealing stuff. It's like, that's, it just comes natural and yeah. it's actually not, yeah. I actually really, shockingly I, not hard to do. Looking back, man, I feel bad about all the theft. Like, cause now I would, I would never steal anything now from anybody or like, you know what I mean? So looking back on it, man, I feel so bad about all the times I used to fucking. Cause that, and that, that's, that's great. And now you also have perspective. Yeah. At the time, it's also, again, like I'll, I've said this seven times today, but yeah. it comes back to like, well, you need to make sure you eat tonight. Yeah. I either go into the store and I take something or I'm not going to eat until I either go beg somebody to fucking feed right. me. And I wasn't about begging. Like a lot of the other kids used to panhandle. I never, I couldn't do that. Like I couldn't sit Is that there like sucking dick for money? Panhandling? Yeah. No, it's like, sir, do you have a dollar? Do you have fucking... Oh, sit there. oh, like we we call that mostly begging up here. Yeah, Got begging. Yeah, yeah, but it's you know it's that's an older term, panhandling, because they sit there with a you know with a cup. You know, yeah, yeah, I've heard it before. I yeah. just didn't. And, that's um, exactly what it is. I, I couldn't that. do that, man. Like I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to sit outside McDonald's and beg for money. You know, like I just wasn't one of those kids. You know, so I w- I would rather go break into cars all night long and steal cell phones and car radios <clears throat> than sit outside McDonald's and beg people for money to eat. That's your independence. Because a lot of the not everyone, but a yeah. lot of the people doing that are doing that because they got into hard drugs or something, yeah. or their life fell off the rails. You yeah. only knew a life where you were surviving. Yeah, and I'm not completely without shame. You know what I mean? I'm not one of those shameless people, mm. and I've never been one of those people. Like I get embarrassed easily, even when I was homeless and I didn't have anything. Like I would get embarrassed if I had to you know, go somewhere and somebody found out that I was homeless or somebody, you know what I mean? Looked like I I always had that inside of me. So I could never really, there was levels that I could just never go to. No, it's, and I I guess that, I guess that's your line. Everyone's got a line somewhere. So that makes sense. But you're this whole time you're living in your car, you're sleeping. It sounds like a lot of the time in that parking garage. Yeah. Dude, you're selling majority. Yeah. Majority of the time I was just, cause it gets to a certain point to where people just, they just don't let you sleep at their house anymore. Yeah. You know, or it gets to a certain Grown point to where, man. yeah, exactly. Or you just don't want to keep asking people, you yeah. know what I mean? And especially with me always trying to be independent and kind of do my own thing. It's, it's got to a certain point to where I just didn't want to be that guy, right. you know? And, and, and I learned a long time ago that the less you ask people for shit, the more willing people are to help you out when you actually really need it. That's so true, man. You know what I mean? So I never ask anybody for anything, dude. Even if I fucking need it, I don't ask. Because if I need it that bad, I'll figure out a way to go out and get it for myself. And you gamify it in your head, too. You may end up... It's like the people who save up the money and they never use it. Yeah. But, like, they felt good about knowing they did it the entire time. It got... it. it it allowed them to take the actions that they continued to take to be able to do that. I understand yeah. that with some people. Yeah. You know, it's not necessarily exactly how I think, but on some things I do. You yeah. know, like I, I with actually with my money a little bit, like I don't have any money, but mm. there's a line like that. It's like five, six thousand dollars. I never let it get below there. Yeah. Even if it could, yeah. I won't do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's how it's I like, am nowadays too. Yeah. You, you can't, it, there's some sort of line there. So I, 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 I get that. But you finish. You finish school in two and a half years. Mm-hmm. You get the graphic design degree. So you're like yep. 20, 21 years old, whatever yep. it is now. Still homeless, pretty much. Still homeless. Yeah. But do you get a job? Like, what what happens next? So I'm getting ready to graduate um, the Art Institute. And for every graduating class, they hold, like, a job fair or, like, a – like a. Let's guess what kind of it is, the job fair. <clears throat> what is this? Prospective employers come and they want to check out the, the graduating class. Mm. So, you know, companies that need graphic designers, companies that, you know, they come there, they set up a little booth, and you go there and you've got, you know, your portfolio, things you've been working on over the past two and a half years, and you go to each one, you're like, this is what I've been working on. You know, and they're like, okay, well, this is the opportunity. And then you kind of just bullshit with each one and blah, blah, blah. So we did that, and then I graduated, and about a week after I graduated, <clears throat> one of my counselors called me at the at the college, and he told me to come in and talk to him. He said I had a job offering from one of the companies from the uh, from the job fair. So I came in, I talked to him, and he he's like, okay, well, this is what they're offering. Uh, you know, this is the salary, and, and you know, this is the job title, and uh, all this, this is where the company is. And when he told me that they were offering $80,000 a year <sighs> to start. What year is this? 2005 or wait no like oh 2004 i graduated high school oh three so this is probably uh 2004 or something this is yeah well, 2004 no, it, had, it had to be a couple you graduated high school two and a half years before this right yeah i graduated high school 2002 i believe no no oh three oh two 
And then I went to college, so three, four. So this is almost 2005. It's like 2004, 2005. Still 80 grand. 80 grand. Then. 80 fucking this thousand dollars a year. This isn't New York City either. Dude, I, I've been homeless my whole life. I've never once I heard that eighty. Once I heard that eighty thousand dollars fall off your fucking oh, chair. Oh, dude, I was like, yeah, fucking. I well, tried to, you know, <laughs> and like my counselor was like, listen, I've never really seen offers like this before. He's like, this isn't this isn't a normal, you know, situation. Why they offer you that? They thought your work was amazing. I guess. Yeah, they they, they really liked me. The guy really liked me. Um, you know, I guess he had seen something in me that I he didn't tell me that, but apparently he had seen something in me because when I went to go work for him. He used to just fucking like, come on, let's go. And he used to hop in the car with him. And we used to just go do shit that had nothing to do with work. What kind of company was it? <clears throat> it was a graphic design company. So we did uh, screen printing. We did uh, so we screen printed T-shirts, flyers. Um, we did like the um, the window um, stickers for like mm. wraps. So we did vehicle wraps. We did graphic wraps. We did uh, window. We did pretty much everything. We had the big big printers. Wow. Yeah. yeah, everything. And when I started there, there was another guy working there who was their lead graphic design artist, but he was getting. Uh, he couldn't stay in the country or something like that. His green card, his passport, mm. whatever was going on, he had to go back to his country where he was working. So that's why they they brought me in, and they used him to train me for a few months of you know not really graphic design <laughs> on the way out the door. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Just this is how like this is how the company works. This is what we do on a daily basis. This is what we print. This is how you, this is how you run this machine. You know, this is how you deal with this customer. So I learned all of that, um, and then he went back to his country, and I was just lead graphic design artist. Poor guy. Yeah. Adios, Javier. Gracias. Yep. Got you now. Yeah. And, so you uh, took over the whole thing. Yeah, I took over. I was lead graphic design artist, and they hired me 80K a year salary, you know, so I was, you know, fucking, it wasn't like an hourly wage position, um, and this was, you know, more money than I had ever seen in my entire life. When I got that first check, honestly- I Bi-weekly could, pay? No, it was once a month. Once a month pay, yeah, so 80 like, divided between, by 12. The, between the first and the third or whatever. It's like five or six grand a month. So you see that first That first check, check. was like 5,500 or something like that. And that that at, at that point I had had money like that before sporadically, but I'd had it and then it was immediately spent. You know what I mean? And you like built I, it up. Yeah. But this is one check. Boom. Wow. And I was like, holy fucking shit. What do you, you know? do? Oh, I went and got an apartment. I went and got a fucking. I went and got an apartment. On, you rent uh, it? I assume. Yeah, I went and and it was a really nice one too. It was like fucking. At this, it was like fifteen hundred a month or something like that. You definitely have at this point, smart as you may be for surviving on your own, you have zero concept of money. I None. Assume. I am dollar dumb. I had zero fucking yeah. concept of how money works, about you know inflation and saving and fucking investing and like I I had no fucking idea at all. So I went and got the most fucking nicest expensive apartment I could fucking afford. How much I felt a month? It was fifteen hundred dollars a month, and this is an oh. 04. So you gotta imagine the place yeah. was fucking. It was awesome. It was on Brickell Avenue, right downtown Miami. Oh, and, you were balling. Uh, oh, killing them. I'm killing them. And then I guess so I got the apartment, and then I went, and then like the next month, remember the next month after that, I went and got a brand new Cadillac, like a Cadillac STS or something like that. The luck, the big fucking, the big one. And um, went and got a brand new car, had a fucking brand new place, you know, nice furniture. I'm fucking, you know, I'm the man at work. I walk in. I really don't have to work that hard because there's two other people that work underneath me who they actually do all of the physical printing and the everything You're else. Designing. I'm just I'm just here moving, you know, doing my thing, which is nothing. I mean, and all the shit they gave me to do, I could do in 15 or 20 minutes. So I had the rest of the day pretty much to do whatever the fuck I wanted. Holy shit. Yeah. So I went out and I would learn, I was learning uh, vehicle wraps. Like I would do yeah, it, yeah, and yeah. so I went out to the garage, and I was learning how to actually physically wrap the vehicles because I was extreme. I'm, I'm a car guy, right. always have been, and um, so I would actually go out and physically actually learn how to wrap the vehicles and shit like that. Yeah, so that was fun. Were you getting in trouble at all, or did you just totally no. take up the? The drinking was a little bit of an issue. Like the weekends, I would go pretty hard, and I was always I would always come to Man, work it's Miami. I would always come into work Monday with like a black eye or fucking, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean, like a big fucking scar on my face or fucking. She was worth it. <laughs> half my leg fucking tore up. You know, I was. <laughs> they were like, "You have a good weekend? Fuck yeah! Haven't slept since great weekend. haven't slept since Friday. Fucking hopefully uh, I'll get some sleep tonight." I woke up on the SLS pool deck this morning. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, so partying, man, because you know that kind of money. And I was just, I just turned like 21. You're spending as fast as Oh, I'm just, down. you know, I'm in the bars on the weekend, you know, chasing girls and, you know, so I was having fun. And it's not like, no, it, that's a lot of money back then, especially for, you know, coming out at 21 years old, whatever. It is a lot I of money. I know grown men don't make that kind of money now. But I'm saying. And have families. Yeah, but I'm saying like, it's not like an insane amount of money. No. You're not in no, there no. making it rain $1,000 no, 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 no. stacks. No, no, I can't. No, no, I'm not buying Ferraris and throwing money at the so strip club. you knew club. not to spend money you didn't have in that way. You just no, didn't I, save I was anything. able to pay my bills. Like I knew. 
right. once I got paid, I'd pay my bills and then I would spend everything and I'd be left with like a hundred dollars until my next paycheck. Right. You know what I mean? Like I would barely have enough money for gas to get to work. <laughs> <laughs> and, and work was was work in Fort Lauderdale too. No, it was, was in it Miami. In my, it was yeah, in it was Miami. in Miami. Yep. So it was pretty close to you. Yeah, it was. I was. I was living downtown Miami. My job was in like uh, I was in North Miami. So I was still. It was a little bit of a hike, but not that much. Okay. So, how long were you working there? I was there for about a year. About a about a year and six months, approximately. But a year and si- whatever it was, yeah. 12, 18 months yep. in. Yep. You pull up to work one day, and the FBI. Yep. Who else? I mean, who was there? I think it was just FBI. To be just honest, F- there, was, just the there was a lot of people there, but what I only recognized was FBI because they were wearing the the jackets. And I was like, hmm, that's fucking... I pulled up in the parking lot like... For this place? I thought they were filming a movie. Because, you know, they, all over Miami, they're always filming yeah. movies and shit. So when I pulled up in the parking lot, I seen like all like... I, I thought it was... Cut! A, cut! I gotta walk through. No, I thought it was a movie <laughs> set. I thought Because that's what it looked like. It was like... A, I thought it was a fucking movie set. And I'm like, huh. Oh. And I go to, go to walk in and fucking tape on the door. I'm like, what the fuck? Walking back out to my car, I get stopped. I get fucking, they're like, oh, you know, and then they interviewed me and asked me a fucking shitload of questions. What was it about? It was either, it had something to do with drugs or money laundering. One of the two. In Miami? Yeah. Come on. Come on. That doesn't yeah. happen. Yeah. So the, so the owners were Argentinian. They were from Argentina. And they Are were we sure about that? Uh, that's what they told me. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I don't know. You know, and um, feeling more Columbia vibes. Yeah. It's so they had me. something going on. They were either it was either the whole thing was some kind of fucking front. They were they were laundering money from, or they were fucking they were running drugs through it. But like I never seen anything suspicious. And like I have a sixth sense because I've been on the street my whole life. That's why they're paying you eighty k. They just have money to toss around. They're yep. like, oh, you, you, let's just get a guy in here who's chill. All right, yeah, eighty k. That's it. Pick him off eighty. Wow. That's it. Yeah, and I guarantee that's why my salary was so high because they didn't really give a fuck and they just needed somebody to get in there and just run the whole operation. They need to get rid, rid of the money too yeah exactly <laughs> they, exactly they yeah. had too much yeah so that what when they interviewed you like i they, assume they didn't really give you any details no, they, they didn't, just you know they just the, who who they just asked me like you know the day-to-day how often do you see this person how often do you see that person that do you deal with any of the financials of the company i said no i'm just a graphic designer um the wife of the husband is the one that pretty much runs the show the day-to-day activities of the job she was the one that signs the checks and you know took care of the customer accounts and all that shit like that so i was like no that's you know that's her job. And then so she showed up and as she got, you know, she showed all, up. She showed up as all this was going on. And didn't get arrested. Didn't get arrested. She well, they were talking to her. I seen her that and then like it was it was chaos, dude. It was fucking the whole scene. Like I said, it was like a movie scene. I thought they were filming a fucking movie. So she walks over to me and to uh, another person that was a uh, salary and cut us a check for our the remainder of the year for our whole oh, salary. Wow. One lump sum. What, like forty grand, something, something like that? that was, it was really high. She was like, um, Go to the bank and cash this right now. She's like, not tomorrow, not Friday. She's like, as soon as you leave here, you drive straight to the bank and you cash this check. Did the, I, I assume the feds didn't see her do this. They no. Just, well, I, yeah, I don't know. I'm, like, I just remember sitting in my, I was sitting in my car and she walked up to my car window and handed me a check. Yeah, check she, she, handed, she handed me like a check through my, through my car window. I was like, you need With to, all the feds right She's there. like, you need to leave this parking lot and drive straight to the bank. Oh, my God. Yep. So that's what I did. I drove. I went and I fucking. Were you scared at all when you were talking to the feds? Uh, were you like, shit? Did I do something wrong? No. Well, no. I, I didn't know it had nothing to do with me because I knew I didn't do anything wrong. Um, I hadn't been committing any crime at this point. Uh, for for you know a little while. Six months. <laughs> yeah, six eight months. I had been scam free. I've been I've been pulling any petty petty larceny scams or anything uh, like that. You know. Um. And yeah. So I went to the bank and I cashed a check and. I had an account with the bank. I didn't get it all in cash. I had them just, you know, deposit it into my account. And then I immediately just started looking for another job, you know? So you go home, like, did you just apply online or something? Yeah, I went on uh, Monster. I think it was like Monster. this is shocking what's going on. Yeah, I couldn't believe it, man. I was fucking, I was calling everybody like, fuck, what's going on? Trying to figure out, like, anybody that knew them, I was trying to call them to figure out what happened and nobody could tell me anything. And, you know, after like a few months, like it just was like a memory or whatever. And I would drive past the building and it was just completely closed. And you could tell like nobody was, you know, there, there was no business being run out of there or anything like that. The building was like, and then after like a couple months after that, the building went up for sale. So. But you still immediately went home and started looking for jobs. Oh yeah, immediately. Yeah. Even even with the check, there wasn't like a moment where you're like, eh, I'm going to go to the club for a couple of weeks. Well, I mean, I knew, I, I knew I had some time to chill. You know what I mean? Sure. <clears throat> so I wasn't like, I wasn't pressed about finding a job immediately right away, but I did. I didn't I think I went home that day and started looking for jobs, but it was within a week or two. I was like, okay, now what am I going to do? You know? And it was like, fuck. And, and they, they hadn't had it built up in my mind that I could actually make this kind of money being, uh, doing what I was doing, but that just wasn't the case. 
So any, I'll, I tried to find another job, but nobody wanted to pay me 80K a year for, for graphic design. That, see, that that's the issue right there. You had a baseline right away when you came out. So you you get this offer that, as you said, the guy who was at the school and was like, I've never seen something like this. It's because it wasn't normal because yeah, they were literally normal. looking <laughs> to, to launder money. Yeah. So now you have this, for the first time, you get this money in your pocket and you set the expectation yeah. of like, oh, this is what I make. This is what I do. Yeah. It's whatever. Yeah. And suddenly it's taken from you. So now you're going out and you're looking at other jobs. And I mean, I got to imagine these offers are what? Like, 10 bucks an hour. Oh, fuck. The highest I think I got was like 15 bucks an hour, 16 bucks an hour or something like that. And you're looking at, I assume, a car payment and you're looking around oh, at your apartment. Sh- I got a $1,500 a month rent to pay. My car is costing me somewhere in the neighborhood of fucking seven, $700 a month or something like that mm-hmm. with my car payment and insurance. <clears throat> you know, so it was like... $15 an hour won't even get me close to that. That means I'm going to lose everything. That means I'm going to have to fucking either go back to, I'm going to have to get rid of my house, get rid of my apartment and downgrade. Uh, I'm not going to be able to drive this car anymore. Like I'm what, you know, so in my mind now I'm starting to panic. The more it's set in that I wasn't going to get another job with that salary, panic. So you had always had nothing and that was your baseline. That's what you understood. Yeah. But now that you had something and had seen it. I'm not going backwards. I'm not going back. I'm not going back to having nothing. Fuck that. It seems because psychologically, and I'm I, I wasn't in your head, but the way you talk about it, and I think it's pretty legit, is that any stress, air quotes, mm-hmm. that was happening during your teenage years, where you're finding places to sleep in and out of group homes and stuff like that, it was always compartmentalized because it was just like, all right, I got to get to the next thing. So yeah. you weren't thinking about it. Maybe meaning. The stress was in a lot of ways, and this isn't healthy, but it was masked, yeah. right? <clears throat> well, so now you, f- I'm guessing I also, here. I also didn't have time to stop right, and right, think right. or let any of exactly. that affect me. You know? So now for the first time, you are literally sitting in an apartment. You just put a fat check in the bank account, but it's the last one coming. Mm-hmm. You are looking at the reality of, yeah. holy shit, 10, 15 bucks an hour. I'm going to have to get rid of all this. And you're, I would imagine your head's going to, I'm going to be living in my fucking car again. Yep. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm gonna get living in. I'm gonna be living in my car, and then they're gonna fucking repossess my car, and then I'm gonna be back on the street, pretty much. Yeah. So is there like a giant chill that comes over your body thinking about that? Yeah, it was. It was more of like a kick. It was more of like a like, what the fuck am I gonna do? Like I have to. I have to figure something out right now. I have to immediately. I have to figure something out right now because I'm not going back to being homeless. So ever, what'd you ever do? Again. Uh, well, I figured out. I was like, okay, well, what kind of what kind of fucking scam can I run now that I've got a little bit of money and I've got, uh, I've got a better foundation to start from. Cause prior to this, that was all you ever knew. I was just flying by the seat of my pants, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so whatever scams I was doing, you know, now I actually have a little bit of money and a little bit, I have a little bit of time to actually cultivate something, to actually figure something out. Was there ever a part of you? I'm not going to answer this question mm. for you. I, I think I know the answer, but was there ever a part of you that stopped during this to think like, ooh, this is bad? Bad in, in what sense? Like I shouldn't do this. It's very illegal. No. no exactly. Never. Yeah. Those kinds of those kinds of thoughts never crossed my mind. Listen, yeah. my entire life, there was no rule or no law yeah. or nothing that was gonna stop me from doing what I wanted to do. Period. Because I was all right with the consequences. I've always been all right with dealing with the consequences. Whatever the consequences are. Bring it on. I'm not fucking, I'm not scared of the consequences. I'm going to go to jail. I'm going to go to jail. They also put a, by the way, this does need to be said because yeah. this this is real. They also put a roof over your head too. Yeah. The consequences give you shelter. They give you, yeah. they give you food. It's, yeah. it's not the same yeah. when you're homeless or know what homeless is thinking about this. I'm not saying like, oh, let's lose my freedom. I'm not saying that, I, but I, I'm saying yeah. it's not the same level of like the shutter up your spine of the dude who's living in his own place and living his own life. Yeah, exactly. So really, you know, going to jail at that point it really wasn't that big of a deal for me, because now I got a time. Now I'm gonna go hang out somewhere where there's air conditioning, and I'm right. gonna get a little bit of food. And now I can sit and regroup and think about my next fucking scam. I'm gonna <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as soon as I get released. <laughs> so what what did you do? You 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 said you had to come up. You're like, all right, what's what's a scam I can do? And to be clear, the scams you had been doing were more 
forging school documents to get into yeah. school, st- doing basic yeah. shoplifting. <clears throat> another you know, big one. I, money. Yeah, off. another big one I was doing was um, I, I learned how uh, UPC labels worked. UPC labels. So it's like uh, coupons and things you go to the store, like mm. take coupons and shit. It's called it's called UPCs. And so I figured out how the barcoding system for the UPC labels worked, and I would make fake coupons to go and get free food. When you were in high school and stuff. Oh, high school and all the way through college. Because I'm, you know, I fucking, I was wow. living off of food stamps. And in my food stamps, I found a place where I knew this fucking bodega I could go to. And like, say I would get like $400 in food stamps. I'd give him my card. He'd give me $200 in cash and he'd swipe the $400 and just keep the $400 off the card. Mm. So I would do that a lot. And so my food stamps would run out. So then the money would run out, obviously, pretty fast. And then I would have to figure out a way to eat. So I was selling my food stamps, but then I had to figure out, you know, a way to eat. So then I figured out the UPC system and I was able to get on the Photoshop or on the, on the, I was still using the, the, <clears throat> the f- public library for everything at this point. You had access all these years. Yeah. And all these years. So I'm, that's always where I go back to. And there was a, a certain little computer back in the corner that nobody ever came back there. Cause it was like, <laughs> Yeah, it was in the road. Nobody ever. So I was my corner. I went back there and I just committed massive amounts of fraud. <laughs> <laughs> it's not why they designed yeah. the library system. Yeah. But hey, um, each is up. And I knew all the library. They all knew me in there. It's, hey, he comes here every day and he's so quiet. Fucking Johnny Fraud. Yeah. He's back there. And um, yeah, so I figured out how the UPC labels work. So I would be able to go to like um, McDonald's, Burger King, anywhere where there's fast food, I, I could go and I could present the coupons. Um, Working and, your way around the best food. parts of the food pyramid as well. Yeah. Definitely yeah. nutritious. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nutrition my whole life has just been McDonald's. And <laughs> I grew up on fast food. And I have Crohn's actually right now. Really? Yeah. I, I attribute that to, I think, just um, just my shitty diet for, for, for decades. Just eating fucking institution food and fast food. And there was a point in time where I had to eat out of dumpsters, um, you know, because I just, I couldn't, I had stolen so much and got caught stealing so much that i couldn't go into any publics in like fort lauderdale because they fucking knew me because i would go in there listen i would go in i'd grab rotisserie chicken and i'd go to the bathroom and eat that bitch on the toilet inside Publix, and i did it so many times and i got caught so many times doing it but i didn't give it like it would come down to like i'd be just knock on the bathroom i'd be so hungry i'd be shaking and like i i would I, i remember being so hungry to where walking in the Publix, i didn't know if i was going to be able to make it to get the chicken to get to the bathroom without Fuck. passing out because I was I was I was in and out of consciousness like I was like you know gonna faint because I hadn't eaten in two or three days you know what I Jesus mean Jesus Christ yeah so you know I did that so many times that they just knew they knew me you know so um, yeah I, I, there was a period of time where I unfortunately and I hate fucking talking about this dude but I had to fucking go in the dumpsters and get food like I knew when like I knew when Seven Eleven would throw away all their sandwiches. And they wouldn't give them to you, so I'd have to wait for them to throw them in the dumpster, and I'd have to go in the dumpster and get them. Or, like, behind Pizza Hut, and like, at the end of the night, i fucking go in there and get pizza. And I remember picking bugs and shit and fucking, dude, it was just horrible, bro. I remember doing that. And and see you, but that's that's exactly what I was talking about a few minutes ago. Yeah. You thought about that. When this job wasn't there and anything else was going to be below subsistence yeah you're like i am never fucking no. going back to that that's i don't not give an option. a fuck that's not an option if i gotta go to prison i'm going i'm gonna go i'm gonna go going to, to prison, prison before i go back to eating out of a fucking trash can you can kiss my ass period 100 percent. and that was just my mentality so um you know i coming from like i knew scams and i had heard about the carding thing you know, from, from, I think it was, I don't remember who had put me on to it, but I didn't really, I wasn't doing it, but I knew about it and I didn't know about it, like know about it, know about it, but I was aware of it. And then so I you hadn't ever been involved with it per no, se. No, you no, no, no. Hey, I was, yeah, I just knew, I knew about it and I knew a few people that were doing it. And I was like, and so that's immediately my brain. I was like, fuck, let me research every, let me figure this out. So when you're, by the way, we're, cause we're going to go through all this now. Sure. There's going to be times where you're saying stuff and I'm going to step in and interrupt if you're like given a lot of terms at once. So just bear with me Mm -hmm. when I do that. But let's start right there Mm -hmm. at the first moment because you you moved up with this. Like where you ended up, you didn't start there at all. So when you say carding to the average person out there. Right. So the term carding uh, means using um, fraudulent credit card information to purchase goods or services either online or in a brick and mortar business. Now, how do you go about doing this? At the time, at least like when you were so in 05, 06, 07. In the early 2000s, there were there was something called carding forums. Now, these are like uh, Reddit, if you will. Okay. 
And it's just like Reddit. You go on and there'll be a board uh, and there'll be a bunch of different topics on the board. You click on a topic and then that topic expands and you can either, you know, read tutorials like people would post tutorials about, you know, credit card fraud or about, um, you know, the banking systems and, you know, like everything you could imagine in that plethora of, of information, people would post tutorials about it. And did you access this only through like VPNs and stuff like that? No, so I had, no. At this point, I, when I was going to the forums, I had no, um, I had, I didn't know about internet security protocols at this point in time, yeah. which I learned through actually being on the forums and reading <laughs> tutorials about VPNs and SOX proxies, SOX four, SOX five. You know, geolocation, fucking ISPs. Like I had no idea about any of that. I mean, a little bit because I did a little bit of web uh, web development. Uh, and to know to do HTML, you kind of got to know about like ISP providers and all that stuff, but very little. <clears throat> so once I figured out, once I learned about the cybersecurity and like, you know, the, like I said, the VPNs, the SOCs, the virtual private networks, then I was like, but I, you don't really need to start using that until you start committing fraud. Mm. Like just going to the forums and reading about the stuff, it's not really, you're not really in any danger, you know? And Got so, it. and so that's what I was doing in the beginning. I was just going and I was just reading everything I could. Like I just. It's not a crime to read it. No, it's not. Me. No, it's not. And I, 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 for probably three weeks, I just scoured the internet. For every little morsel of information I could about fraud. Maybe this, back then, this wouldn't have happened, but I would imagine today, if you just went on to read a forum like that, there has got to be some sort of government catch-all that just... They don't... Listen, they're, they're, forums like that don't exist anymore, and if they do, they're run by the police to catch criminals. Like they just, you know, everything's they gone. Don't exist at all. No, everything's gone encrypted now. Everything's gone like Tor browser, right? Onion, okay. yeah, the yeah, Onion yeah. router. So fucking, you, that's my point. You can't even. Okay. No, yeah, you can't just do anything out in the open anymore. But this is the wild. It was the wild, wild right. west back then. Like you gotta, right. you gotta realize, like credit card fraud was in its infancy back then. Like it was just coming over from Europe. Like the Europeans had been doing it for fucking years. You know what? Here's a dumb question, but I, I, I'm thinking of this out loud because I've never Googled it or mm -hmm. looked at it. When did? How far back did credit cards start? Late 90s. Well, actually, it, okay, well, it started in the early, so we, credit cards have always been around since like 79, say, 8. Yeah, I was going to say, it had to it be. It started that. with Diners Club. The Diners Club was like yeah. the first fucking credit card, and then, you know, Discover, American Express, Visa, MasterCard all eventually came into line, but it was like, and you got to realize, before the internet, everything was done by paper. So yes. when you went to a store and used your credit card, they didn't charge that there was no swiping it they put it on a thing and they ch -ch -ch, and they made a yes. copy of it on a piece of paper and then that piece of paper gets sent to the fucking credit card and then they and then they would bill them and then like everything took up uh, months and weeks to catch up so internet launches in the 90s effectively oh, 2000 yeah like late, late early 90s year, so, yeah the year so 2000 when the, yeah when did the you're saying the cards part of it launch in 2000 you mean like the physical? Because the internet, I think technically, I might be getting this wrong, so check me in the comments. Mid -90s. I think it was 94. Yeah, mid 90s. Right? Yep. So then you have the dot com bubble grow. Yep. But when did cards start relying on the internet? Like 97, 98? I want to say, man, probably, yeah, 97, 98 is okay. when they started bringing in the, the mag strip with the POS systems and. And so the Europeans caught on to this immediately. Well, they had, it, they had it over there before they had it over here. This is where all the technology comes from is Europe. For whatever reason, really? their payment systems and everything there, they've always been, they're always a decade ahead of the United States. Really? So do you remember when they switched over to the chip and pin? Remember before the credit cards yeah, came with a yep. chip in it? Yeah. That was over in Europe five years, six years, seven years before. Really? They had chip and pin over there 10 years before we did. When did we get chip and pin? Like 11, 2011, 2012? Yep. 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 And when I was when I was carding, there was no chip and pin. But it was over there. But it but it was over in Europe for ten years before it came over here. Yeah. Oh no shit. Yeah. So they've they're always just they've always just been ahead of the curve over there for whatever reason. So you get on there. You're an American for whatever reason. This is highly constant. And this is oh six maybe something like that. Eastern Europe. Oh five oh six. It's highly concentrated in Eastern Europe. So are we talking yep. Russia, Ukraine. Yep. Eastern Europe, Eastern oh, Ukraine, Russia. Why are they the smartest computer people? I know, man. I know. They're just... I, I, I attribute a lot of it to language. And this is mm. something... I, what a lot of people don't realize is it's the way... Whatever language you learn as a baby, it wires your brain to be able to process information at, at the speed in which you speak. 
You know what I mean? So a lot of these languages that are rapid fire, like, you know, Akstuvia Brakslav, you know, all the fucking the Slavic languages, it's fast. It's they use a lot yes. of vowel, vowels. They use a lot of fucking uh you know what I mean? So it's like the way their brains are wired. When you look at computer programming and you look at stuff like that, I think it's just it fits with the way their brain processes information. Same Whoa. with the chi- same with the Chinese. Chinese, is, that's real. Because math, because yes. it's, it's their language. Their, their language, language is so fast that their brain is already operating at that at that cadence. But also, so in Malcolm Gladwell's book, I think it was Outliers. He talks about like, oh, the stereotype of Chinese people are better at math. He They're goes good at math. Well, he's like. We stereotype it, but actually, there's there's a logical explanation here as yeah. to why they are so talented at it. Their numerical system does not work like ours. Right, ours goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then we start new languages, and then every hundred we start new languages, and then in a thousand every digit yeah. we add a new language they to it. They start off at base. It starts at base, and everything works off at base. So yeah. kids, I forget what his exact stats were, so I'm not going to say it, but it has something to do with kids are able to count significantly higher at an earlier age yes. in China, for example, yep. than they are here. So yep. that that makes sense for that. But then I've never heard someone talk about like the phonetics of the language and yeah. the speed and flow of the language translating yep. to ones and zeros on, on oh, code. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. And that's and I've never really read that anywhere, or that's just my own something I've deduced. I think deduced. you're onto something. That's just something I've, you know, through power of deduction and observation of, you know, that makes a lot yeah. of sense. I think it, some, we'll hear some idiots in the comments like immediately shutting oh, it down. And you might be wrong, to be uh, yeah, fair to them. Absolutely. You might be. And I'm, yeah. But you should immediately willing, shut this down. And I'm willing to be wrong. I'm willing to be wrong, you know, because that's how you learn. Love um, that. Love that. Yeah. But, you know, so, you know, like I said, Eastern Ukraine, Russia, that's where all these sites, that's where all these forums were, were, were coming out of. So you know? you're, you're on, you're in your non, on your non VPN computer in your apartment looking through this. Mm-hmm. And scouring the internet for so, weeks. So you had no, as you said at the outset, you you had at least known it existed, and this was something you just immediately looked at, like the carding space. But can you break down, like how when you say, "All right, we're going to commit credit card fraud," how that works? Because I believe sure. if I if I understand, well, correctly, there's several different types of credit card fraud. All right, yeah, just you know, you take it away. Sure, there's Go several ahead. different yeah. types of credit card fraud. There's you know, you've got your physical carding where you actually take a physical card and you go into a brick and mortar business to get, you know, goods, to card goods, to resell later in, on, online. Then there's something called virtual card. Wait, is that, ste- I'm sorry, I just want to make sure, is that like stealing someone's card and walking in and buying it? Um, or well, making a card? I'll, I'll break it all down for you, uh, okay. exactly how, how it all works. Okay. So, to fill, so let's start with virtual carding first, because that's, yeah. that's how I, how I, you know, first gain, you know, entry into the, the carding scene was through virtual carding. And I think that's everybody's natural progression. Um, anybody that, you know, follows the, the traditional route anyway. I mean, some kids just jump in, start doing in-store. But I started doing virtual carding. Now, virtual carding is, there's something called a CVV, which is the um, three digits that are on the back of the card for security. Now, that's called a CVV. Now, something called a CVV2 is the actual information that's on the physical card so it's the credit card number on the front of the card the expiration date the first name the last name and the three digits from the back of the card the security feature yeah that's what's referred to the terminology for that is a cvv2 now with that information um you can only go online and purchase things now if you want to go to a website or you want to you know pornhub.com whatever you want to do you can use a cvv2 as long as you have i'm spitting everywhere as long as you have, um, what I found out later that I was a super rookie mistake in the beginning is there's all these you know security features that they um, that they put in the place for your um, when you go to say like I don't know Amazon.com or egg, you know Newegg or whatever website you're going to go to that you say okay I have these set of numbers and now I need to either purchase goods or services so you go to these websites and what I didn't know at the time is where so the IP address of the um, account being used had to match the IP address or had to men- match the geolocation of the credit card that was being used. Wait, wait. The IP address of the account being accessed had to match the billing address uh, zip code of the credit card being used. So, so okay, if so I'm say, buying say something I'm sitting in Seattle. In, say I'm sitting in Arizona and I'm online and I'm online and I'm using a credit card, but the billing address for the credit card is out of Delaware, Washington. So 
places will only ship to the billing address of the credit card. Also, really? Also, they look at the wait. I- what? Yeah, so, that's a thing still. Oh yeah, oh yeah, huge, huge. Unless unless you you call, you actually physically call the company, and you gotta really? be like, oh yeah, for fraud. Oh yeah, for fraud. Because you know, oh, think about it like this: if I have your credit card information, I can just go online and have the shit sent wherever I want. So after a while of this happening, the the these retailers got smarter and they started hiring fucking IT guys to be like, okay. The IP address of the person making this purchase doesn't match the fucking where the credit card is billing address is. Automatic shut it down. We're not going to ship this product and you need to you need to verify this information. So wait a second. I ordered I don't know if I did that on my card though. I I'm remembering one. Now this isn't final across the board. I mean, some places you may be able to get away with if they haven't experienced too much fraud. Cuz I ordered on my card something delivered to an address in Philly. This is maybe a year or two ago. Right. From Amazon, and it went through. But you're saying that usually that won't go through. N- well, Amazon's different. Amazon's a whole a whole different animal because they have their own algorithms and everything that they, okay. else that they look for. It's if it's outside of your purchasing habits and all that shit like that for the account. But but either way, what you is, were dealing this with this is 20 years ago, yeah. and this is you know when uh, this is right you know the dot com era. So all um, of these online stores are being launched, and there's just like this whole like you know what I mean. So it's like online carding was. I'm impressed they had these guardrails up at the time. They did, yeah, yeah. And and when I got into it, online uh, virtual carding had been going on for a little while. So there was like you said a lot of guardrails in place, but not really in the u.s N- yeah not so much not so much brick and mortar at this time but as far as like virtual like online oh yeah like the it online was pretty good even in the early 2000s because you guys the dot com was like 2000 so we're five or six years into it at this point so you know the security and this is becoming a multi-billion dollar business so they're gonna have you know all of their it guys on it um so when you go to a website and you make a purchase the website logs your IP address and then it geotags your lo- your, IK- your IP address to wherever your ISP provider uh, ISP provider is from. So, and then it, it cross references. Now all of this is done automatically, and it cross references that information with the um, the billing address of the credit card. And if the if the zip code doesn't match the ISP um, location service provider's location, then it automatically gets shut down. Okay. But you get around that by using a VPN. So say I'm so say right. I got 10 cards out of fucking Arizona. I just use a VPN that puts me in Arizona and that completely fucking, you know. So, so you figured way, that out pretty I quick. I figured that out pretty quick and so I I start doing the virtual carding. Um I'm on these forums and I figure out that I can purchase this information in bulk for a relatively little amount of money. So you can purchase card numbers. Yeah, CVV2s. And then just use your VPN and then go order whatever the fuck you want. Yes. Yep, exactly. And you would have it delivered to drop addresses. Now, drop right. addresses is obviously not my house. It's just somewhere where I'm having all of the shit sent to. Yeah. So where would you have it sent to? Um, it was mainly UPS stores, but I wouldn't have like an account at the UPS store. I would just have it shipped there, and I wouldn't even tell them. And I'll just show up there, like, oh, I had a package coming here earlier. I don't know if, uh... and they would just give it to me. Oh yeah, I did that so but, so but many then times. Your face is there though too. So when they get talked, to... I didn't care. I didn't care. Dude, there were so many UPS stores, I would never use the same one twice. Still, though, but they see you, so then the feds come in there like, all right, there's been packages sent Okay, here. well, then they got a picture of a white kid with no tattoos. I didn't have any t- t- tattoos or nothing at this point. I was a normal-looking, your average, everyday you know, citizen. So, I mean, what are they going to do? I was, I was careful enough not to pull up in the parking lot so they can get my, my license plate. You know, I, had, I, had, you know I, I was smart enough at least not to do that. So you immediately got into this? Oh uh, yeah! I immediately, I figured it all out. I like I said, I scoured the internet and I, I I happened upon these fucking these these credit card forums, and and then it was just fucking all downhill from there, baby. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> what what kind of money? Like when you were starting, so you just started on the virtual side, but weren't you doing stuff where you would have to walk into stores and and that wasn't until later. Okay, so at the beginning, let's yeah. let's start with this then. Yeah. How much money are you making? Because you're buying stuff to be able to resell it, no? Yeah. Um, it was hit or miss, man. Like, it was so inconsistent. Like, one week I would make $5,000, and then the next three weeks, all my orders would get shut down and nothing would get shipped. Why would it get shut down? Security. Um, oh, because people caught it on their statement or something? Yeah, you know, just for whatever reason, man, they would just say, you know, you need to send us a copy of your driver's license before we let this purchase go through or whatever. You know, like, it was just, like, you know... 
fucking or the card would get declined. Like I would get a base of cards where there was like a twenty percent validity rate amongst a thousand cards. Oh, so you're you're on this carding forum. You're buying like how much did what, what were cards two or, sold? Two in? or three dollars. Two or three dollars per Each. number. Per number. Okay. And that's for CBV twos. So you buy a you buy a bundle of a hundred of them. You're spending two three hundred bucks. Yes. And yep, then you exactly. know that eighty of them aren't going to work. Exactly. Yeah. So you have to go through basically all a hundred and see what and you ones don't hit. know. And you don't know, and there's no way to, at this point, there's no way to test them. And you're ordering all different shit to not create a pattern. Yes. So I'm online all day and all night putting in orders for, you know, cell phones, uh, laptops. And were you scheduling them to be delivered like all same day type deal? Like Overnight delivery, all, always. Always overnight delivery. Because if you didn't choose overnight delivery, there was always a chance of the person who credit card you used, finding it immediately and calling the company and, you know, not letting the shit get shipped out. But if you order overnight delivery, it and, does have a cutoff at some point, right? So if you're starting working at 9 a.m. and you're still working at 9 p.m. and you order overnight at 9 a.m. and then the next, the other stuff by We had to know how to time it. Yeah, you had so to know. You had, yeah, there's a lot to think there about There is. Here. There's a lot, A lot yeah. of work in crime. There is. It's, you gotta, <laughs> it's not you gotta, easy. Yeah, listen. It's you, not smash and grab. You no, know what you I mean? Gotta, <laughs> you got to know what you're doing. Yeah. So you would, you're, it was too inconsistent basically because of it. Do you need more water, by the way? No, I'm good. Okay. It was too inconsistent because of the numbers, essentially, like the hit rates and. <sighs> the money was just way too inconsistent. And to... what kinds of things would you buy? <sighs> it was, at first it was, uh, um, high-end electronics. So you're buying stuff that have a nice price tag on them. And yeah, at least a thousand bucks. To make it worth your time. Yeah, at least between eight hundred and a thousand dollars every item. And then you'd flip them like almost new on eBay or something. Sealed package. Yeah, it was all it was eBay and it was Craigslist at this time. There was no Amazon didn't exist. There was no you know, there was no offer up. There was no none of that shit. There was no Facebook Marketplace. Facebook didn't even exist. And your accounts on eBay and and Craigslist were under assumed names and stuff. Uh, yeah, uh, always. And then I used at this point. So once I actually started doing fraud, like I was completely savvy, like about the VPNs and about the laptop that I was using for fraud. I never even booted up at my address. Where would you do all of it? In the library? At the library or at Barnes and Nobles? Like the library? Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Because they had it free wherever was free Wi Fi and there was a lot of people. That's where I would go. So I had a couple different spots I would go to, but I never even booted that laptop up at my so address. You're disciplined as fuck. Yeah, and I always used a VPN, and I always, you know, used different drop addresses. And how long from first day of going on to Google or whatever and searching how to do carding? Sure. To actually full blown into it, doing orders for overnight. Did it take? It was about a month. That's not that long. Yeah, it was about four weeks. Um, it was two or three weeks of research, and then I was just a crash course after that, right into it. Great work ethic, man. Fuck it. Well, yeah. Great work ethic. <laughs> yeah, I'm not lazy. <laughs> no, you're not. I can't accuse you of that at yeah. all. So you're, but you stopped that the virtual form because it was too hit or miss because of the cards. So what did you did at this did point? You move I knew the physical. I, I, well, because I was looking to scale. You know what I mean? I was business look, mind. Yeah, I was like looking it. to scale, and I knew that this just there was no way to scale it because there was just too many inconsistencies, and there was just too many um, too many high risk situations, and there was just too much legwork. Like the different drop addresses and always yeah. fucking, you know, there's just way too much legwork. Too much can go wrong. There's too many moving too pieces. Too many variables. Yeah. So you decide to move to the physical side then. Yes. And that's when I was like, okay, well, I, I was reading about the physical in-store carding and all that shit. And then- And uh, how does it work? So, okay. Anytime you go to Walgreens, Walmart, CVS, you know, anywhere that you have to swipe your card or you put that, that chip in, that information that's- saved to that magnetic strip or that chip on your credit card is physically saved somewhere in a server. Now it's called track one and track two information. Okay. And when you, when you swipe, so okay, so you've got this little machine in front of you and a laptop and you swipe your debit card, credit card, anything, and it reads the information, the physical representation of that information on the computer screen in front of you is going to be two tracks of information. That's why they call it track one and track two. Now, the first track of information is just going to be the, the information that's physically on the card. It's going to be the credit card number, the expiration date, the name, all of that shit. The track two on that information is just a random string of digits with the card number and expiration date, everything in there. But that is the string of information that allows the POS machine, the point of sale machine that you're at, to communicate with the bank that allows the transaction to transfer the funds. Okay? Now, that information is saved somewhere on a server, always. 
It's held and it's saved. Now it's encrypted now, and that encryption's gotten better over the years. I'm sure you've heard of some of the bigger breaches over the years. Like oh the, yeah, with Target, there was a big yeah. one about five or six years ago, where yeah. 50 million Home debit Depot. cards. Home yeah. Depot was another big breach. So um, they save it, yeah. So it's all saved sense. on servers. All this information because they have to save it on. They have to because they have to be able to process. And then the Vladimir inv- gets in there. You exactly, know, and exactly. And they hack it in bulk. And Boris, and then they resell right. it. They resell it on on the market. Now. All of this information is useless unless you have a physical card to encode it to. Yeah, because in the store, you can't just give the number. No, you can't. I Actually, you know what's crazy? I didn't even think of this, but about a month ago, I walked to a store and I realized I didn't have my shit with me. I was on the way home walking from somewhere else. And I was like, oh shit. And I went up to the front. It was a CVS. And I'm like, oh, can I just give you my number? And they're like, no. Yeah. And I didn't stop to think like why they were saying that. But yeah, no. you're, yeah, you're like, yeah, you know, you're totally oblivious. You're just thinking in the moment, like I need to. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, oh shit, I'd like to buy this. I'm like, can I just give you? Nope. Yeah, that's why mobile wallets and everything are are great now. Right. Like fucking Apple Pay and all that shit. Yeah. You keep all your cards, which that's a whole another. I set that up too. Afterwards, I'm like, that's why I need that. Yeah, right yeah. There. You always got your phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, all this information saved, and it's you know it's saved on a server, and then it's resold to people who now you need a piece of plastic to write this information to. And it to can't be able just to go be into a plastic. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can, you can write it to whatever has a track information on it. But good luck going to a fucking trying to get you know a, a five thousand dollar Birkin bag, or good luck going to fucking Walmart or trying to get a big screen TV using a a, um, a card you found or like a fucking gift card with somebody's information written to it. Good luck. Because that's how people go to jail. That's how idiots. That's how the idiots that you know those are rookie mistakes. Because you can re- the person at the cash register can really tell. Well, quickly. not not only that. It's once you, okay. So once you make a purchase over a certain amount of money, and I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but go to Best Buy and try to make a purchase for a thousand dollars. They're gonna ask for your credit card. They're gonna ask for your debit card or your credit card. Because okay, well, not if it's a debit card. Because if a debit card, you put in your PIN and you're good to go. But. I don't have. Gonna ask, wait, I don't have the pin number. I don't have the pin number for any of these cards that I'm using. So I always have to process it as credit. Oh, you're saying they're going to ask you for your pin number even on the credit card? No, no, no. Oh, I, I misspoke. I'm sorry. Okay, it's not following that. Um. So if you have your debit, if you have your pin number, they never ask for your card. Obviously, because it's your card, you know that you know the pin number. It's uh, but yes. Even okay, so I don't have the pin number to these cards that I'm buying. Obviously, because if I did, I'd go right to the ATM and just pull out cash instead of trying to go, you know, card high ticket electronic items. So you always have to process it as credit. Even if it's a debit card, you still have to process it as credit. Now what they do at the store is they physically they say, can I see your card? And they look at the card and the last four digits that are on the card, they type that into the POS machine. And if that number doesn't jive with what's being swiped, automatic fraud. Because the Why number, wouldn't it jive? Well, because the numbers that you're writing to the card are, it's a different credit card number than the card, than the, the physical card that you're using. You know what I mean? Why is it a different, no, I don't know. Okay. Why is it a different number? I'm going to pull out my credit card. I'm going to show you. We, we need yeah. a, we need a, I think I'm just having we need trouble a visual aid. This, we need a visual yes, aid. Please. And you got the camera right there if you want to show people as well. So we've got this credit card number on this card, right? This is my card number, right? This is my card number. This is my card. This card was issued to me with this are, card are number. We gonna, on. Are we going to broadcast that to the world? Oh, it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll bleed. You know what? I'll, I can mosaic it out. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. So, okay. This is my credit card number with my number on it that was issued to me. Okay. Now, you see this magnetic strip on the back? Yes. When I program this magnetic strip, I'm using somebody else's credit card information to program to this card. So, it's going to be a different credit card number than what's physically on the card. Oh, so wait. So you're you using your own card, but no, you're, I'm not using my own card. But I'm using a you know, different card, but you're not programming the same shit onto uh, it. Yeah, because you're buying somebody else's information that was stolen from their credit card, and I'm cloning it. What essentially what you're doing is you're creating a clone of someone else's credit card right. using. So why right. wouldn't you just clone everything the same on it? Why wouldn't you clone the same number on well, it? Well, you do, and that, but it's not easy. Like the the process for doing that, for actually printing your own credit cards, which I end up, and that's what I ended up doing, and that's how I made all my millions of dollars. Is right. not fucking easy. So when you were doing this, you weren't doing that. no, because I had no. Well, I was I was buying. So what I was doing is I would buy these cards online. You I would, would buy, buy these the numbers. numbers. I would buy them in the in the technical terminology is called dump. Yep, they're dumps because it's a dump of information. Got it. Now, once you once you purchase the dumps, you you have to have a card to encode them to to go to the store to use it. Now, I didn't have printers and embossers and all the equipment to go out and make my own fucking credit cards with matching numbers. So what I would do is I would go to like CVS or Walgreens with a backpack and I would steal every 
debit card that was on the rack, like the gift card, like the prepaid debit cards, yes. I take all of them, every single one of them. Now I can take those and I can write, I can oh, have a little machine so, okay. and I can reprogram the magnetic strip on these cards for, with the numbers that I just purchased. Because you didn't have an adequate way to produce, you were just exactly. you were mixing them. But I'm it. limited to where I can shop with these cards now because a lot of places, if you go like anywhere you go in, like say Target, for instance, anything over $300, if you process it as credit, they have to ask you for the last, they have to, what, they have to take the card and type in the last four digits. And listen, the point, the POS machine won't even let them process the sale unless they do that. Like, so there's no way of getting around. They have to ask you for the card to type in the last four digits. So now you, and if you're using a card that does, it doesn't match, you're fucked. You're done. You're done. So now you, there were only, you wanted to hit the Mendoza line of items that were high enough to make it worth your time, but they couldn't be too high to. Exactly. And, it, and then again, I'm, I'm, I, it depends on the I, hit, I hit another law. I hit another wall. Like I couldn't scale. So what were you buying during this period? <sighs> TVs? Do you remember when iPods, the iPod touch came yeah, out? Yeah. Those were huge before the iPhone really took off. And they were what? Like 400 bucks? They were expensive. Four or 500 bucks. Yeah. I was fucking, dude, I had so many of those goddamn things. I had probably 200 of those. So that was I would low go after enough. The, yes. It was just under the threshold at certain stores like, um, oh, Circuit City was still a thing. No, wait. Circuit City was closed. Um, Radio, Shack. Radio Shack was another one. Staples. They didn't check last four. Mm. Staples didn't check last four. Office Max checked last four. Target checks last four. Um, Did you learn that through uh, practice? <laughs> uh, trial and error, a lot of it. And then I, I remember one day I stumbled upon a tutorial where it just had a big list of all the fucking God. stores that checked last four and which ones didn't. So <laughs> trial and error. Were there <laughs> I mean, a few times where you ran? Oh, yeah. I got chased out quite a few times of stores. Okay. Or, and, and, and a couple times where I probably didn't even have to run, but I just got nervous and ran anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> fucking left the car there. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, we had both products yeah, so there, there was quite a few times where I'd get chased out of stores and, you know, shit would go wrong. We'd go sideways in the beginning. Yeah. yeah. Got it. So how long were you doing just that? So I started doing that. Uh, I did that for only maybe like three or four months until I was like, you know what? I'm Too getting, much. Dude, I'm getting chased out of stores. You know, I, I can't scale it because I'm, I'm pretty much limited to where I can shop and, you know, what I can make or, you know. So I was like, well, I need to figure something else out. So what'd you do? I started buying cards buying. that people would make. So, okay. So I found a guy in line and I, I, I used his service. I was like, listen, I need 15 pieces or 20 pieces of plastic. Okay. And I would be like, okay, this is the number I need uh, embossed on the card. And I would send him the card number. Just is the this, number. Is this like Vladimir or something? Like someone uh, over there? E, the, uh, the plastic vendors at that point in time were all out of Eastern Europe and Hong Kong. And how are you communicating with them? Like IRC channels? IRC chats. Yep. It was all IRC. And, and can then, you tell people what, who don't know what that was? So IRC back in the day is um, something akin to like, um, I would say like Yahoo chat or or those of you that were on the old school um, MSN. Or was that? What was that? Uh, AOL. AOL, exactly. Yeah. It was like AOL. Like AIM. AIM. It was just chat rooms, pretty but much. But it was encrypted, right? It was encrypted, and it was super, super fucking, like, low tech. Like, there was no, you know, user. Like, it was super simple, you know what I mean? Like, it looked script. Like, it looked like a 90s government nuclear, you know, yeah. computer system. It looked system. like you were looking at MS-DOS, if you know what that is. Actually, like, you remember when, the, remember, when the scre- no. gr- remember when computer screens used to be green? Like they, they were just yes, like, no, no, that's exactly yeah. it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. It's just yeah, like yeah, just exactly. the text and little boxes. That was almost it, like man. a Pac-Man game. That was it. Yeah. That's the IRC. Yeah, it was super simple. That's super like what simple. Julian Assange and, and WikiLeaks were using yep. early on. That's how Andy Greenberg was yep. on this podcast. That's how he got in touch with them. Yeah. But okay. So you're using IRCs and you're buying, you're, you're saying to, to Vlad out here, like, all right, I need, I need 6429, bup, 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 emblazoned on yep. a American Express card. Exactly. And yep. he would, so he would have some sort of plastic yep. that was convincing that he could produce the American Express yep. label on, yep. and then print that number on, and he'd send you the physical card. So and, I, now and then what? I would encode my dump to the card with my encoder because that little piece of equipment was only like oh because bucks. now you're lining up the numbers okay yep. right right because okay. now I need so he's he's gonna stamp the cards for me but I'm encoding them because and I now, have when they plug in the four digits you're good good to go yeah yep yeah. yep okay so. Now you can buy whatever you want doing that. Yeah. You go in and buy a $4,000 computer if you want yeah. to. Theoretically. 
So how didn't always work out that way, but yeah, why didn't it always work out? That well, because way? you don't really know what the balance is on any of these cars. Like I don't have any way of finding out how much money you have in your what bank account. What the credit account. limit is, or or what the credit limit, even if it was credit, because a lot of these the debit the, the the debits were a little bit were cheaper. Those were between seven and twelve dollars a piece. The credit cards were a little higher because those were obviously guaranteed for a certain credit limit. You know what I mean? So the credit cards were like $20, 30 40 50 and each. And you didn't know if it had $1,000 or $5,000. Exactly. You never so you, knew. So you had to go, you had to do at least one trial and error, I guess. Yeah. Usually multiple. And then once you start doing it for a while, there's something called a BIN number. Uh, it's called a bank identification number, B-I-N. So the first six digits of any credit card, debit card, will tell you exactly which financial institution issued it. Right. You right. know what I mean? Yes. So once you figure out what BINs kind of have you know money on them then you kind of just like okay you you ask the 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 people selling the numbers the vendors if they have do you have this bin number so you in, feel in good your base. about like american express or something like that uh, smaller credit unions i found uh people usually had higher balances in their account like uh i hate to say this but like teachers credit unions i used to hit those a lot um i used to hit the usaa the, the whatever that is the USAA credit unions and I know because it's all military and I know they got paid they get paid on the fifth or they get paid on the first and the fifth so I always knew that like if I had a base of those dumps it was always going to be good around like the first week of every month I can hit those for pretty high amounts and the, and the fact of the matter is the crime against those people is they just get a massive inconvenience it is and, a ma it is a horrible massive inconvenience but they'll get the money back one hundred percent of the time they always get their money back always. so. You're essentially stealing from banks. The financial institutions, which, right. if you know how modern banking actually fucking operates, it's not even their money to, to lend out in the first place, and it do, the money does <laughs> the money's not even real. It doesn't even exist. It's created out of thin air. That's a whole that's, that, a, that's, whole a, yeah, that's a whole other podcast. But yeah, so you so the the just keeping score out there, the crimes are people's time and stress and effort, which is a crime for sure. It's a bummer. But then yeah. but then it's also the actual money crime is at the end of the day, you're taking money from from banks. Yeah, so. I'm stealing from financial institutions. Right. I mean, so, I'm, I'm inconveniencing people, sure, and you know, and they could blow. You know, they, and, and, and there are some instances where sometimes it's bad. Maybe man. if it's a single mother and she needed, yeah. she went to a store to buy formula, and now all of a sudden some asshole used her credit card, and Problem. now she's got. It's going to take a couple days to get her money back, and she needs to feed her kids. Like there's situations like that that I'm sure I've caused problems, and I feel horrible. You yeah. know, I do. I do feel bad about those kinds of things, but. That was that was the time period you were in. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I so get that's it. the paradigm I was living in. You're not, and you're not. There's no way you're really thinking about that while you're doing it. You can't. Yeah, you have a cognitive dissonance yeah, built you have in to. there. You have to. Yeah, or so else you won't, you won't commit the crime. That's something that sends a shiver up your spine later. Yeah. So you like was that a lot more profitable then? I assume like you're still missing on some because you don't know the limits, but now it's less stressful because you don't have to pick out specific places. You have it lined up. You can yeah. go make big buys. Yeah. So are you making a lot of money at this point? Uh, when I start purchasing the cards, yes, yeah, I'm, I'm probably doing uh, two or three thousand a day at Holy this point. Holy shit! Yeah, and how long did you do this exclusively? Not that long. Only maybe another two or three months before I really felt like. Then again, I was ready to scale, and I couldn't because the inconsistency and in the plastic I was getting, like the inconsistency and in the quality of the plastic I was getting was just absolutely ridiculous. So like, some cards you had to throw away. Right some away. cards I would get them in the mail and I couldn't even use them. I'd be like, what the fuck is this? And what I would, would be wrong with them? The numbers would be uh, misaligned. Uh, mm -hmm. They weren't embossed right. Um, the images on the, the, the credit card wouldn't come all the way up to the edges. So there'd be like a white line around the image on the fucking card. You know what I mean? Like, and if you flip it over, it's, there's, there's, so there's a lot of security features that, credit cards have that people are unaware of like people are unaware that if you put your credit card under a black light there's uv security features oh, yeah. on the card it's that like you a can't license see. Yeah. yeah and then there's a something called a rear indent where it's embossed from the front to the back with the last the last three is actually there it's actually raised in the back if you feel your card it's called a rear indent a lot of the cars didn't have that. Uh, the SIG strips on them were printed on, which they're not. If you look at your credit card, it's a whole different fucking... Got it. You know what I mean? So, like, a lot of the shit, the other cars that we're getting were fucking absolute garbage. And I'm like, dude, I can only... There's only certain places I can use these at. But you're only doing... You do this for, like, two, three months, 60, 90 days. You're making a lot of money, but it's quick, and you're you're also throwing shit out, so you... I'm also getting ran out of stores sometimes because the cards aren't working, because, you know, like... It just, they're not good enough. Uh, yeah, they're not good enough. Like, a lot... There was a lot of... I was having a lot of problems. So and, you and, tried and, somewhere and that were on top of that, the line. I'm paying 34 
$40 a piece for these motherfuckers yeah. just for the plastic. But you would, and then I'm paying, and then I'm paying $30, $40, $50 a piece for the numbers. But you were so trying shit that was on the line though. It sounds like you, yes. not just the ones that were obvious, like you couldn't do, but sometimes you'd be like, maybe it'll work. And those are the ones that are getting chased out of storage. A lot of times. Yeah. Okay. A lot of times. Yeah. And, and you know, um, you know, I, I I was just like I said. I was I would I would have each, each card I was going out to use. I have like eighty dollars invested, and then it doesn't work. But if you're making two three grand a day, that's a business expense. It is, but you know, once you try, but I was thinking in in scale, in, in scale, and I yeah. was like, well, that's you know, I'm gonna lose too much money, and that's just too much risk I'm taking. So I'm getting middled at the end of the day. I need to figure out how to make more fucking money. Right. Um, and that's when I figured out. I was like, well, how hard is it just to print these cards on my own? Mm. And that led me down a whole another rabbit hole. So. You went from, you went from, I'm going to make a parallel here, from salesman to supplier. You went, you went from dude on the ground to CEO by saying, okay, instead of being the guy who orders this shit and goes in and physically does it, and that's how I make my money, instead of instead being, I'm going to sell to all those Yeah, instead of being the end consumer of the product, um, I, you know, something... Something somebody once told me a long time ago, and, and I've always I always revert back to this because I feel like this was the a, an exact turning point when I had this thought. And you know, and like I'm a big history buff. I know a lot about history. I, I research it and I, I study it a lot on my own just for fun. And people think I'm fucking insane, <laughs> but I just do. It's fun. Um, during the gold rush, the guys mining the gold weren't the ones making all the money. It was the guys selling the pickaxes. Mm. those were the guys that were making all the money during the gold rush. And that's a little known fact about the, about the gold rush. Why weren't the miners making money? Well, because, they, listen, they had a lot of people, like so, so the price of gold was constantly fluctuating, and they had all these fly-by-night places where you went and they would buy your gold, and they wouldn't really give you, you know what I mean, like the, the fair va- va- dollar value for it. And then the money that they were making off the gold, they were spending in the whorehouses and the fucking taverns mm. and all that shit like that, you know, and then like, it was rough, dude. They were dying out there, like, so they weren't, you know, it wasn't like, they were going out there and I think they were going to make all this money during gold rush but they're really just chasing pipe dreams do you think that has to do with the psychology of the people who are mining versus the psychology of the people who were taking advantage of those people or yeah. does it have to do with the fact that there was more money in the pickaxes it seems to me like if anything there's equal money or a Frankly, I'd say probably more money in gold, but the type of person doing it psychologically was not one who was inclined to be able to know their value, A, and B, hold on to the money. Exactly. Well, see, the the person that's more inclined to chase after uh, gold in the ground, that's a whole different kind of mindset than the person's like, oh, you know what? I'm just going to stand here and sell these pickaxes for fucking $2 a piece for the next six months. And You know what I mean? Like, So that's what you're saying. Your mindset was more built on long-term building as a businessman and and removing some risk from the table, having it consistent. Exactly. Okay. So how do you get into – obviously, like, there's a market for it because you're fucking buying it. Other people are buying it. It's I I don't know how big this game was. And the market was fucking horrible. Like, these guys – these were some of the most fucking – unreliable motherfuckers I mean, I mean obviously it's fraud and you're dealing with fucking scumbags you know what i mean so you can't really how you know how smart can any of these guys really be Matt but Cox it was like doesn't like sloppy fraud yeah remember that yeah well he's a whole nother he's a whole different animal <laughs> whole different animal that guy there um you know so it's like you, you would you would message these guys and you'd be lucky if you got a message back in fucking a week and then when you put your money in with them you'd be lucky if you got your cards in a fucking month or if you got them at all, if you, yeah, and that's another thing. Like a motherfucker, a lot of motherfuckers are just ripping people off. Like you could, you could, listen, you could do business with this guy for six months, thousands of dollars, and then all of a sudden you put in an order and he just starts ripping you off. Like it was like that. Like you had no fucking clue. You don't have insurance. No, and you it's can't. Gone. And that, there's nobody to complain to. Who are you gonna mm-hmm. tell? You can't call the Better Business Bureau. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're not letting me do my fraud. Yeah. So you know, and and like I said, the customer service with these guys was fucking horrendous, and the product they were putting out was absolutely horrendous. But in order to do these things, you need to be able to buy the the the, the, dig- the, the digital numbers, right? That's the first thing you got to be able to have no. numbers to print, right? Nope. You don't have to have the numbers. No, people can just order the numbers. I can you. buy the numbers. I can, yeah. So, right, right, right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so, so you have to go buy it, but then you have to print it. So now the physical Well, side. I don't have to because I can just, I was selling blank plastic for a long time because the, 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 the piece of equipment you need to encode the card and the piece of equipment you need to push the numbers onto the card, relatively inexpensive. A couple hundred dollars. And it's re- readily available everywhere on the internet. So a lot of scammers already have that. They already have it. 
So what they do is they order the plastic from guys who can make it really well, and then they just stamp and encode their own numbers to it and go so out and how use did them. you go about learning how to make the plastic, and what did you need to do that? Dude, that was like a whole fucking thing in itself, man. Like, I had to... Uh, there, first of all, there was no information anywhere. There were no tutorials on how to print plastic. There was nothing. So I had, I had to just go online and just start researching keywords is where I started. Uh credit card printers, plastic printers, uh, you know, track two, like just, just keywords that I knew that were in the industry. I just started Googling keywords. And then once, you know, I figured out, I stumbled onto a page, I'm like, okay, this information looks, let me follow this rabbit hole. And then eventually it would lead me to like a, a place that like sold, um, ID card printers for ID cards for like employee mm. ID badges and shit like that. So I purchased one of them, but I could never really get it to print the high quality, Images that I needed to to make my plastic look like it was issued from a financial institution. Got it. Okay. You know? So at this time, I, and it, it was just a rabbit hole, and I just started researching equipment, researching equipment. And then I was like, well, something struck me. I was like, well, the DMV prints driver's licenses. Let me fucking lose my driver's license and go down there and see what printers they're using. So I went down there. I, You know, I, I air quotations, lost my fucking driver's license, and I went down to the DMV. Did you even have one by then? Are you old? And you said you got a twenty five, twenty six. Your first license. Did you even have one? Um, I don't remember. I think it was. Yeah. Well, no. It might have been my my, my identification or something that I played. Like I, I might have had a driver's license at this. No, point. it wouldn't even matter if you had it or not. You're just playing like you lost it anyway. Yeah. I just. I, so I went down there and I'm. I wanted to see what printers they were using to um to make the the driver's licenses. So I went down there and I got the model numbers. I seen the model numbers. Recorded them in my memory, and then I went home, and I just got online, and I figured, can I find these? Is this, is this equipment readily available to the public? Which it was. Really? Which it was. No fucking... Now, I mean, I think now there's a, the, the, yeah, the now, restrictions no are a little bit tighter on it, but no at this way. point in time, you could just go <laughs> to the manufacturer and order these fucking... These printers. Like, there was no... Nothing. The business was booming for those people. Yeah, so like, I, damn, there's a lot of printers coming in, huh? So I ordered, yeah, so I ordered, uh, I ordered a printer, and I just, it was trial and error. I just started playing around printing cards, and um, now you have to order the raw plastic too. You can, and that's readily available. It's blank. Easy. You can order, yep. yep here, you can order them ten thousand at a time. They come in sleeves about this big, and um, you know, so I just started playing around. I just started printing cards and seeing, you know, I, obviously I have a, de- a degree in graphic design, media arts, so I don't have to that part of the the, and that's really what was like, okay, I can do this, right. you know, because I, I I had a very what I deem to be a very profound understanding of how all of this operated um, just on a physical level. Like, I understood how all of the equipment operated physically. I understand, like, the back end of all of, like, the, the designing and, like, you know, the DPI, what each... Because you had looked at so many. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you had done it trial and error. You knew it worked. Yeah. yeah. So I, I knew that. what I... I so, I, like, it was just trial and error, man. I, and I would slowly... It, I would have to start with the cheaper equipment first, because this shit's expensive, man. Like some of these printers were like sixty five hundred just yeah. for like for one part of the process. That was just one piece of the the equation. But like you could also sixty five hundred dollars. You could fund that while you're doing some of the two three thousand dollar days. You can, and I and, and I didn't really have a whole lot of those two or three thousand dollar days. Like I fucking it was they they came, but it was and they and it started being more far and few in between. The the more I started doing it, you know what I mean. Um, and then, yeah, man, it was just trial and error. I just, I figured out how to fucking, how to print the cards. I figured out how to do the driver's licenses. That was another. Oh, you figured out driver's oh, licenses yeah, I was doing, too. I was doing driver's licenses. And Maybe I was, you made my fucking ID when I got that taken. <laughs> I might have. <laughs> um, yeah, I was doing driver's licenses and I was doing uh, credit cards and debit cards. and What goes into like the driver's license? Because they're different state to state as well. So like how, how would so you make a convincing So I had to, um, I knew a guy who sent me a, um, a zip file and it had probably 25 states already done or something like that in it. Like the templates were already made. Of like the holograms and stuff that go on? Well, because you know, those, those IDs are all obviously made to thwart fraud. Yeah. But any, you know, savvy graphic designer can see exactly what process they use to create the different fucking steps of the, the layers to create their security features. And once you figure that out, it's, you know, it's it, they're super simple to make. I can print it like I'm printing a business card. Except it won't scan if they scan Oh, it. no, it'll scan everything. I, may, I made them to where they scan and everything. I had barcode generators and I would Holy generate shit. the barcode with the information that's on the front of the card. And then I programmed the barcode and no, I did them all legit. Yeah. 
Wow. Now, yeah. what are, what are you? What programs are you using to do this stuff? Uh, I'm using uh, Adobe Photoshop. I'm using um, Adobe Illustrator, and I am. This using... is exactly what they advertise the product <laughs> for. By the way, uh, yeah, the, those were the main two programs I used, and there was like a few other little uh, off programs for like you know sizing and. Got it. So what? You how long did it take before you had figured out? Let's even just say credit cards. Like once you order the equipment, you get it in there. After you did the DMV thing, and then it was about a solid eight months. So you spent a long time. Yeah, it was about a solid eight months before I had a product that looked like it was issued from a financial institution. And so what happens then? Now you got to go to market. How do you do that? Well, I started using them because it's still at this point I didn't think about oh, becoming yeah. a vendor. Oh, you know so what you I mean? I was, I, thought you were I, was just, right no, I was just trying to cut the middleman out. Oh, you know what I mean? Okay. Like I hadn't even occurred to me to become a vendor at that point. Like I was just at this point, I'm like, you know, I need to cut out the middleman and that Got way it. I can make my own plastic. And now I'm fucking, it's huge, you yeah. know, because now my product, I'm, I'm comfortable with my product and I don't have to wait for them to come in the mail. If I fucking get a big base of dumps, I can sit up all night printing cards and go out and hit fucking 20 stores the next day instead of hitting only two and waiting for cards to come and getting them declined and all the other bullshit. Got it. You know, okay. so for, so I started using them and then it just came to a point once again where I was getting chased out of stores and I had to go and get a fucking storage unit to hold all of the shit that I'm carding in because, you know, I got so I had the I had the process down so good at this point to where I was going and I couldn't fit any more shit in my car. Like I would have to make trips back and forth to the fucking to the storage unit, unload my car into the storage unit and then I'd go back. I don't ask any questions over there. No, they don't give a shit. It's 24-hour access. You just type in your code and go to your fucking unit. And uh, I was filling up storage units, man, of of shit. And and then I had to list everything, and then I had to meet people and fucking do it. It was just like, dude, this is too much work. Too much work. It's too much work, dude. You can't fucking... This is not scalable. Again, once again, this is not scalable. But your hit ratio, even though you're still getting chased out of storage, it's a a lot better. Yeah, it's a lot higher, and I'm starting to make a little bit more money. So you're saying you have a moment, I assume, where you say to yourself, I'm better than the marketplace at, at creating this. I never really thought about it like that. Yeah, I mean, I just... But that's been the story my whole life. I've always been able to fucking, you know what I mean? Wiggle yeah. my way into a position to where I'm just, you know. So what, when you, at some point you make the decision where you're like, I'm going to sell these to people. Yeah. That's when I was like, uh, I think, so, so I'm going to tell this story and I've told this story uh, several times before, but it's, it's just, it's, it was like the, the, uh, the crescendo, if you will, you know, the cataclysm. The, the the catalyst uh this event this event was the catalyst that really launched me into wanting to become a vendor um me and my little brother and I'm a, at this time me and my little brother my little brother chris uh, has he been around he so he's he's now at this at this time he's like 18 and he's getting a little bit older because he's three four years younger than me and he's and lived with your mom this whole time this whole time and now she kicked him out Why'd she kick well, him? Well, she didn't kick. Well, I mean, kind of. She pawned him off and got rid of him because he went away to college, and then he got into some, like he got into some shit at school, and then he was going to Michigan U of M, and then he tried to go back home to my mom's house, and she's like, "No, you're not coming back here. You're out now." And he's so, going to Michigan. Yeah, he's he's a brain. He's yeah, a, he's clearly. extremely intelligent. Like extreme. My little brother's on a, his his intelligence is on a whole another fucking scale way far beyond anything that i'm able to achieve so you bring him down to miami so he calls me he's like um how much younger is he again three and a half years younger than okay. me okay so you would I'm did 20, you bring him down there right at the yeah, start of this yeah well yeah right when i so when i start getting into doing the on like the the physical carding and all that shit he comes down got it so he calls me tells me the situation i'm like dude just drive down i was like you know you can come i got you set up <laughs> well i didn't tell him i was doing all that shit he didn't know and then when he gets down here, I kind of tell him what I was doing, and he's like, "Oh, I, my roommate used to do that," and he kind of knew, he kind of knew a little bit about it, so he just jumps into it with me. And me now, me and him are going out karting every so day. So now you got two heads on it. Now yeah. you're scaling a little bit, a little bit, yeah, yeah. We're having fun, and you know, it's a rush, man. You know, it's a fucking yeah. rush to being able to go to a store and buy whatever you want and not even look at the price because I know I have 15 credit cards in my pocket, and one of them is going to fucking process the sale. It's Same a- kid that used to walk into Publix two days hunger. Two days hungry. Dude, I was eating out of trash cans, man. I was yeah. fucking dying eating out of trash yeah. cans. You know, so this for me, it's 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 turned over a whole new perspective in life. It's given me a whole new outlook on life. You know, things that were important to me at one time were no longer important. Things that I wanted, I didn't want anymore. Like goals changed. My whole perspective on the way um, the the modern banking system works and all that shit. All that shit just completely changed. And um, 
Yeah, so we're doing it. And so me and my little brother, we go, we, I, and I feel so bad because what, for whatever reason this day, he had the ID that matched the, the cards that we were using for whatever reason. So I would print batches and I'd make myself an ID and I'd have an ID to match this batch of cards. But once this batch of cards ran out, I would just get rid of the ID and get rid of the cards and I'd start all new. And for whatever reason, that batch that we were using, my little brother had the ID that matched the credit card. So I, I had to, ha- he had to go with me or else I wouldn't have been able to do it. And I think like rent was coming up or something like that. And we needed a couple laptops. So it was like, okay, so I went and I woke him up. He was out of a dead fucking sleep. I wake him up to go and commit credit card fraud with me to go and steal. We drive from uh, Coral Springs to West Palm Beach, Florida. We go to Walmart. We walk in. Uh, we go all the way to the back. We get the laptop. We get up to the counter. Everything's fine. We give the guy the card. He swipes the card. He looks at it. He goes, he picks up the phone. He says, we got a code red back in electronics. Oh, fuck. I was like, fuck. I knew what time it was immediately. I did an about face. I pull out my cell phone, act like I was talking on my phone. I start walking towards the front door. I glance back. My little brother's still standing at the fucking counter. And I'm like, fuck. And you were at the counter with him. Yeah. Right? I just turned around and started walking. Like, I didn't say anything to my little brother. And he just, he stayed at the counter. I'm like, fuck, why isn't he, you know what I mean? I think he was trying to get the card back is what it was. He didn't want mm. them to keep the card. So he was trying to get the card back, I think. And then once they didn't give him the card back, I don't know. But I listen, I got to the front door. The front door is open as I'm walking up to him. And I hear somebody running from behind me, like flip-flap, because he was wearing thong fucking sandals. Right? <laughs> he didn't have running shoes on. So I see him. He flies past me. Two guys chasing him straight out the door. And when he looked back, the, just the look of sheer absolute fucking terror on his face hit me in my stomach. And I felt so bad, man, because I was like, fuck, I fucked up. Because the guys chasing didn't know you were standing at the counter with them. Yeah, well, no, well, yeah, no, because one of them tried to grab me as they got to the front door, and I knocked his hand away. I kind of did like a spin move and shot out the parking lot. And once you make it out of the parking lot, they can't pursue you anymore. So they got my little brother. They sna- They got him in the parking lot. One of his fucking sandals blew out on him like the little thong thing ripped out, and they fucking they got him. They arrest him. Um, you know, I'm I'm online all night tracking him all around town, seeing which Chicago county jails he goes to and shit. I get him. Uh, before he even made the first phone call to me, I had him a bondsman down there and he called me like, yo, I got a bond. Can you get me a bond? I'm like, listen, I already got you a bondsman. Just sit tight. You're going to be bailed out in like an hour or two. I went down there. I got him. Uh, and at, after that, I was shook, you know, because now it's real. Now somebody that went to jail, this is the first yeah. time anybody's gone to jail or anything's happened because of it, you know, and this is my little brother, dude. And I feel bad because I got him into it. And I'm just like, you know, I just felt really bad, man. You know, and, and, and at this point, I'm just like, dude. Shit's getting real now, you know. Now the consequences, now shit's getting real. And now I'm starting to get paranoid because I got all this equipment at my house and I'm making credit cards and I've been fucking, I've been doing it for, you know, about a year and a half, two years now. And, um... Now, how much did they know, though, when they caught your brother? Like, nothing. they, They only caught him with the one card, right? And he shut his mouth. He would not give a statement. He wouldn't fucking nothing. So they just charged him with basic theft? Uh, grand theft. Yep. That well, that's it. that's not basic theft. That's that's okay. Yeah. So they were. What what is the level for grand theft? Like how much? Over a thousand dollars. Okay. Right. Yeah. So well, that makes sense. Grand theft. There you go. So did he go to prison or? So he got probation. Uh. He so he eventually got probation and then he took off. So this how this whole situation was nuts. So I bonded him out of jail. Um. Like a month goes by and we don't hear anything. Then we, I get a call from the bondsman saying that they released the bond, that uh, they're not going to, I guess the charges were dropped, they're not pressing charges, whatever. I'm like, okay. So I went and got my bond money back. And we thought we were in the free and clear. I guess they thought they just, you know, didn't have enough evidence. I don't know what the fucking deal was. Then all of a sudden, I get a knock on the door at like six o'clock in the morning one day, and it's a cop. It's a Coral Springs police officer. He's like, uh, is Christopher Boziak here? He was in the room sleeping. And I just, I thought on my toes, I was like, no, he's in Michigan. Uh, he went to Michigan uh, three days ago. He took off and went to Michigan. He's like, well, do you have any ID? So I turned around and luckily my wallet was sitting right behind me on like a little chase we had in the hallway. Gave my ID. He's like, oh, well, good thing he's not here. He's got a warrant out for his arrest. And I, and I explained to the cop, I was like, listen, they gave me my bond money back and said that the, uh, the charges were dropped. He's like, yeah, well, uh, he's like the state attorney um, picked up the charges or whatever like that. And they're, they're recharging them. So let him they know. They can do that? Apparently, if the the county or I don't the, know how that works, if the so. county or city municipalities drop a charge, then it gets then it goes to the state, and if the state pr- ch- chooses to pursue charges, then they could pick it up, and then then they could they could have charge. So th- it went to the state attorney, and then uh, apparently he fucking decided that there was enough evidence and there was enough of a crime to press charges. 
So I then, feel like there's way bigger fish to fry in Florida. It was than crazy, like man. One credit yeah, it, card. it was. Some, I mean, obviously, it was doing a lot more. It than landed that, so. on somebody's <laughs> desk, and they were just being a fucking asshole. And they were like, you know what? Let's just because there's already a system put in place. Hey, look to their credit, he was doing it on a massive scale. But I'm just saying yeah. they didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's what I'm saying. Like, like if they knew, then yeah, fuck yeah, they should charge his ass. But I, yeah, that just uh, that's kind of why I I don't know. I've never learned how that works with like when they decide not to charge is the, is their paperwork filed is that then legally i've never asked that question and i don't before. know that either i have no idea how that process so works. either way somehow they were somehow or another they, they to... dropped the charges and then they picked them back up so did he turn himself in or no i woke him up i was like dude the cops were just here looking for you. he said they said you have a warrant out for your arrest they picked the charge back up he's like fuck he took off and went to michigan like that day or the next day did he ever come back or well i uh i was mailing cards up there to him and his roommate in bulk <laughs> and they so they started carding in Michigan <laughs> so they started doing it up in Michigan he gets picked up in Michigan he used a debit card at a Walmart and this dude this what how this went down this never fucking happens the lady whose debit card he used lived in the city that the fucking Walmart or the target that he was using it at was in oh wow she seen the charge on her card called the target and was like listen my card was just used at your store for three hundred dollars and the store was like, oh, there's nothing we can do about it. She called the police department and was like, listen, my card was just used at this Target for $300 an hour ago. She's like, I physically have my card in my possession. So there's some kind of fraud going on here. The, the, the sheriffs went down to the Target. The cameras. Pulled the cameras, yeah. got the fucking license plate number, found out the address, went to the house, fucking ran up in the apartment that the, my little brother and his roommate were in. Oh, nightmare they had debit cards everywhere they had fucking stacks of fucking hundred dollar oh gift boy. cards they had fucking all kinds of shit fucking equipment everything he gets arrested in michigan um they put him on probation in michigan and then <laughs> for that and then they extradite him from michigan all the way down uh, to florida all the way down to florida yeah. and then he gets put on probation in florida and then you know leaves the game decides to go straight and he's like i'm done good for him yeah Got probation out of both of those. That's lucky. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, because he had never done anything wrong. He had no criminal history. Yeah, but at they all. walk in. There's a million debit cards and credit cards. I know. That's kind of like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's excessive. lucky. He, he got lucky, and he, I think he realized he got lucky. And, and like I said, my brother's a lot smarter than I am, you know. And I feel like um, he, I feel like he's he has a lot more options available to him in in way of you know creating uh, opportunity and creating mm -hmm. income for himself than than I do, um, or than I did at that time. So he quits, um, just walks away from it completely. And, and I, you're still balls deep in it. Well, I'm, you know, I'm like, well, fuck, I don't want to go get a job. You know, I'm not going to quit completely. But you were thinking about like, oh, he got caught. Is there going to be heat on me? Exactly. That's at least in your head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to shuffle the cards a little bit and rearrange the fucking scam and, you know, what, to what, where there's less, you know, uh, uh, risk that I'm taking. What's your money looking like at this point? And how old are you? 24, 25? Yeah, I was in my early 20s, and uh, this is probably about 04, 05, and... Uh, no, this has got to be like 06, because you started... This is, yeah, this is late 05. This is almost 06, when, when me and him got busted, because I remember that distinctly, because I remember the apartment that I was living in. Oh, wait, was he... Hold on. Did he get busted before you started providing credit yes. cards? Okay, oh, yeah, yeah, now yeah, yeah. it makes sense. This, this, okay. this incident was the catalyst... For me wanting to go got into it. vending, got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah got it. Now yeah. the timeline makes sense. Yep. So now you—that's how you decide. Like, okay, I need the heat off me for not doing this in stores. I don't want my face on security cameras. And that's cameras. when the pickaxe thing, fucking right. I, that's when I was like, okay, that's when I—that's when I got into that train of thought, and I tried to figure out how can I make money from this with a reducing the amount of exposure on myself and and b increasing the the profit margin. So what kind of pro you? I, I forget what the timeline was. Maybe eight months, you said, in you were able to, to do perfect, it. To perfect, yeah. To perfect it. Yep. So then you reached out on the open marketplace and said, I'm in business now. Well, I was already on the forums. I had been on the forums for about a year or two at this point. But now time. you're saying, guess what, bitches, I, I supply now. Now too. I'm a vendor. But going through the whole process and becoming like a verified vendor on the boards and all that shit, <laughs> it's not... <laughs> it's not easy. A verified vendor. I was, yeah, a verified you get a blue vendor. check mark for that? Um, I, you got some kind of, it was a credit system that, that, that yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Instagram for fraud. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. you, you, at some point there, a year, whatever it was, you become a verified vendor and yeah. then how customers just start hitting you up for it. 
Uh, in in the beginning, it was kind of slow, um, but, you know, because nobody really knew if I was a ripper or you know I was somebody that had the product. But then you know after like a few weeks and a few months of me just sending cards out to people and then having them post, um, you know, the they'll they'll, uh, they'll get the cards and they'll post pictures of them on the forum and be like, yo, these things are legit. This guy's a legit seller. You know, his quality is his, um, the quality of the product is on point. And his, your customer service was excellent, right? On a whole other fucking level. My yeah. customer service rivaled. You know, Sprint, AT and T, fucking Microsoft, any of those things it rivaled it because a I used to sleep with my fucking laptop open next to me, on a stool with the volume turned all the way up, so that if an ICQ chat came in or an IRC chat came in, even for somebody just asking Holy about shit. a product, I would wake up out of a dead sleep, deal with the customer, and then go back to sleep. So you were very timely. You were a good. I dealer. was on it. I was on it yeah. because I knew that this is where everybody else was lacking. So at where everybody else was lacking, I knew that I had to step up, and that was the only way that I was going to take control of the marketplace, essentially. Because that's after I figured out that my product was better than everybody else's, that was my goal, was com- complete hostile takeover of the entire fucking marketplace. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, that's the fucking type of shit I was on. And then once I figured out, and then, uh. and then I, I essentially just sent out an email to all my competitors letting them know that they were all fucked. You sent an email to all your Fuck like yeah, to Sergey and Boris and shit? everybody. Let did him they know. even? Did they even? Did they speak good English or like? Oh, they got translated. I mean, I'm sure they got translated. <laughs> they got translators going. <laughs> Fuck you! I own you now. Yep. Done. Cooked. Put everybody out of business. Your product was a lot in, better. In one year, I put everybody out of business. I was the only one. How much cards. money were you making? At the very pinnacle of what I deemed to be my success, <laughs> I was doing a hundred orders a month. On average, which how and, what's the size um, of an order? Minimum order with me was a thousand dollars. Minimum order. So for a thousand dollars, you got a hundred debit cards, and I would work with you on the driver's licenses. I wouldn't give you a hundred, but I would work with you on the driver's. Toss licenses. in some driver licenses. Yeah, five, ten, whatever it was. <laughs> and I was doing a hundred orders a month. So that's what like, was your cost? It was it Just was so low that it was I, I didn't even register like it, pla- that's not that much money can no it was I, for five hundred dollars i could operate i could print twenty thousand cards holy fuck yeah so you know like i said my very pinnacle i was probably doing like a hundred thousand dollars a month in business a hundred and hundred hundred thousand hundred fifty thousand dollars a month in business and where are you putting this money uh, i have corporate accounts set up i have um Back in the day, I don't know if they have many more, but there used to be something called uh, Western Union cards. So, so okay. Yeah, so but what I, do you I send, So what? I've sent you a Western Union. You could go to a store and pick yes. it up. But if you go through like five or six different verifications with, with the actual company in Western Union, they'll send you a card. So people could send Western Unions and it'll go straight to the card. Right. So you don't have to go pick it up. So that keeps you out of the store, security cameras, yes. all that. And but I like, had probably 30 or 40 of those. Corpor- with- corporate accounts, what's the source of income? Well, I had so I had set up a um, a mobile detailing company. So I bought two Ford Econoline E three fifty vans. I outfitted them with fucking pressure washers, all the fucking shit. I set up a website. I incorporated them. I fucking I did all that shit, and then I would just I would put in monthly expense reports, you know, fake monthly expense reports, and fucking you know, um, all the money that the company was making, I was pretty much just giving to the guys running the company. They didn't know that, but I was just pretty much. All the money I was making zero money on that whole that business made me no money. Like the only reason that business even existed is so that I could have the LLC, and I could be incorporated, and I could have the fucking the corporate bank accounts and shit like that. With and I even had like a fucking fake. I was was submitting fake payroll every week. Holy! With a payroll company, yeah. It was EDT, ADT, or something like that. I had ADP. ADP, yeah, I had ADP uh, payroll company, fucking. 30 employees that didn't even exist. Your detail was incredible. <laughs> Listen, I had I had shell companies set up with working legitimate websites for companies that didn't exist because a lot of my cards were going overseas. And to get anything through customs, you had to have something called a BOL, a bill of lading. I didn't even... See, there's so many things I wouldn't even think of. Because, again, I don't oh, yeah. have credit card for it's, it. But it's a whole fucking... It's a whole thing, dude. Like, it's not easy. And you learn... <laughs> It's not you gotta you gotta put in hard work. Yeah, a lot of you dedication. Gotta be diligent, dedicated. Yeah, very yeah, very <laughs> diligent. So how long were you up and running? Like making your money about four years. Fuck. Now are you spending the money as fast as it comes in? No, man. I wasn't one of those guys, man. I was. To be honest with you, I was fucking terrified. Once I started, like when the real money came in, dude, I didn't know what to fucking do. Like I, I was smart enough to know. That I can't go buy a Ferrari and drive it up into the apartment complex. Right. I can't go buy a half million dollar home. Yeah, I wanted to. 
Like I wanted the big house. I wanted the nice cars, but I just knew that I couldn't do those things. So honestly, a lot of the money just sat collecting interest. You know what I mean? I had a little bit. Now, listen, Bitcoin's just coming into play now. This is 2009, 2010. So all the cryptocurrency, you know, that's just starting to take off. Ground I was, floor. Ground floor. And I was in, um, I you, was in Liberty Reserve. I was in uh, wait, wait a WMZ. And those things don't even exist anymore. When did you buy Bitcoin for the first time? 2010. Do you still have it? it on my hard drives that got, got fucking all the oh, keys and everything. Fuck. Yeah, oh, I had we'll probably... Yeah. We'll, we'll get there. And I get crucified in the comments over my Bitcoin oh. timeline. But yeah, I had probably $3,500 in oh. Bitcoin in 2010, which it was less than 50 cents a Bitcoin or something like that. Yeah, hundreds of millions of dollars right now sitting somewhere in a fucking Secret Service fucking shelf. Or it's already been auctioned and fucking, you know, because they get no, rid of all I'm that shit. No, I'm thinking that the other one... We'll get to it, but the other one with the girl who threw everything away, did she throw that away too? Oh, I had Bitcoin then too that got oh. thrown away. Yeah, so I had, I've had Bitcoin twice taken from me. Yeah. Oh, it's man. a hard it's a hard one. I don't even I don't even like to think about any of that stuff. I guess you deserve it, but still. <laughs> yeah, it's it just sucks. one of those things you compartmentalize and it's like, you know, I had the money, I don't anymore, I'm never gonna get it back, so it doesn't even it doesn't exist. It's yeah, <laughs> there it, it is. is what it is. Got like it. throwing away a winning lottery ticket. It, so you, it happens. So you're up and running four years. You started this in roughly end of 05, beginning of maybe 06 somewhere. Yep. You start actually yep. being a producer. And yep. so you are you have clientele. You don't even know where they are. They're just yep. ordering through you on this thing. You're yep. doing everything through a VPN. Were you yep. using any other layers of security besides VPN? So I would never uh, even boot my laptop up at my own home. Or anywhere near my home, I would never use my own IP address. I was using uh, Sox Five and Sox Four, Sox Five proxies on top of a VPN, and then on top of that, I was using a public uh, public Wi-Fi. You know, got it. And so you end up settling down with a girl at yeah. some point. Yeah. Yep. And you moved out of Miami. Yep. Moved out of Miami. Moved to a small town in South Carolina because that's where she was from. And she and, wanted. And her, you were cool doing that. Yeah, well, you know, because I was, I had, I still had my place in Miami, and I bought a, a townhome in South Carolina, and um, I could still go back and forth all I wanted to, you know. So I had a, I had equipment set up in Miami for counterfeiting. I had equipment set up in South Carolina for counterfeiting. And in my mind, I can do this wherever. Like I don't have to be anywhere. I can go wherever because, you know, as long as I have somewhere to ship from. Mm. You know. So. You just continue everything as is when mm -hmm. you when you go there, and you have a kid to South Carolina. Too. Yeah, you just had a kid. I uh, just her. had a son at this point. My son Aiden was born, or I'm sorry, my son Nicholas was born, and um, Aiden's the youngest one, right? Aiden's uh, Aiden's ten now. Yeah, right. And yep. Nicholas youngest. is what? Four. He'll be fifteen in March. Okay, he just turned fourteen. So you have Nicholas with with this Melissa. Yeah, with Melissa, mm -hmm. and he's about get, two years old at this time, and we're in South Carolina. How soon did you get caught? When, from moving After moving there. to South Carolina, it wasn't that long. Uh, maybe three or four months, five months or something like that. And what yep. happened? So in, in South Florida, when you go to a UPS store to send your packages out, uh, you walk in, you say, I got a package one going out. They scan it. You pay $5. They put it in their outgoing mail and it goes out when the UPS guy comes and picks it up. That's normal. Happens every day. They don't bat an eyelash at it. Now, when you're in Florida and you type in UPS store on your GPS it's like the map has chicken pox. You know what I mean? There's uh, 10,000 of them. There's one on every fucking corner. There's one every three miles because they're a franchise. So people open them as independent businesses all over the fucking place. And they make money. It's actually a business that actually makes money. Right. So in South Carolina, there was two in the town that I lived in. Or I would right. have to drive over an hour to Charlotte okay. to ship my packages out. So I started, I got comfortable and I got complacent and I started using these two UPS stores to ship all my packages out. Because up until this point, there had been never no heat on me by the Secret Service or anything like that. I'd, I wasn't aware of any open investigations on me. I had no close calls. You know what I mean? I'm dealing with people that are anonymously online. I'm packaging all my shit good enough to where it's not drugs or anything like that. So nobody has no you know, reason to open any of my boxes or my packages. So I've never had a package get stopped at customs. Everything has always gone through. So I'm just, I'm comfortable and I'm complacent at this point. So mm. I start using the same two UPS stores to send my fucking packages out of. The old man at the UPS store, which I didn't know it, he was the owner and he was working the front counter. 
Oh, you got to look out for them. And in South, in small town South Carolina, we don't like your kind. Exactly, <laughs> and that's what it was. And he he didn't like. He thought he was just got suspicious of me. He never fucking led on that he was suspicious of me. It was always he was always super polite with me when I went in there, and I was always really polite with him when I went in there. And you know, I went in, I opened a box, I told him I um, I own a company that uh, refurbishes um, you know computer equipment, and I resell it on eBay. You know, so I had a reason to be in there shipping packages every other fucking day, and they were going all over the world. You know, Russia, fucking South America, everywhere, fucking Chile, uh, Brazil. All my cars were going That's everywhere. That's not happening in that small town in South Carolina no. too much. So apparently he got suspicious one day and opened one of my packages. Is he allowed to do that? Nope. Sure the fuck isn't. And I got like 15 years knocked uh, off my oh, prison shit. sentence. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll get, get to there. that. So, so you walk in, normal day of business as you've been doing. Yep. You hand off a package, yep. you leave. Leave. You find out later, he opened it up. My customer didn't get, the, the package didn't arrive. And then my customer called me and I'm, mm. my customer service is like, so when my tracking didn't start tracking on that package, because I track the packages too. And to make sure, you know, cause I, under, I know exactly how many days to get to this step, how many days to get to this step. Once it hit customs, if it doesn't clear within 24 hours, it's not going to clear. Mm. You know what I mean? So I knew, so I always watch the packages as they go. If it's a big one, the littler ones, I don't really give a shit about, but the bigger ones I do because, you know, I'm dealing with a lot of money and I want return business for my customers because they're spending thousands of dollars with me on, on, on a regular basis. So I'm tracking this fucking package and it did, it just didn't track. All it said was UPS has created a shipping label, which I know because I create the shipping label because I had a, I had fucking a way about, you know, Pitney Bowes, the, the yes. shipping software. Yes. Why well, I, I know how to hack the Pitney Bowes and get free shipping. I could ship anything anywhere for free. How, in the United States. How do you do Freight, that? Freight, doesn't matter what the weight is, doesn't matter anything. I understand, once again, going back to understanding how the UPC and barcode labels work mm. and then understanding how the Pitney Bowes shipping system works and being able to generate that fucking barcode, it'll scan into the system and once it leaves its destination, the, the postage isn't paid for. Right. But the label looks like the postage was paid for and when you scan it in, it'll scan into the system. So the the... the the package will make it to wherever it's going anyway, and I never have to pay for postage for anything. Mm. You know what I mean? And it's just another way. It's, and the packages are harder to track that way as well, since yeah. the postage isn't legitimate. Yeah. So that was my roundabout way of doing that. And so I would seal and package and put my own shipping labels on the packages before I took them to the UPS store. So he had to open up one of the fucking boxes, went in, found the fucking cards, and... He contacted the Postmaster General. The Postmaster General contacted the Secret Service, and then they set up a sting on me. That's pretty much how I got caught. So the sting is you go to walk in to do the next mailing. They send me an email telling me I had a package waiting for me, which mm. coincidentally I did have a package because it was I had some other shit coming in from Mexico, some stamps, some other shit I was fucking on, and uh, <laughs> I fucking uh, didn't help my case any because I had to explain that fucking package too <laughs> while they're sitting there. They made me open it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, dude. So yeah, they set up a sting on me. I had they won me. I got. I went showed up to pick up my package. Was he there? The old man. Yeah. Yep. So he said hello. You're fucked. Oh no, he said hello, and he's like, I signed for my package. He's like, all right, have a good day. And I turn around. I went to go walk out the door, and here come two Secret Service agents walking in. I was like, fuck. They tackle you? No, it didn't even register with me because they were wearing regular clothes at that time, and I was going to walk out, and they were wearing. And I seen a gun and a badge on their hip and it still didn't register with me because I was so comfortable that I was like it still didn't register that these people were here to arrest me were you offended they didn't send a bigger team <clears throat> nah, <laughs> nah I, I didn't think about that at the time okay. but anyway at some point they grabbed you I guess yeah, they wouldn't let me they wouldn't let me they wouldn't let me out the door one guy stepped in front of me and then I, I, I went to go step because I thought it was an accident so I went to go step to go around him and he stepped again and he's like Mr. Pearson and that was the name I was Pearson using at that name. time and he was like Mr. Pearson I was like fuck <laughs> I was like, yeah. He's like, uh, well, we need to we need to talk to you about what you've been sending out of here. Mm. So what, and what I, I, I tried to play stupid for a couple minutes. I'm like, what are you talking? He's like, well, let's just go on back and have a conversation. So we went back and I sat down and I was just like, Phew. and that scene from Blow, that that scene at the end when he's like, all right, fuck it, let's do it. When he knew he was yeah. fucked, that came out of my mouth. I was like, all right, fuck it, let's do it. He's like, what's your name? He's like, what's your real name? Because he's like, and we know you're not right, Ryan Pearson. He's like, we looked up the name Ryan Pearson and we got it's the picture you. from the DMV. It's not you. And I was like, John Boziak. And uh, at this point, I knew that they didn't really know anything. How'd you know that? I would have been in cuffs. I would have oh, been in handcuffs. Right. There would have been no conversation. If yeah. they knew what I had been doing and how long I had been doing it to the, to the extent, there would have been no conversation. I would have been getting arrested. Hold on, I'm fogging up. You good? Yeah, I'm starting to sweat and fog up my fucking glasses. All right, we'll be back in one second. 
All right, we're back. Go ahead. If they had known the full extent of what I had been doing, uh, there would have been no conversation. They would have just arrested me. Right. You know. So I knew I knew that they didn't know anything. So at this point, I I was like, okay, well, they have the cards. In my brain, I'm just like, okay, they have the cards, um, but they don't know how long I've been doing this. They don't know, you know, anything. So I kind of, I honestly, obviously, I minimized everything to the to the as much as I could. I'm like, yeah, I've I've been printing cards for about six months. Um, You know, I've been doing out of my closet, my apartment, and they they I knew that they didn't believe me, but they didn't have enough evidence of anything else to really to do anything. And they're like, well. If you cooperate with us, you're not going to go to jail today. I'm like, I'm not going to go to jail. So at this point, I'm like, I'm fucking going <laughs> to jail. Biggest Carter in America. And they're like, well, just you know, tell us what we want to know. And, and, and if we feel like you're lying to us at any point, we're going to take you to jail. But he's like, we're not going to take you to jail. He's like, obviously, you're going to have a court date. You I mean you're going to you're in trouble? He's like, but um, you know, really, what we want, we want the we want the lab. They kept saying we want the lab. We want the lab. What lab? Like. Oh, because they didn't know you were the lab. No, they, they didn't. Because they thought they. I think what they thought is I was one small wheel and a very much larger one cog and a you know very much larger wheel. They didn't realize that I was just a solo. You know, this is very poor interrogation work. And uh, so then they were like, you know, so they just started asking me questions. I was like, yeah, I've been doing this about six months. I'm on uh, just selling on this one forum. Blah blah blah. Did you try to play it up though too? <clears throat> what do act you mean? like act like you were doing a lot. Fuck no! Listen, I no. I'm saying not. No, hold on. Let me restate that. Mm. Not a lot for what you and I know is a lot. Mm. I'm saying did in selling the small time stuff that you're selling. Did you try to act like because you were caught and you said okay, fuck it, let's do it. Did you try to act like you were a hot shot at doing it? No, not at all. Because I knew just from my ex- experience with being in trouble my whole entire life that you know the the more you can minimize something and make it seem less that is a big deal. The more of a chance I'm not going to be in in my mind. That's how that's why I'm processing right. the information. You might have been wrong on this one. But yeah, okay. maybe <laughs> you ended up being right. But yeah, if yeah. you'd run into good agents, you'd have been wrong. Oh, I'm fucked. And um, so you know they were like, okay, well, um, so they made they left. They went and one guy stood, and the other guy went and made a phone call. I guess he went and talked to somebody, and they were like, so they came back. They printed off a bunch of papers, and you're just in the back of the post, office. back of the UPS store, UPS in the, store. in the back office. Yeah, they fingerprinted me in the back of the UPS store. <laughs> They had print, fingerprint cards mailed, so faxed in. They fingerprinted me. They did my whole. They booked me, pretty much booked me in the back of the UPS store. They took me outside of the back door. They made me stand there. They took pictures of me, front, side, like everything. a mugshot on the Booking. side of the UPS. Building. I got booked in the back of the UPS store, pretty much. I've never heard of this Neither in my life. I. Neither have I. Neither have I. Because they needed to run my fingerprints and everything to make sure I wasn't fucking. You know what I mean? Telling the it's truth. The dumbest shit I've ever heard in my life. Okay, so they they don't even. You never got cuffed. Nope. You told him this shit. Did they say anything to you else? Like, yeah. like we're going to talk they, to you they, again? No, yeah, they faxed. They had some paper faxed in, and they were like, well, listen, um, you, you, you need to sign these papers saying that we can come to your house right now and search and seize anything that's been used to commit this fraud, the printers, anything with removable storage, It's we're taking it. Or what? Or you're going to go to jail right now. We're going to take you to jail. So it was either go to jail, and because uh, at this time, they don't know where I live. My vehicle isn't registered to my address. My driver's license I have in my pocket isn't registered to my address. Um, this, you, you where my lab was set up at. So not, so if I would have said, fuck you, take me to jail right now, they would have never have known where that house was. Yeah, so why didn't you do that? Because they kept telling me, you're not going to jail. You're not going to jail. And in my mind, I'm like, listen, if I can get out of this situation and get away from these motherfuckers, they're never going to see me again. Ever, because right. I got a I got a, I got a storage unit with a with a vehicle and money and a passport and everything fucking sitting in it as a, as a contingency plan in case I ever need to run. That how was much an, money was in that there? was another tutorial about eighty grand. And you have a you have a car a full blown car in the storage unit. Yeah. Yep. What kind of car? Uh, I had a Cadillac CTS at this time, a two thousand and four Cadillac CTS. But that's not the car you're driving around every no. day. You no, just no, no, had no. it in a storage no, I, unit. Yeah. So I read a tutorial online. <laughs> About fucking, about, you know, um, having a backup plan and keeping a vehicle. And was like, this a wiki how? Ex- ex- pretty much <laughs> what it was. No, back in, like, 20 years ago, that's exactly what all of this was. Like, this information uh, doesn't exist anymore. Oh, my God. So, yeah, guys used to go, and I read a whole tutorial. I thought my Google search history was bad. This is, this oh, is pretty yeah. bad. <laughs> I had a tutorial that I read. I'm like, fuck, I got 50 extra grand laying around right now. I'm fucking, so I went out that weekend. I bought a car. I bought a storage unit. I fucking got some cash. I fucking I put, it, I put it all away and was like, okay, now, because that just made me feel safe. Mm. Just having that there made me more 
it made me more fucking reckless to be completely honest with you. Right. You know what I mean? Because now, even though I wasn't actively thinking like, yeah, I got this, now I can be reckless, in my mind that it was just added an extra layer of comfort to what I was doing, if that makes any kind of sense to you. So they tell you you're not getting arrested today. Mm -hmm. Apparently you gave them sufficient information yeah. so that you give them permission, though, to go raid your house. Are you there when Yo, they raid they your house? they put me in the back of their car and drive me to my condo. Do you get out with them? Yep. And I go in and they sit me on the couch and one guy fucking sat in the living room with me while the other guy completely tore the whole fucking house apart. And they took everything. Everything. They took my safe. I had probably 10,000 cards already pre-printed up in the safe. But they didn't take your guns or weed? They didn't take my, my dope or my guns. They're like, we're not the ATF. We don't care about that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what the fucking Secret Service said to me. I had assault uh, rifles. I had are AK. Are we sure these were real cops? That's another thing. Oh, you know, they were because when I got down to the, I had to go down to the, the Secret Service headquarters in Columbia, South Carolina and give a statement and get interviewed and everything and they were there. I know, but maybe they could have found a way. Yeah, I don't know. But like, man, they didn't give a shit. Dude. They were like, we're not the ATF. We don't care. I had like a quarter pound of weed and I had like fucking, I had an AK-47, I had an AR-15. <laughs> was, was it legal? Well, I had my concealed weapons license at this time. Uh, all right, so it's at least all legal. my all my firearms were registered to me, and they were legal. But they're looking at you for a felony. I'm surprised they let it. Yeah, they did. But, but it, do they have to let? I it don't until know. You're tried in court. I think until I'm question. actually charged with, um, or or if they felt like the guns were being used in the in the they can make that argument for the so felony. Easily. Yeah, they could. They could say like, yeah, he's using it to intimidate witnesses, so we're going to hold on to it, and then they never give it back because you get charged. And yeah, oh, okay. but yeah, so they didn't take my guns. I had didn't take your weed. Saw yeah, I salt rifles, everything. They didn't take any of that. They left all that there. They took. Was, was your girl there while this was no, going? No, thank God. My 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 girl and her my son were at her mother's house when all this happened, and I called her. They allowed me to call her and tell her not to come home. I was like, can I... Are these the worst cops in America? I don't know, man. They were like... I was you like, ran into the <laughs> two worst cops in America. They were Secret Service. They were United they States Secret Service. They shouldn't be anything. They are... the. This <laughs> is the worst. One of them... Okay, so the two guys that run my case, one of them got sent up to Washington to be on president's detail... Which and he's, I'm surprised the and president's he, still alive. And he's then. in a whole bunch of shit right now. There's a whole bunch. There's a whole bunch of controversy surrounding him. This and, guy's a double agent. I'm telling you, some shit. This yeah. is the worst police work I and, have uh, ever heard on any level that didn't involve literally like a yeah. corrupt cop in my life. And they they allowed me to call my wife and tell her not to come not home. to come home. Don't come home. That's the number one person that any any not brainless cop should want to interview. And they never talked to her. They never once even interviewed her or talked to her throughout this whole fucking process. Something is up there, bro. Right. So, uh, yeah. So, it was weird. So, they, they took my safe. They took all of my equipment. They took all of my laptops. Anything with removable storage on it, they took. So, back at this time, cell phones didn't have cameras on them. We were using the digital cameras. Remember the digital cameras? Yeah. So, I had a bunch of those. They took all those. Um I think I had like an Xbox. They wanted to take the Xbox. I'm like, come on, what fucking? You gotta leave me with something. You know what I mean? <laughs> fucking. No, they left your Xbox. Well, it's, got, too. it's got a hard drive. Did it's, they take it? No. They they left the Xbox. It had a hard drive. It had a hard drive. You on complained it. and they left it. They left it. Yeah. Um. Just weird, man. Fucking weird shit, dude. Like, there's a lot of fucking shit with this case that I just like. I had got a lot of luck. You know, I uh, I tripped and fell into a patch of four leaf clovers, if you will. I mean, that's kind of a lame. I want to go fire these cops myself. Yeah. Um, I so mean, my tax dollars are going to these fucking two morons. Yeah, so they just uh, they kind of just emptied me out and they left me a business card and they said that you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna get a phone call in a couple of days and you're gonna have to come down and they're gonna ask you some questions and you're gonna have a court date and you're gonna be charged with we don't know what yet until we figure out everything. But I was like, all right, and that was in 2009. I I mean I guess you just you said the one guy you know for a fact went on the president's details, so he's real. Mm-hmm. Because my guess would have been and these were competitors who then leaked the information to the cops. Well, it's when when the, the actual <laughs> when the postmaster general called the Secret Service, and the Secret uh, Service is the one that you know dispatched fucking officers to whatever. So I mean, I'm sure they were legit. And one of the one of the officers that were on one of the Secret Service agents that was on my case was on Brett Johnson's case because he got oh busted. the side the he shadow. got he got busted out of South Carolina too. Son of a bitch. Yeah, he was at the same field office, everything that I was at. Okay, so you get, you're at home ripping a bowl. They just took all your shit. Did they take all your money? Minus everything, yeah. Minus what was in the storage uh, unit? Yeah, I only I only had about 
twelve or thirteen thousand on me at that time in cash at the house. Yeah, but they got my hard drives and they got all of my which debit had cards, all the information, okay. which had which had all the information for all my bank accounts, everything on it. And so they I, took all the printers, everything, all every. I was, so they didn't think they found the fucking lab. You have everything there. Yeah, I don't know. And this was in two thousand and nine, and then I didn't hear anything for three years. Dumbest cops. In the history of history. Okay. So you... They fumbled the ball. But but wait, no, you had to go give a statement. Yeah, like, right? like a week later, I had to go down to the headquarters in Columbia, South Carolina. Did they give you a call and say, come down? Yep. And so you go down there. Mm -hmm. And if I, I remember, you walk in and they have all the images on the wall of all your shit. They got a, this long conference table and they got all the screenshots of all my posts on the fucking forum spread out on the fucking, on the, in the center of the table so that I could see it when I walked in. And they still didn't think you were the godfather of this whole thing. No, and then I, I just fucking talked my way. I was like, listen, man, I've only been doing this for six months. You know, fucking, you know, again, I I, I, I minimized and I just tried to explain the best way I could, um, you know, out of the whole thing. And it was like the whole time in my mind, the only thing I was hyper focused on was what have I already said? I cannot contradict anything that I've already said that mm. they've written down. So I was so hyper-focused on just not contradicting myself and sticking to my fucking story and not deviating at all, even though they tried to get me to deviate. Well, oh, you said it was this date, but it wasn't this date. I'm like, listen, man. You know, so I just stuck to my guns. I stuck to my story, and I just minimized the shit out of it. And, and at the end of the day, what did they have? They had some posts from the one forum that I told they them I was on. They had all your fucking equipment. They, they had, had all, all my hard cards. drives. They had all my cards, right. But like I said, I've been doing what this. What do they have? They have everything. <laughs> right, but they have nothing to prove that I've been doing this for four years. They have nothing to prove. That information is not on anything? I don't keep records. I mean, you know, no, I'm, that's I, true. I, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm smart enough not to keep sales records. I mean, what am I paying taxes? No, that's true. <laughs> you know that's I very mean? true. Fucking, um, you know, so they like. So they let you walk out of there. They Again. let me. They let me. Well, I didn't know. It was touch and go there for a little while. Like I don't know if they. I don't even know if they thought they were going to let me go because there was a couple minutes there where we all just sat there in silence after they would ask me questions, and then they would all be like. And then he'd be go, he'd be shuffling papers, and they'd just be sitting there. And then they'd be like, "Oh, okay, what about?" And I'm like, "Fuck, okay, here we go again. Let's another round of questioning." But listen, the first probably ten questions I answered when I got into that room, let me know that they didn't know shit. So I kind of just felt this relief kind of just wash over me, and I'm like, "Okay, I got these motherfuckers." And you walked out of there. I walked out of there. And, yeah. and they said you're going to get a court date he's at like, some point. He's like, "Eventually, you're going to have a court date. You're going to have charges." Even have charges? No, I didn't get didn't char have charges ready for you. When there was no grand indictment. There was nothing, nothing. I walk out that door and it was three and a half years before I even got indicted or picked up or anything. So you go home. The was this your wife or, or your we girlfriend? We weren't married. We weren't, weren't married, married, but we were together for two years. Yeah. So you go. Home. Obviously, she knows everything that you told her because all the shit was gone. Yeah, I, well, I called her when I was at the house. Like, listen, there's two secret service oh, agents right. here. Yeah, yeah, don't, yeah. Come yeah, home. don't come home. Right. And she didn't believe me. And she sent one of her cousins over, and he knocked on the door. And the secret service agent answered the door. And, and he didn't fucking interview the cousin. Well, he didn't know it was a cousin. It was just somebody knocking at the door. Is uh, and he the dude looked confused when the secret service yeah, it was agent Jehovah's answered. Witness. Oh my god. Yeah. So he knocked on the door, and they were like, "Yeah, he can't come to the door right now." And they closed the door. I hope that guy's listening. <laughs> I want to let you know you're you are one of the dumbest wastes of tax money I have ever heard of in my life, and you should Listen, never have a job in the government. I, I, this, I under looked, any circumstances. I looked so innocent back then. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't look like how I look now. I wasn't covered in tattoos. You know, what I mean, I'm fucking, I'm small. I'm fucking. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not. You know, still, uh, dude, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's just this is the worst police work I've ever seen in my life. So, so you walk out of there. They say they're going to send you a court date. Nothing happens. Did, oh, by the way, didn't you you broke up with with your girl? Right, she left me. Uh, like like a couple days after that happened, she was done. Because in, in her mind, I think she thought maybe somehow she was going to get in trouble, oh. or they were going to take my son away, or something like and that. She took the kid and left. Yeah, she just dipped on me. Yep, told me to go fuck myself, pretty much. So you go back to Miami. I go to Detroit from South Carolina. I go up to Michigan at this point because I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know if I should go back to Miami and start just printing credit cards again. You know what I mean? Like fucking, because I had, I had more equipment. I had shit set up in Miami. Fuck it. So I went to Detroit and I just was like, you know, I didn't know what to do for about a year to be honest with you because I didn't know if they were watching me. So and I, you, how much you took the money from the storage unit, I guess, to fund yourself? Yeah, I had, I had money. You know, I had a car. I had money. I had all that shit. You know, I left her with the car and all. I left her with the townhome, the car, the furniture. I left everything. I just packed a bag and I left her and the kid with the apartment, the car, and a little bit of money. And I, I went to my storage unit. I got my car and I just drove up to Michigan. And I, I was in Michigan 
um, for a while. And it's like for a year, I really didn't know what to do. Like I didn't know because I'm waiting on a court date. But they also don't even know where you live. They should be tracking you, but they don't know where you live. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. Well, I, they had the address in South Carolina, and I'm, I'm still in contact with Melissa. So if they sent something in the mail or something like that for a court date, she then, might not tell you, bro. She yeah. told you to fuck off and said you can't see your kid anymore. True. True. I'll bet they sent that shit there, and she just fucking threw it away. No, for three years. So what happened was, is the the dude, the main guy, got sent up to Washington. On my case, got sent up to Washington. Whatever was going on with my shit got put on a shelf. No grand indictment, no investigation, no nothing. It just got fucking filed away somewhere, and they walked away from it for three and a half years. So for three and a half years, I'm out there. I don't know what's going to go on. I have no court dates. I'm not talking to anybody. There's you got to no, be blowing all the money. Well, I've ran through the money fast. Yeah, the money went pretty fast because so I, how'd you get more? I had to start card. I had to start making <laughs> cards again. <laughs> so how I long no before choice. you start? Card- I long, had no choice. How long before you start carding? I think it was almost a solid year before I really, before I was, you know, comfortable enough to get back on the forums. Because what they told me when they left my leg, listen, if you get back on the forums, we're going to know. If you start selling cards again, we're going to know. I was like, okay. And they had me shook for about nine solid months. I didn't do anything. And then you ran out of money. Then I ran out of money. And I'm like, dude, I'm not getting a job. Because I'm not a nine to five guy. You know what I mean? Like I can't. No, you are not. I cannot go to you. a building and, and clock up, put you know, push and in, in, in get my paycheck at the end of the week and be a productive employee and all that. I yeah, can't. Yeah, it's not the environment that you. I can't. I've tried. I've tried. I've age. tried. I've been fired from every job I've ever had. Yeah. It's Except just not, the one where they got arrested. <laughs> I actually probably would have done pretty well there had they continued business. You had a good business there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You had a good you had a good luck. I was doing all right. You could if, if you had picked another one that no one would else would have paid you eighty grand, but if you no. picked another one yeah. and they paid you eighty and they weren't criminals, I think your life would have been to different. this day I'd probably still be doing it. I'd probably own my own company. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right you'd be, now. Yeah. You're, you're talented. So you start carding again. Mm-hmm. How you back start, up to make it 100k a month. So I start I start carding um, physical carding a little bit just to get my money back up, and then I start I I reach out to one of my contacts who I fucking owed like two thousand cards to or something like that. I dipped on him with the money. Uh, I, t- I contacted him again. I kind of told him the situation like, listen, man, I got fucking I got pinched about fucking nine months ago, but I'm trying to fucking make a comeback. And then he didn't even want to fuck with me after that because he thought I was an informant. You know what I mean? So it, like mm. it took me a bunch of like coercing to get him to believe me that I wasn't the police and then once I finally convinced him that I wasn't the police and I sent him the 2,000 cards that I owed him plus another thousand um, that kind of opened the floodgates again for all the rest of my orders because this guy this one guy I was going through was pretty much at the, I didn't know it at the time but he was a buffer for the Russian mob oh so yeah that was the dude you that was your number one customer effectively yeah uh shoulder surfer was his screen name and that's all i knew him by shoulder silver surfer. Sh- yeah yeah shoulder sh- sh- shoulder surfer hmm. and he was a buffer for the russian mob how did you find that out uh through operation open market was like another whole thing that came down and when they shut down all the carding forums now and- that was going on while you were recording again yeah. right? and not in jail yeah so that can you explain to people what that was so operation open market was a joint venture between the united states secret service the russian fsb and the uh chinese um C- uh, csp or whatever three governments that three today governments would never and be they, working together <laughs> and they just decided that they were gonna shut because at this point it was fucking out of control like the fraud boards were and like there was yeah. like the dollar amount being lost and like it was just out of fucking control so they had to do something like there was pressure coming down from like you know started started getting political and everything so they launched this this operation open market where they uh, actively infiltrated and shut down every single carding forum uh that existed and this is when brett johnson or no brett johnson got caught a little bit before and he turned uh informant and he started working for the, the secret service and then and then i think that's what led to operation open I'll market bet. he was the kingpin yep that's what led to operation open market and then when operation open market came down i seen um when when the when everything became when the grand uh and jury and indictment became unsealed and you could kind of read into it i seen that shoulder surfer was fucking who he was and what he was doing and i was like oh fuck it was one of the guys I was had been dealing with, you know. That was my main guy I had been dealing with. So you put two and two together. Then. Yeah, and okay. I and I'm almost positive I'm one of the John Does in the op- Operation Open Market uh, indictment that but just this didn't is, get caught. This is while the indictment hadn't come down while you're still carding. Again, the fir- no, the second time the indictment, people were starting to get arrested. 
but the full indictment hadn't come down. So you didn't know everything. You didn't know yes. that you were John yeah, Doe. Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you get... People were starting to get popped at this time. And How Operation Open popped? Market wasn't open, open, but it was like... People were like starting to get arrested and like it's being like news headlines are like, oh, they just busted 10 guys here. They just busted five guys here. And you're here, still going. And I'm still going. You didn't stop. No, I didn't stop. Fuck it. Fuck them. I'm, I'm even more, I'm even more fucking. Going um, down on the sword. Yeah. Well, I'm even more confident now than I was before because I'm like, okay, well, I know what mistakes not to make now at this time, you know? So I'm even more confident now and I'm even more cocky. Um, and then one day I'm driving and I get pulled over. And, mm. I, and I get pulled over, and uh, believe it or not, as cliche as it may sound, there was a fucking expired tag on my plate, on my car. And uh, it was just an oversight by myself. Uh, we got pulled over. I'm, I'm married at this point. Like, I had met another girl, and mm. I got married, and fucking she fucking was pregnant. My son was just born. And um, we get pulled over, and the cop was like, uh, he walks up to me, I give him my driver's license and my, my registration. He goes back to his car, and I'm, I'm talking to my wife. I'm both, I'm like, listen, and I'm laughing. I'm like, when the second cop car pulls up, that's when you know you're fucked. Five minutes later goes by, I'm like, this is taking a while. Then the second cop car pulls up. Then the third cop car pulls Ooh. up. Then the fourth cop car pulls up. I'm like, fuck, there's four of them. I'm fucked. I know I'm going to jail at this point in time. You never killed anybody, right? No. No, 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 no. No, I've, I've never I'm been a yeah, violent I person. I know, I know. And, um... I know I'm going to jail at this point. I'm like, something's fucking going on now. And when he started walking back to the car without my driver's license in his hand, I knew I was going to jail. So in my mind, uh, when he walked up to the window, he's like, uh, you, you know, he's like, man, I'm real sorry, man. He's, can you step out of the car? He's like, you have a federal warrant out for your arrest. Did you know that? I was like, no, I didn't. He's like, I'm yeah. telling you, they were sending, they were sending this shit to your fucking ex's house, and she was throwing it away. Think so. I think so. Because <laughs> you had a federal warrant out. There was yeah. no need for them to put a warrant out. They yeah. said, we're going to contact you. You're going to show up to court. That's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. As you're not lawyer, I'm telling you, that's what happened. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, he's like, well, you know, you got a federal warrant out for your arrest. Um, and, and, and at this time, I had forgotten about the shit in South Carolina. Like it was, like you know, it wasn't <laughs> ancient even ancient history. Yeah, like I wasn't even you know I wasn't even thinking about that. So you I'm think like, you're getting arrested for this? the market? Oh shit! Yep. I'm okay. like, oh my god! I'm and I just start panicking. You didn't run. And you no, just... well, I believe me, there was a split second there when I seen him walking back to the car and he didn't have my driver's license in his hand. I was gonna fucking go, but there was four cop cars. Like there was yeah, you know, and I was on a, like I was on a main street. I wasn't getting anywhere. Yeah. And uh, I told my wife when he was walking up to the car without my driver's, license, I said, "Go back to the house, get everything out of the fucking house." You were married to her. Yes. Okay. I said, go back to the house when I was like, they're not going to arrest you. I said, when I go back to the house, get everything out of the house, all the equipment, everything, get everything out and, and throw it away, throw it away. Yep. So, so I, I get arrested. I go to jail. It's a Friday. I get arrested on a fucking Friday. Cause you know, you're not going arrested. to court on a Monday, yep. not going to court till Monday. So all weekend I'm sitting in jail. I don't know what's going on. I finally get in front of the judge on Monday. He's like, uh, blah, blah, blah. Case number, blah, Boziak, John Boziak, uh, federal warrant out of the district of Southern, uh, Southern South Carolina. And I'm like, oh, fuck. Just this one, though. Yeah. He's like he's like a f federal warrant out of a district of Southern South Carolina, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we're going to remand you to the custody of the, the, the marshal service. And I didn't even know what that meant at the time. It means you're going to get extradited to South yeah. Carolina. So I'm sitting there. And then so the, the marshals come. They show up. I'm at Falkenberg Road Jail in Hillsborough County, Florida. They pick me up. They take me to Pinellas County Jail in Pinellas County, Florida, which I guess is where they hold all the federal inmates. Okay. So I get to there. Uh, they let me... I finally see a judge. They let me out on fucking... On on uh, recogn on my own bond, on a PR bond, personal recognizance. I'd have to pay no bond or nothing. They let me out. <laughs> yeah, they let me out. Just walking. They let me walk. But I had pretrial services. So I had to go down and I had to like call like, a cup. call every single day yeah. and I'd do all that shit, which I ended up absconding on that before I even went to court to get But sentenced. you didn't even, you didn't, they didn't let you talk to attorney, like to an attorney over the weekend or something before no, that first hearing, no, Monday morning? Nothing. Something. I sat there for three, I had four days. I didn't know what was going on. I had no idea. But, I believe it's your right to ask though. You should ask. Uh, they have something called an expedient trial. Like you have the right to a speedy trial and right, all that. But, but you, I mean, it's all, you have a right to an Monday attorney. Monday through Friday. <laughs> <laughs> right, but you could have asked Monday morning ahead of the hearing before you went in there. I five minutes before I went in to see the judge, I uh, attorney came and seen me and was like, uh, "I'm I'm your attorney. We're gonna be going up next." Uh, blah blah blah, and that was it. And he's like, "I'm gonna try and we're gonna try and get a bond." He's like, "Do you know what you're here for?" I says, "No." He's like, "Well, I don't really know either." Cause the <laughs> that's what he said to me. He's like, "I don't really know either." He's like, "The the the paperwork really doesn't tell me much." Uh. So oh, then, yeah, God. Monday I got in front of the judge and they sent me to Pinellas County. So it was like another day or two I had to get transferred. And then I had to go see another judge, a federal judge, because that was just like a local magistrate. You, you know? get out on bond, though. So I get out on bond and my wife comes and picks me up. Um, 
And then I just don't know. I'm, I'm lost at that point. Like, I don't know. I have no money. It's all gone. I had a little bit of oh, cash. Oh, because she threw... So when she threw everything out, she threw out all the debit cards and shit, yep. too. Hard drives, debit cards, printers, laptops, everything. Yep, gone. And I had I had cash. We had cash, but not much, like 20. Maybe 25. Oh, fuck. Maybe 25. She threw away all the Bitcoin, too. Everything. Well, yeah. This, well, she yeah. followed directions well. I'm just picturing yeah. the scene in Goodfellas. Karen! Listen, I... Yeah, oh, exactly. Why would you yeah. do that? It's all we Why had. Why would you do that? It's all we had, Karen. <laughs> ah! And, um... But yeah, it was... And, and I, listen, I was like, dude, I might go to the dump. I was thinking about driving to the city dump and fucking... But I was like, dude, so I don't know... I don't know how they process the trash and... You like, were the Bitcoin guy going through the dump trying to get... Listen, I Bitcoin. sat online for three or four days after that trying to figure out the how they managed uh, the local fucking waste management system and how Son fucking where they dropped off the trash at and I got a pretty good just for four days of studying that I had a pretty good understanding of how like the <laughs> truck routes and like what trucks did why I found out what trucks did what routes because there's like corresponding fucking numbers on the dumpsters that correspond to routes and like I had that whole system figured out I was going to the fucking dump to get my shit back and I just never never did never did it's like fort knox dude believe but it or this, not getting, in, getting into a dump is like fort knox believe it or not i believe it but you you have charges so you're this is now it's official and yeah, you're, so fucked. you go to court sometime soon you're not carding obviously i'm done like, everything's gone like i have no resources at that point in time i'm completely depleted of all resources but the charges are based on that south carolina Out of incident south carolina. Yep. where mother old motherfucker yep. opened up the stuff yep. illegally yep so how didn't I finally Did get to South think Carolina. Of that? No, I didn't know. I had absolutely hit him and crossed my. Because I didn't know how they caught me. I didn't know. I didn't even know that. Oh, you didn't know you until didn't I got know. my discovery. Oh, well, shit. all the way when I got to South Carolina and I got my discovery and I'm going through my discovery with my lawyer trying to figure out wiggle room or you know, and that's when I read like fucking the report and it when they how the whole thing went down about how I actually got caught and I was like oh. And I didn't even know, like, it didn't even occur to me that he wasn't supposed to, because I didn't know that he wasn't supposed to open my package. But my she lawyer, realized it. My lawyer was the one that realized. She's like, wait a minute, something's not right here. There's a chain of command that, you know, because she knew, and then... So, you, yeah. They couldn't listen. Uh, so how here, did you get... So he, hold on. So here how did my, you get charged with anything, then? So here were my charges. My charges were possession of uh, counterfeiting equipment, um... Possession of a fraudulent transaction device, manufacturing of a fraudulent transaction device, wire fraud, mail fraud, and aggravated identity theft. Because I had my picture on someone else's driver's right. license yes. that I opened the UPS yes. store for. Yes. So, in, initially, they had to get rid of all of that shit. You're Everything. Free. But then, they were like, the only thing they can make stick is the aggravated identity theft. Because I did have my driver's license on somebody else's. Right. I had my picture on somebody else's driver's license. That carries a mandatory now, minimum of 24 months. Really? Mandatory minimum. Yep. That's a mandatory minimum of 24 months aggravated if you have identity your picture. Theft, aggravated identity theft. Aggravated identity theft on the federal level is a mandatory minimum sentence. Unless you have a fake person on there. Um, That's uh, not aggravated because you're just making somebody right, up. Right, yeah. Then it's not okay. aggravated. All right, that actually makes sense because yep. I, I didn't... I never knew anyone who had a fake ID, like in college, where it was a real person or anything. Okay. Yeah, mine was tied to a real social security number. And everything. Oh, so okay. Because you got to put down your social security number, date of birth, when you go to sign, when you go to log in for the. So UPS then store. they whacked you. They whacked you. They for got. That they got me minimum. for the mandatory minimum, twenty four months. But they, originally it was one hundred and fifty months. But my sentence. But. Yeah. Or, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Yeah. The sentence was one hundred fifty months for aggravated identity theft. No, 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 no. With all the charges. It was going to be 150 yes, that's, that, months. Those were my guidelines. Yes, yes. You with all of those, sentence with no, that. No, no, no. The with guidelines. all those charges, yeah. Those yes. are my guidelines with all my initial charges. That makes sense. That's yeah. like 15 years or something like that. They, okay. they came with an initial plea of like 150 months. Right. So then your lawyer realizes all this is my bullshit. My lawyer's like, listen, let's look. we got to look at this a little bit closer because, listen, you've never been in trouble. Let's look at the discovery. Let's fucking, let's dig you've into it. You've never been, grew up in a boy's home like your entire life. All that shit was sealed. <laughs> all my entire juvenile record was sealed. So oh they had God. no idea the chaos I had caused in my life. All they had was my adult record, and I had nothing. On my, I'd never been arrested ever as an adult. So you, hold on. You get charged with this. You get the mandatory too, but... Maybe there's this is not a real thing, but I'm just thinking if the the entire predisposition for this, mm -hmm. for everything that happened, was the old dude opened up your package. Yes. Yeah. So if they throw that out, can't they throw out <clears throat> the fact that you know I don't know and you deserve and, to go to prison. And listen, they to be came. With I, I had been but, sitting there for 13 months in the worst county jail I had ever been in in my entire life. I was in Lexington County Jail, South Carolina. I was on 23 and one. 
I was in my in my yeah. cell 23 hours a day. I only came out one. There was no windows. There was I didn't get headphones, no music, no TV, nothing. 13 months. So when they came with that plea of 24 months, and I had already had 13 months in, which they were counting that towards my sentence. Oh shit! Yeah, it's you know I only had like another. I can do 11. I would be out in 11 months. I'd be free in a better prison. Fuck too. yeah! And I would be actually get sentenced and go to prison. I was like, dude, I gotta get the fuck out of here. And I signed it. I probably could have been like, fuck you. You probably could have fought that because yeah. they would have never checked the ID if they hadn't illegally checked your shit. Yeah. So, you know, I was like, whatever. I signed it just to get the fuck out of there and get to the yard because I needed to get the hell out of that, that jailhouse. It was the worst jailhouse I'd ever been in in my life. Worst cops in the Hard time, man. Fuck. Oh, yeah. They, they dropped the ball in Secret Service. The like, they, I don't think they cops. took the whole thing serious. Like, I don't Clearly. Really, they didn't take the whole thing. They just didn't take it serious at all. I don't think. I wonder if they, like, watch your podcast now like, motherfucker. Son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah. You know, and they gave me three years of paper. Uh, so I got uh, 24 months of uh, probation. incarceration. I had a, a 72 months of um, oh. paper. Three three probation, years. Probation, right? Yeah, yeah, federal probation. Yeah. Okay. Yep. You know, and once that happened, I made the decision right then and there that I was just going to not do anything to send myself back to prison. And no had you what. always had you always been into like tattoo artistry? Or? Yeah, I, I actually did my first tattoo in like 2001. Or something like that. And it's, it's been an ongoing thing ever since. So it's always been like a hobby. It's always been something that I've done, but I've never really taken serious. So you then just sunk... St- and now I'm like, this is the only skill that I have that's not going to send me back to prison. So you just sunk your teeth into it. Yeah, and I'm, I'm all in now. And I'm doing pretty well with it, yeah. Yeah, you're good at I'm, it, man. I'm doing extremely well. Works really good. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, look, I mean, that's... It's a hell of a story you have for sure. So... Lot, lot to unpack for people today, and I think I think sure. you, I think you told it very, very well, and and I appreciate you coming in to do it, oh, and, no problem, and I wish you I wish you all the best luck on on YouTube as well. You and Matt Cox down there, it's a grind, and hotel man. content creator. Dude, I love it. Just as much as you know, it's a fucking grind, man. It is a grind, know? but you're doing you're doing well, getting on a lot of other shows too, and, mm. and doing your thing. So yeah, thank you for going everything, going through everything. Oh, no today. problem, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. All right, everybody else, you know what it is. Give it a thought. Get back to me. And if you haven't subscribed or liked the video, make sure you do those two things. And I will see you guys next week.